chapter one of the house of mystery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the house of mystery by richard marsh chapter one sent packing click 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 went the typewriters without the day was miserable the rain came down in torrents the wind blew from the river right through that side street off the strand within the office on the top floor of the building the girls fingers went click 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 as they typed for their daily bread there were five of them four worked one sat idle a girl with her masses of red-gold hair and a face so beautiful it seemed strangely out of place in that bare room so beautiful indeed that its beauty startled the beholder despite her shabby dress big violet eyes looked from under heavily fringed lashes pouting lips framed a rosebud of a mouth the cheeks were white with trouble ay with want of food and yet the skin gleamed like satin the brow was broad and lofty the nose which was small and arched with delicate pink nostrils lent to the countenance an expression of pride and resolution this was a girl who would not easily succumb who would fight the battle of life with the best of them who would hold herself undaunted if needs be against overwhelming odds and yet at that moment despair gnawed at her heart she was cold and worn and hungry everything was against her the world and so it seemed to her all the people in it at that office piecework was the rule seven pence per thousand words typed was the amount paid to operators who did the actual work one shilling and upwards was charged to clients if you were skilled and kept at it hard and had luck you might in halcyon days earn a pound a week an entire sovereign that was when you were in favour madeline orme was out of favour for reasons for one thing she had committed that cardinal offence she was too good-looking mrs griffiths the proprietress with whom good looks had never been a failing could not to use her own words abide those stuck-up painted judies and though madeline was neither stuck up nor painted nor a judy mrs griffiths was always harder on her than on either of the others what in another was venial in her was criminal ellen rouse for instance might make error after error well argued mrs griffiths it was natural the manuscript was not quite as clear as copperplate who could avoid an occasional mistake but let madeline orme so much as misplace a comma she was fined although she had reached the bottom line the page was declared useless it had to be typed all over again she was punished for the waste of time so now while the others worked she sat idle earning nothing without a penny in her pocket or the prospect of placing one there the injustice of it all made her heart red-hot within her a manuscript had been given her to type she had started on it bravely even gaily it ran to about eight thousand words it would mean when done that she had earned four shillings and fourpence it was not particularly clearly written and the corrections had been plentifully interlined but if she stuck at it closely she might finish it in the course of the day and then if mrs griffiths were in an agreeable frame of mind she might give her half or even the whole of the four and fourpence when the work was done it seemed to her that with four shillings and fourpence one could do so much she had typed four pages when kate ellis the girl who sat next to her had finished the work she had to do mrs griffiths came and gathered together the scattered pages and presently moved to madeline taking up one of the finished sheets she glanced at it she tapped madeline smartly with her finger-tips upon the shoulder what nonsense is this she demanded this isn't sense she was pointing to a line 
on madeline's clear copy the girl's response was gentle she deprecated the other's wrath it is difficult to make out what the writer means just there there are so many corrections that it is not easy to decide which is meant to stand see here is the manuscript with her outstretched finger she showed that at the point alluded to the manuscript was such a tangle of interlineations that it was almost impossible to make head or tail of it without paying the slightest heed to the girl's timid explanation she tore the four sheets of copy which represented a couple of hours hard persistent labor first into halves and then into quarters snatching up the manuscript she passed it to kate ellis miss ellis be so good as to type that manuscript and be so good as to make sense of it which miss orme appears unable to do miss orme does not seem to be aware that if manuscripts were as plain as print it would not be necessary to send them here to be typed the action was so unexpected that for some seconds madeline sat in speechless surprise then she sprang to her feet with a cry mrs griffiths oh mrs griffiths do let me type it i will make sense of it i will i've had nothing at all to do this week it is the first thing you've given me mrs griffiths had reached the door of her own apartment she turned with what was possibly intended to be an air of hauteur and i am sorry i gave you that miss ellis be so good as to type that manuscript she disappeared from sight her disappearance was followed by a chorus from the girls it's a shame cried mary wilson it really is a shame kate you ought to have spoken up you ought to have refused to take the thing when you knew that miss orme was half way through it miss orme was not half way through it rejoined kate calmly and even if she was it's no business of mine it's each for yourself in this world if i had refused to take it mrs griffiths would have had her knife in me i can't afford to throw away my bread and butter madeline said nothing she could say nothing the incident trivial enough in itself was tragedy to her from her point of view at that moment hardly anything more dreadful could have happened as she had said so far she had had no work to do that week they were not very busy as regards such work as had come in she had been persistently passed over it had been given some one else to do she was absolutely penniless to have had it so near her lips and yet to have had it dashed away that was the cup of tantalus indeed and the injustice of it she had not made an error she was sure of it the error if one there had been had been the author's not hers at any rate mrs griffiths had not stayed to see what was the use of continuing to live in a world in which toil strive struggle as she might there was nothing but hunger hardship and despair the girl sat with clenched fists and flashing eyes with something throbbing in her breast as if her heart would burst presently the office door was thrown open with a little rush some one came hastening in a young man of about twenty-three or twenty-four short slightly built he had an eager intelligent face and shrewd pleasant eyes he was neatly yet poorly dressed there was about him an air of alertness which suggested that he was not of the kind to suffer the grass to grow beneath his feet he carried a black felt hat in one hand and a small bundle of manuscript in the other with which he advanced buoyantly towards madeline orme a smile lit up his homely countenance nothing to do madeline that's a stroke of luck i've brought you something which i want you to turn off for me at once the editor of fancies has told me that if i'll knock together a paper on queer trades he'll look at it while i wait and if it suits pay cash upon the nail here's the paper it runs to about three thousand words it's now about one do you think you could let me have it by five then i could catch the editor before he leaves i'll try geoffrey but you know your manuscripts are not the plainest she turned to him with a longing something on her face which because perhaps of his own eagerness went unnoticed he made a little grimace no you're right there i'm afraid they're not providence seems to have denied me the power of writing a legible hand i don't know how it is but so it is but what is my misfortune is the typewriter's boon if all manuscripts were so plain that he 
who runs might read where would this come in he laid his hand lightly on her machine the blood came to her cheeks his words recalled mrs griffith's gibe she turned the sheets of his manuscript over with her fingers smiling faintly that is so well geoffrey you don't give me much time but i'll do the best for you i can of course i know you will i wouldn't bustle you only you see this is something extra particular to be quite frank with you the cash will come in uncommonly useful especially if i can lay my hands on it to-night by the way i've got a grand idea one of the best that's been seen in journalism this many a day it won't knock them you take my word i'm going to spring it on the editor of fancies if he accepts that paper which he will do or i'm a dutchman and then i think we'll show them it was pleasant to hear him talk and so madeline felt although she had heard words of the same sort from the same lips before but there was in the speaker's voice such a note of confidence of assured conviction that it seemed from sheer sympathy to cheer the girl's despairing heart geoffrey clifford was of the try and try again sort failure was nothing to him if at first he did not succeed why he asked who has a right to expect to he would succeed at last of that he was assured he would keep on and on and on until at last the goal was reached it was good for the girl to come in contact with such a nature i won't keep you he cried or i shall be defeating my own purpose you understand i must have it at five he turned to go just then the inner door opened mrs griffiths appeared mr clifford is that you he faced her with a laugh it looks as if it were her manner was as acid as his was genial i presume you have come to pay that small account of yours he pulled a wry face i will pay you this evening or the first thing in the morning indeed it has been standing some time i would rather you paid it now i have brought a manuscript which i have asked madeline to type for me by five it's for fancies i'm going to take it right away i shall be paid cash down and then you shall have your money she looked him up and down her tone was biting do i understand you to say that you have brought a manuscript for miss orme to type without paying what you already owe you shall have it to-night or the first thing in the morning it's only five shillings precisely the fact of the amount being so small is one reason why we should like you to let us have it now i'm afraid i can't let you have it at this moment but as i say you shall have it at latest in the morning very good where is that manuscript she took it from madeline's unwilling fingers when mr clifford you have settled the small account which is outstanding we shall be pleased to do more work for you our terms are cash she held out to him the manuscript he looked at her askance but i can't settle with you until that manuscript is accepted and paid for i assure you mrs griffiths if you will have it typed for me so that i can catch the editor of francis before he goes you shall have your money safe enough we do not want your promises mr clifford we want your cash our terms i repeat are cash here is your manuscript if it is of any value to you good day madeline interposed eagerly i will type it for him mrs griffiths if you will let me and charge you nothing for it if he promises to pay you i'm sure he will you forget yourself miss orme this office is mine not yours don't show your face here again mr clifford except to pay your bill we must decline to do any more work for you under any circumstances with a comical grimace and a ghost of a smile towards madeline he slipped the manuscript into his pocket and went so soon as his back was turned mrs griffiths opened the vials of her wrath on the offending girl your behaviour miss orme is disgraceful you appear to have no proper sense of your position who are you to speak to me as if you were the employer and i the employed you are the most ill-conducted and useless person i have ever had in my office and how dare you allow such a penniless and impudent fellow like that clifford to address you publicly by your christian name and a most theatrical one it is he is my foster brother your foster brother indeed we all know what foster brothers are they're like cousins i once had a servant who whenever i caught a more than usually doubtful-looking fellow with her in the kitchen declared that it was her foster brother the girls giggled madeline went fiery red since however you claim mr clifford as a species of relation i feel sure you will feel 
in duty bound to pay his debts of course you will not object to my stopping the amount he owes me from the next piece of work you do mrs griffiths retired to her own apartment leaving madeline quivering in every nerve the girl's glances did not add to her sense of comfort they eyed her as if she were a peep-show ellen rouse did not confine herself to glances i don't see miss orme she said spitefully how you can object to pay for mr clifford o since you offered to type his manuscript for nothing kate ellis struck in with a remark which was if anything more spiteful still that was rather a nasty one about madeline being a theatrical sort of christian name is it your real name miss orme madeline looked at the speaker with eyes which were eloquent but her tongue was still while she sat there with panting breast and crimson cheeks and heart that burned and they looked and laughed at her and mocked all three together once more the office door was opened and another man came in at the sight of him there instantly was silence he was a young fellow probably only just out of his teens but there was about him a something which seemed intended to convey the suggestion that he was older than he seemed and in some respects undoubtedly he was his hair was very fair and very short and there was not much of it it was parted exactly in the middle so that there seemed precisely the same number of hairs on either side which hairs adhered so very closely to his scalp that one could not but suspect that they must have been plastered down with soap his eyes which were bloodshot looked out of long narrow slits his nose was large there was a twist about the bridge which hinted that at some period of his career it had been broken his mouth was wide when he opened it there was a liberal display of enormous teeth which were not precisely white his attire was from his own point of view in the height of fashion he wore a gardenia in the buttonhole of a short jacket which was of some peculiarly irritating shade of slaty blue a flowered waistcoat and copious trousers of a beautiful pearl grey the bottoms of these latter garments were turned up so as to exhibit to the best advantage a pair of light brown shoes his collar was of the turned down all round variety the ends of a party-coloured silk necktie which was arranged in a beautiful bow straggling in artistic disorder over the bosom of his soft blue shirt he wore a brown billycock very much on the side of his head a half-consumed cigar was sticking out of the corner of his mouth he carried a pair of yellow dogskin gloves in his large and red right hand and a crooked bamboo cane dangled over his arm this was augustus dauncey griffiths his mother's only darling and in that mother's opinion the smartest young man in town there were one or two other persons who thought him tolerably smart with reason but they used the word in a different sense to his parent he entered the office without thinking it necessary to remove his hat or his cigar and so soon as he was in he struck an attitude he passed the whole of his time in striking attitudes but that is by the way oh you darlings you dears you pets where's the dragon ellen rouse took upon herself to answer he was her cousin she would have gone through fire and water for him and worse as a natural consequence he treated her as if she were the dirt beneath his feet it being the custom with men of his sort to so use the women who love them aunt is in her room is she then let her stop there nelly dear oh you sweets you pretty things you little ducks and aren't you working of course when i come in before i showed my nose inside that door there wasn't a finger moving only tongues think i don't know you oh you loves he looked at madeline hello venetian red you're doing nothing you lazy girl i'm ashamed of you why are you doing nothing to earn your bread and butter is it because it's a principle of yours that the less you do the more you get it is so anyhow especially if you are a pretty girl he went close to her she perceptibly shrinking from him as he did so do you know how the venetian women used to get their hair your colour they used to sit on the roofs of the houses in the hottest suns of summer with their hair spread out on sheets of brass all round them at least so the story goes by jove you have got hair do you know my dear that locks like yours are as good as a fortune it's truth so help me i know a girl whose thatch isn't a patch on yours who gets five quid a week from the cerulean for just coming on to the stage with it hanging all over her shoulders 
and the other girls tug at it just to show the folks in front it's real fact upon my city and as for face and figure why there isn't a professional beauty anywhere who can hold a torch to you upon my word there isn't the dragon don't know what a prize she's got or she'd try you at some better lay than tapping those corn raising keys look here madeline it isn't often i give myself away but i'll give you this gardenia for a kiss fair sweet frank and free mind and it cost eighteen pence upon my honour and you girls can turn your heads aside mr augustus dauncey griffiths one loves to give such a gentleman his name in full had come close enough to madeline to enable him to put his hand upon her shoulder she shook it from her as if it had been the touch of some noxious insect turning to him with cheeks which were white enough now and eyes which flamed though hot enough within her tone was icy have the goodness not to touch me mr griffiths and though i esteem your offer at its full value i fear that it is one which i must respectfully decline the gentleman was not in the least nonplussed on the contrary he threw up his hands in an attitude of what was meant for admiration by jove just look at her my dear you're a duchess by nature i give you my word you are put a hundred pounds worth of clothes on you and ten thousand pounds worth of diamonds drop you down among the duchesses at the queen's drawing-room and you cop the biscuit from the entire shoot i know what i'm talking about and i'll tell you straight you would now don't be a fool my dear don't you know which side your bread is buttered if you won't sell that kiss give it us for nothing that's the time of day my sweet suddenly he had his arms about her neck and if it had not been for madeline's agility he would have pressed his hideous lips to hers but slipping from his grasp rising from her chair turning she confronted him with eyes in which there were lightning fires how dare you be careful before you have cause to regret it mr augustus dauncey griffiths showed not the faintest sign of discomposure he smiled as if he supposed she was jesting take it fighting will you like some of the girls do when they're caught a kiss in the ring all right i don't mind it won't be the first kiss i've bought at the price of a little scuffle she was standing with her back to her typewriter he threw himself on to her in endeavouring to avoid him she was borne backwards on to the machine there was a sound of something snapping and at that same moment mrs griffiths appeared at the door of her room augustus she exclaimed what is the meaning of this to all outward appearance her hopeful son was still completely at his ease his volubility never for a moment forsook him by jove mother i don't know i do not i don't want to tell tales goodness knows but i came in here and i i found this young lady arguing or quarrelling or something with miss ellis really miss ellis perhaps you had better explain to my mother he winked at kate ellis who frigidly replied i don't wish to say anything thank you mr griffiths miss orme is a person i don't understand and don't pretend to there you are mother you see how it is then she started with nelly didn't she nelly ellen rouse looked at madeline as if she would have liked to kill her where she stood her words were in sympathy with her looks miss orme is always quarrelling with some one always it's my opinion she's not fit to sit in the same room with respectable girls and so i'll say straight out in the presence of aunt that's how it is mother you see and now i rather fancy the young lady has broken her machine broken her machine mrs griffiths rushed forward roused at last she brushed madeline on one side as if she were nothing at all so she has two three keys destroyed utterly the machine is ruined she turned on the girl in a towering rage you you baggage you worthless creature who is to pay me for the damage you have done madeline her brain in a whirl tried her best to beat the woman's passion i did not do it it was your son the young gentleman in question strode up to her with an amount of assurance which was in its way unique i did it you lie if you were a man i would knock you down there as you stand it is only because you are a woman that you dare to utter such an atrocious falsehood mother i fear this is a dangerous person miss ellis did i break that machine you never touched it of course you didn't cried ellen rouse you never had anything to do with it but that's just like her to try to lay the blame on someone else she's wicked through and through 
i have half a mind declared mrs griffiths to send for a policeman and to give you into custody for destroying my property her son laid his hand upon her arm he played the part of peacemaker don't do that mother there only be a scandal and you'll get nothing out of her you'd better get rid of her as quietly as you can at once i suppose you're right i'll be bound the creature has nothing but the rags upon her back to call her own miss orme put your things on and take yourself outside my office and never set your foot in it again you may think yourself lucky to get off so easily madeline looked round her bewildered as if she felt these things must be happening to her in a dream but mrs griffiths you are mistaken you are being guilty of a great injustice i have done nothing nothing it is your son mr augustus dauncey griffiths threw his hands and eyes up towards the ceiling in an attitude of astounded virtue his mother's passion flamed anew she went to where the girl's scanty garments were hanging on a peg and snatching them off it she flung them at her you bare-faced smooth-tongued insolent lying hussy put on those rags of yours and take yourself away if you're not gone in half a minute i'll put you out with my own hands from her looks the lady meant what she said her son always with an air of virtue endeavoured to appease her hush mother this person is unworthy even your contempt i am sure if she reflects a moment she will herself perceive that it would be advisable not to stand upon the order of her going madeline looked at the speaker with a look which should have scorched him as with flame but it did not he had his back towards his mother he met the girl's glances with a wink and a smile her tone was deadly cold i am of your opinion that it would be advisable that i should not stand upon the order of my going she put on her shabby jacket with trembling fingers adjusted her well-worn hat while the others watched her with grinning scornful triumphant eyes and just as she was about to move towards the door with feet which faltered it was flung open with a flourish and to their amazement they beheld a gorgeous vision in the shape of a towering footman in a resplendent livery of scarlet blue and silver he ushered in a little old gentleman who entered hat in hand with an air of the utmost eagerness at sight of madeline he broke into a chorus of exclamations thank god it's her in the very nick of time it's a miracle nothing less he addressed himself to the girl with the bearing of the extremest deference my dear young lady will you permit me to entreat you to come with me at once it is a matter of life and death and the carriage waits for us below the girl drew back in not unnatural surprise but i do not know you there is some misunderstanding you take me for some one else both the strangers eagerness and deference became if possible greater than before there is no mistake i entreat you with all my heart and soul my dear young lady to believe that there is no mistake if you would avoid a grievous and irreparable calamity i implore you with all the strength of which i am capable to come without a moment's hesitation with me at once all necessary explanations shall be given you at the proper time only come my dear young lady come mrs griffiths interposed rudely i fancy sir you are making a blunder i feel it only right to tell you that this young person is one of my operators whom i have just discharged for serious misconduct the stranger drew himself up a little as if he resented the lady's interference he glanced towards her with a look of inquiry then he bestowed on her a slight but courteous inclination of his head the fashion of his reply proving him to be a very dignified old gentleman indeed i am obliged to you for your information which however was unasked i think madam that the blunder is yours not mine in matters of a certain sort it is not my wont to blunder or i should not now be occupying the position which i do i have been dispatched to bear this young lady post haste on an affair of the first importance to the countess of staines end of chapter one how do you find this book any thoughts about the book or the author any suggestion for improvement please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment if you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Chapter 2 of The House of Mystery by Richard Marsh 
this librivox recording is in the public domain the girl in the picture so far as she knew madeline had never ridden in a real carriage before she sat in this one as in a dream she had noted on entering the crest and coat of arms upon the door the coachman in his powdered wig upon the box the pair of grand bay horses in their glittering harness and now as she leaned back among the yielding cushions realizing for the first time in her life what perfect cushions really were she wondered if she was playing a part in some strange fairy tale whose carriage was this why was she in it where was it bearing her little information could be gleaned from the courteous old gentleman who sat with such demure decorum on the seat in front of her so affected indeed was she by the surprising nature of the position in which she found herself that she hardly dared to question him where are you taking me she asked to the countess of staines not only were the words uttered in a tone of the most exquisite deference but they were accompanied by a slight obeisance and yet in spite of herself madeline trembled the countess of staines one of the greatest and grandest ladies in england madeline's knowledge of the peerage did not extend very far but she did know so much what she timidly inquired can the countess want with me it will be explained when we arrive have patience i entreat you he held out his hands towards her with a little gesture of deprecation as if he were imploring her to show him mercy she asked him nothing else perceiving that she would receive no other answer but as the luxurious vehicle rolled swiftly forward on its pneumatic tires she was conscious that her companion's eyes were fixed on her all the time with something in them as it seemed to her of wonder reverence entreaty ay even of fear the carriage stopped before a wide flight of steps which led up to a huge mansion at the corner of a spacious square in an instant the carriage door was open she was being escorted by a footman up the steps under cover of an enormous umbrella the great hall door had flown open as by magic she found herself entering a lofty hall and being received as if she were a princess by gorgeous footmen on either hand her companion followed on her heels when they were in he reverentially inclined towards her his head and said in a whisper which could have been audible to herself alone may i entreat you to come this way he led she followed up a magnificent staircase round corners through corridors on and on and on till she wondered how big the house could be she had never supposed that there were such houses except in the occupation of kings and queens he paused at a door at the panel of which he tapped a voice within said come in he opened the door retaining the handle in his grasp bowing madeline through it she entered in a maze of doubt as to what it was that she expected she found herself in a spacious chamber which reminded her in the first flush of perception of the arabian nights never out of a fairy tale had she imagined that a room could be furnished with such singular nay such barbaric magnificence the colour scheme in itself was dazzling purple gold and crimson wherever she looked these gorgeous hues either alone or in more or less subtle combination flashed on her startled eyes in all the richest stuffs of the world's remotest and most famous looms the carpet was of purple velvet of a pile so rich that it covered her ankles it had a golden border and right in the centre like a blob of blood was a spot of crimson of the diameter perhaps of the palm of a man's hand and exactly on this spot either by accident or set purpose there stood a woman who was as little 
in keeping with her surroundings as she easily could have been she was of advanced age probably between sixty and seventy her hair which was worn in plain straight old-fashioned bands was of silver whiteness her dress was of simple unrelieved black silk except that at the wrists she wore turned-back cuffs of snowy lawn her homely wrinkled face was beautiful it was so sweet and gentle and in the eyes which were still clear and bright there was a look of such tenderness and peace and yet it was obvious that at the moment she was troubled as madeline entered she came forward with a quick eager appealing anxious movement which was pregnant with meaning she stood and stared at madeline and as she stared her amazement seemed to grow until she became as it were rooted to the floor charles she exclaimed is it a ghost or is it she the old gentleman who was thus addressed as charles gave a reverent gesture upwards with his hand he too stood at the woman's side and looked at madeline it's a miracle one of god's own she echoed his words it is a miracle indeed and one of god's own the curious couple continued to stare presently the woman advanced with outstretched hands my dear my dear my dear there was such a wealth of love in the words in the tone in which they were uttered in the attitude of the utterer that it went straight to madeline's poor starved heart never had such a wealth of affection been bestowed on her she would have given the world to rush into the outstretched arms and to pillow her weary head upon that sheltering breast but the conviction that she was that she must be the victim of some singular mistake and that this tenderness could not from the very nature of things really be meant for her trammelled her limbs she shrank back doubtfully i am sure she said that there is some very strange mistake that i am not the person you suppose i am nothing and no one at all a penniless and a friendless girl as she spoke the old lady clapped her hands with a little cry of rapture she turned to the old gentleman it is her voice her very voice as you say it is indeed a miracle is it not did i not tell you truly is it not incredible who would have thought that god would have given two such creatures to the world and yet he has indeed and indeed he has again she advanced towards madeline who again shrank back my dear do not shrink from me there is no mistake i assure you there is none it's only one of god's miracles that's all come you must let me dress you the time passes the countess will be waiting feeling quite incapable of argument although still persuaded that there was an error somewhere and an amazing one madeline suffered the old lady to lead her into a room it was a bedroom but such a bedroom as had never entered within the four corners of even her wildest dreams the walls were hung with pale pink satin the curtains bed hangings carpet furniture coverings were of the faintest shade of faint light blue the wardrobes of which to madeline's unaccustomed eyes there were a surprising number were of creamy white as was the wash-hand stand and the dressing-table to madeline it seemed that this must be the very habitation of some fairy queen to add to her bewilderment without asking her permission by so much as a word the old lady commenced to remove her worn and shabby clothing what are you doing to me she inquired with faint remonstrance undressing you my dear you must have a bath it will do you good presently she found herself being led to still another apartment where was a bath of snow-white marble filled with perfumed water into this willingly enough she plunged the touch of the water was delicious she gave great sighs of satisfaction her wearied body seemed momentarily to revive every instant the warm eager blood of youth 
flowed swifter through her veins when she rose from the bath a realization of the perfect beauty of which painters only dream she felt like a new creature the old lady returning to assist her with her toilet held up her hands my dear my dear how lovely you are i had never thought that god would have made two of his creatures so beautiful but indeed his powers are infinite at this outspoken praise madeline blushed a rosy red which the old lady promptly noted ah there you're different at last she never blushed never in all her life madeline was returned to the bedroom where she was enshrined in garments the like of which she had never supposed the existence she had all a young girl's natural love for delicate apparel but this was something altogether beyond even the range of her young heart's imaginings everything was fashioned of the finest and most delicate hued silks and trimmed with a liberal appreciation of what trimmings ought to be with the costliest laces she realized very quickly that this old lady was putting a fortune on her back that is in money value as much as she would be likely to earn and more if she worked mrs griffith's typewriters her whole life long had she indeed suddenly become a fairy princess and was this wonderland while she was in the very middle of her toilet an incident occurred which showed that even if she was in the realms of romance she was still within the reach of disagreeable possibilities all at once the bedroom door was opened and without any sort of warning some one entered her back was towards the door she was seated in a chair at the moment and the old lady was doing her hair it was the first time it had ever been done by any person but herself as the door opened the old lady gave it a dexterous twist so that its luxuriant abundance served to effectually conceal her countenance and at the same moment her deft attendant whispered in her ear don't look round it's the lady hildegard answer her as shortly as you can madeline did as she was bid realizing as she kept her face averted what a false position it was she occupied a strident feminine voice addressed her from behind so you have returned i thought you had gone for good madeline faintly replied remembering the old lady's injunction in a voice which despite herself was tremulous yes i have returned and in a milder mood it seems your voice is not quite so loud pitched as when i heard it last the speaker's own voice was loud pitched enough in all conscience i hope that the milder mood will continue to prevail it had better for your own sake i promise you if you are not careful the number of your escapades will reach one too many there is a limit to conrad's patience as well as to mine although you may not think so i've only to tell him of one or two passages with which i am acquainted and he would be as willing to connect himself with a woman of the street as with you it seemed that the speaker had gone for the door had banged but she immediately returned by the way the countess will be ready for you shortly mind you're ready for her and disposed to behave yourself better than you have done of late she has been making inquiries about certain little episodes which we have found it difficult to satisfy i promise you her patience is waning fast once more the door banged this time it seemed that the strident voice lady had gone for good madeline trembling in every limb turned her crimson face towards the old lady who still wrought deftly with the glories of her hair tell me what is the meaning of all this why have you brought me here the old lady strove to calm her hush my dear hush i will tell you all about it if you will keep still if you are not careful you will tangle your hair what does it matter about my hair i've always done it for myself and i can do it still leave it alone and tell me first why you have introduced me to a stranger's house why you are putting on me another person's things if you are proposing that i should play a part in some scheme 
of organized deception which i am beginning to suspect you are i tell you plainly that i will have no hand in it my life does not move in the same orbit as that of countesses but my honour is as dear to me as if it did at all and every cost i will keep it stainless and unspotted from the world in her excitement madeline had risen from her seat and stood with the magnificent splendour of her radiant hair streaming loose over her lovely shoulders facing her gentle-mannered attendant as if she were an accusing spirit the old lady shook her head and looked at her with a suspicious something gleaming in her kindly eyes my dear my dear you're even like her in your temper it's a miracle indeed like who who am i like and what is a miracle say plainly what you mean i will if you will sit down and let me finish your hair i cannot talk quietly to you my dear while you are raging at me with your hair all down your back it isn't in human nature sit down and let me finish and while i'm doing so i will tell you all there is to tell as plainly as you yourself can wish and answer all the questions you may choose to ask very well said madeline and sat down now tell me everything and first of all who did that lady take me for my dear you are miss maud dorincourt miss maud dorincourt madeline whirled round on her chair only the old lady's dexterity saved her from pulling a handful of the girl's hair out by the roots i'm nothing of the kind i'm madeline orme my dear if you are so hasty you will make me do some mischief to your beautiful hair the old lady's manner was as placid as the other's was the reverse my dear at present you are miss maud dorincourt the speaker resumed the task of arranging the other's shining locks as collectedly as if nothing beyond the merest commonplaces were being exchanged and once more the girl interrupted the proceedings by springing from her seat i am not miss maud dorincourt neither now nor at any other time what nonsense are you talking will you explain still the other's manner showed no symptoms of being ruffled if you will permit me that is just what i wish to do but how can i if you keep stopping me sit still and try and be a little patient child thus urged the girl again resumed her place and the other her task her deaf fingers never ceasing although her tongue kept wagging there was in her tone as she proceeded a pathetic a piteous something which in spite of herself melted her listener's perhaps too susceptible heart there is a great calamity threatening a noble house it is to prevent its coming that my husband has brought you here was that your husband who came to mrs griffith's that is he his name is charles singleton he is the house steward i am miss maud's own maid we have been here all our lives long before miss maud was born in her mother's time when her mother was a child mrs singleton paused it seemed strange to hear this gentle yet dignified old dame speak of herself as somebody's maid she went on with a curious yet eloquent simplicity we love miss maud charles and i as if she were our own child ay better than our lives the countess is her grandmother her mother was the countess's only child her mother made a marriage which displeased the countess and for which she never was forgiven it was only after she was dead that miss maud was brought to the house and then i believe it was as much to spite lady hildegard as anything else that was lady hildegard fanshawe who was in here just now she is the mother of the present earl of staines and the niece by marriage of the countess this house is the countess's and the earl who has only the title is a very poor man the countess on the contrary is very rich and she has announced that she intends to leave all she has to her granddaughter miss maud but only on condition that she marries her cousin the earl mrs singleton paused to sigh miss maud is a very flighty young lady god forgive me that i should ever say it to a stranger but she has been badly used among them 
they want to treat her as if she were a sawdust figure without natural likes and dislikes and miss maud won't have it she has kept putting off saying whether she will or won't marry the earl and at last she has disappeared mrs singleton's voice quavered she almost broke down disappeared cried madeline yes disappeared lady hildegard thinks that she only went out this morning to annoy her grandmother who hates her going out alone but she went last night but where did she go to charles and i have our suspicions and i especially have mine she has told me more than once that she was going but i pretended not to believe her and now she has been as good as her word and gone there's a music man about the place who is no better than he ought to be and i fear that he knows more about miss maud's disappearance than he should anyhow the chief thing to be done is to keep her absence from her grandmother the countess would think no more of turning her out penniless into the streets than nothing she would serve her as she served her mother but how are you going to prevent her finding out you are going to do that i yes you if you are the kind-hearted young lady i take you to be but you are mad how am i a perfect stranger to do this altogether impossible thing it's in this way charles was going out early this morning to make certain inquiries when he saw as he thought miss maud in front of him she was not dressed as miss maud is generally dressed but still he made no doubt that it was she he followed to see where she went and to his surprise she passed through a doorway within which it was announced were the offices of a certain typewriting company he came back and told me what he had seen it's not miss maud i said i don't believe it is miss maud you see i had reasons of my own for my belief but whoever it is fetch her here quickly and let me have a look at her the countess has been inquiring for miss maud the old lady's in one of her tempers and if the child can't be found heaven alone knows what the result will be well he fetched you mrs singleton's hands obviously quivered and her voice quivered with them my dear when i saw you i could scarcely believe my own eyes you are miss maud's own double in colour height figure features voice and bearing you are as like her as one pea is like another were you dressed alike and in the same room together there would be continual confusion as to which was which i have known my darling all her life yet when you were in the bath just now had i come upon you unawares i could have sworn that you were she it's one of god's own miracles it's nothing else why see her very dresses fit you as if they had been made for you while the old lady had been talking her nimble fingers had been fitting on to the bewildered and unresisting madeline a dress of some shimmering green material which the girl could not but admit to herself as she surveyed the outlines of her perfect figure in the cheval glass which was in front of her did fit her like a glove before she could collect her thoughts sufficiently to reply mrs singleton continued what i want you to do my dear is to behave as if you were miss maud until the child herself returns which may be to-day to-morrow any minute of any hour to save a noble house from shame and a hot-headed child from the two cruel consequences of what is after all but a childish freak oh my dear dear young lady to madeline's horror mrs singleton actually sank on her knees and the tears streamed down her cheeks we are only servants my husband and i but we are neither so poor nor so helpless as you may think if you do the thing i beg of you there is nothing of ours which shall not be yours for the asking even to our heart's blood get up my dear creature you must not kneel to me madeline raised the old lady willy-nilly to her feet i am persuaded that you are under some strange misapprehension that the resemblance which exists between miss dorincourt and me is at the best but superficial the imposture would be detected in a moment you think so as to that you shall yourself decide come and you shall see mrs singleton led the way into the adjacent chamber the room of purple crimson and gold stand there look in front of you mrs singleton directed the girl to stand 
on a certain designated spot facing the wall and perhaps some four or five feet from it the old lady stretched out her arm and touched what was probably some hidden spring the gold and crimson curtain was drawn aside madeline found herself confronted by a mirror which was as tall as herself apparently the spring was touched again the mirror revolved again and again there was another revolution mrs singleton's arm went back to her side the mirror ceased to revolve the hanging returned to its place well she inquired what do you think of that i don't understand you what do i think of what i suppose it is a revolving mirror that is all you think so observe once more again the hanging was withdrawn again the mirror was exposed there was the young girl's lovely person reflected with flattering fidelity in the silver glass again the spring was touched the mirror revolved there again was the reflection the old lady was regarding the original with a quizzical something in her kindly eyes well she repeated what do you think of that the situation seemed to puzzle madeline she glanced at the inquirer askance mrs singleton laughed outright move aside she said madeline did and wonder of wonders although she herself had moved her image remained mirrored in the glass why she exclaimed however's that don't you see you goose that it isn't you at all it's miss maud miss maud yes it's her portrait painted in the very dress that you've got on it's one of her whims now watch the figure of the girl revolved a plain mirror took his place you see that's what you looked at first you saw yourself reflected in it then i turned it round like that you saw miss maud's portrait painted on a mirror and you still believed it to be your own reflection if you cannot tell her from yourself then who do you suppose is likely to be able to madeline drew nearer to what she now perceived was indeed a portrait the resemblance to herself was marvellous the girl looked at her out of a mirror exactly as her own image had done a second ago it seemed incredible that the portrait was not actually her own the painter had caught one of her favourite poses every detail of her face and figure as faithfully as if she herself had been his subject it is like me she murmured it is it's wonderfully like like you cried mrs singleton it is you even granting it do you think it is exactly modest to stare at your own portrait as if it were the most wonderful thing the world contains the words came from someone who had taken advantage of their preoccupation to enter the room unnoticed madeline immediately recognizing in the owner of the voice her previous visitor she remembered mrs singleton had spoken of her as lady hildegard fanshawe she felt as startled she turned and regarded the first member of the aristocracy she ever to her knowledge had set eyes upon that miss dorincourt after all might stand excused if she had run away to avoid spending too many of the days of her youth in lady hildegard's society the lady before her was short and broad and not so much fat as thick her head was large her jaw was square and bovine she had a moustache which a stripling might have envied the bridge of her roman nose was surmounted by the very largest pair of spectacles which madeline had ever seen before a human pair of eyes there was that about them which inevitably suggested that the next stage with this lady would be a piece of string and a dog her scanty grey hair was drawn into a hard knot at the back altogether her appearance proclaimed that she had scant sympathy with those minor graces which if encouraged do so much to brighten the days and the years of our lives the vision of this high-born dame filled madeline with such a sense of aversion that all thoughts of fear were banished unconsciously she drew herself up with that air of dignity which so well became her her eyes sparkled her lips were closer pressed the lady hildegard surveyed her from head to foot as if she were some lay figure i see you have that dress on of which i've already told you that i disapprove good i suppose that's intended for a signal still mutinous eh so the time will come my girl when you shall be taught better manners and soon if you won't bend you shall be broken be sure of it come the countess is waiting for you in the music-room take my advice you will this time if you are not too great a fool be careful of what you do and say the countess the girl shrunk back yes the countess what afraid 
this is something fresh what have you been doing now i wonder that should give you new cause for fear whatever it is i'll be bound it's no more disgraceful than dozens of things you have done already i know you too well my girl do not think that you deceive me another thing the earl is there and reginald behave to both of them better than you did last time or as i live i'll make you smart for it and that as you never smarted before now come unless terror ties your feet the speaker passed from the room mrs singleton glanced eagerly anxiously at madeline go she murmured my dear i implore you go with her do not be afraid they'll never find you out i'm sure they never will i'm not afraid answered madeline her lips curled as with a scornful smile do not think i am afraid lady hildegard's unprepossessing countenance reappeared at the doorway her voice was more aggressively strident even than before are you coming or do you intend to stop and gossip with singleton all day no cried madeline i am coming now she laughed she alone knew what at and she swept after lady hildegard out of the room looking every inch as much a queen as any that is set upon a throne End of chapter two chapter three of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three what happened in the music room lady hildegard led the way through corridor after corridor until the girl following with beating heart behind wondered if the way would ever cease at last she paused before a pair of huge oaken doors which time had blackened turning she gripped her companion by the wrist a malevolent something came into her face which did not tend to increase its beauty although she spoke beneath her breath her voice was harsh and cold and full of significance take my advice don't have too many eyes for bianchi we are not all such fools as you suppose before madeline could even attempt to guess at the meaning she intended to convey lady hildegard had opened one of the doors and the girl had followed her into the room beyond madeline found herself in a room of such unusual dimensions that she found it difficult to realize that it could be a private apartment at all there was room enough to seat some three hundred persons in comfort a gallery ran all round it in this gallery at the further end facing the door through which she had entered was a splendid organ whose gilded pipes gleamed in the uncertain light which stole through the painted windows the keyboard was illumined by a single incandescent lamp in front of it leaning with one hand on the gallery's edge a man was standing coming from the light into the partial shadow madeline's eye was at once caught by the electric star which shone in front and so it chanced that her glance rested for a moment on the man who stood between it and her in that brief instant it seemed as if he had made her a signal to say the least of a curious kind he raised his right hand pressed his fingers to his lips and seemed to waft towards her a kiss she might have placed upon the gesture a false construction or it might not have been meant for her at all but the seeming was so real that she felt the tell-tale blush mounting to her cheeks the man's action whether the interpretation she placed on it was right or wrong did more to set her senses in a whirl than all that had gone before some seconds elapsed before she realized that lady hildegard had led her down the room and that she was standing before some one who was regarding her as if she were a sort of chattel well said a voice so it's you the sound of this voice roused her to some sense of her surroundings she woke to find that before her in a plain straight-backed oak armchair was seated an old lady so old that she felt that it would be vain 
to try to guess from appearances only how old she was bent almost double her chin hung forward on her breast her scanty hair was white as snow her face was so wrinkled and so shrunken that it was hard to realize how it might once have looked she was so thin as to be little else than skin and bone the bones on the withered hands which rested on either arm of the chair were articulated like a skeleton's and yet in spite of her decrepitude there was that about her which suggested that one looked on a great lady the eyes seeming scarcely dimmed by the passage of the years shone with the light of authority her voice weak and querulous though in truth it was was the voice of one accustomed to command there was that in her bearing which suggested that she had lived all her life in an atmosphere of deference she addressed madeline a second time her keen eyes seeming to pierce her like a gimlet is that all you have to say for yourself and to me the girl's senses reeled it was all she could do to keep herself from tottering this she presumed was the countess of staines that terrible old lady of whom mrs singleton stood in such tragic awe to appease whose wrath she herself was here and in such a terribly false position what was she to do to say old though the countess was and madeline told herself that she looked at least a hundred it was obvious that hers was not the sort of age which could be easily deceived little would be likely to escape that intensely scrutinous vision that she expected an answer was plain yet what sort of answer was she supposed to give what was miss dorincourt's fashion of addressing her while she hesitated the old lady waxed impatient are you tongue-tied you are not wont to be what is the matter with you girl speak to me compelled to an instant decision madeline resolved to be herself as natural as she could be a faint blush mantled her cheeks as she met the other's glances thank you there is nothing the matter with me i hope that you are well so soon as she had spoken she felt that in some way she had blundered there came a sudden flashing in the old dame's eyes which was like a beacon light she seemed to regard the girl more keenly than ever it is not your habit to make inquiries as to my health but i am like you there is nothing the matter with me madeline felt as if the old lady's glances exercised on her the legendary fascination of the serpent she could not take her own away the countess seemed to be peering into her very soul an interruption from another quarter came as a positive relief we were afraid as you have favoured us with so little of your society of late that you were indisposed the speaker was a man and there was that in his tone which for some indefinable reason seemed to speak straight to the girl's heart for the first time since she had entered what was to her as yet that house of mystery there sounded in her ears a pleasant note with a little start she turned to look at the speaker and as she did so a strange thrill went over her was it imagination or was she really looking at some one whom in some subtle esoteric fashion she had known her whole life long this was no stranger this tall dark-skinned gentleman with the serious face and the scar upon his brow with that scar she had been familiar this many a year yet she had not seen it or him before in the flesh and if not in the flesh then where for there came on her a sudden overwhelming conviction that she knew this man had known him all along as a woman looks to know one man only the one man of her life as she met his eyes something passed from him to her which set her heart a-beating as if actuated by a sudden impulse he advanced towards her with outstretched hand i am very glad to see you looking so well thank you you are very kind the words were banal but as his grasp closed on hers it was as though a window in heaven had been opened and her whole frame had been saturated by the effulgence of the glory she was all in a tremor and in the midst of her tremblement the old lady's voice cut in like the rasp of a saw hey day what moods possessed you now as a rule you two are not so emotional 
another man's voice interposed woman's always changing is it not so cousin have you no mood of tenderness for me this new speaker was on madeline's other hand a handsomer man than she had ever beheld he was tall and carried himself with a rare and easy grace his head was fairly set upon his shoulders he had big eyes of deep dark blue and the sunniest face his voice was soft and musical his manner full of charm and yet madeline felt that she would have given half a dozen of him for the one with a scar he spoke to her as cousin was this the earl of staines was he the man miss dorincourt was in duty bound to marry seeing her silent he persisted in his inquiry am i to take silence for consent will you not give me your hand after this long parting she gave him her hand unwillingly oddly the pressure which he gave it seemed to chill her to the bone he held it for a moment in his regarding her with eyes which in spite of their apparent frankness seemed to her secretive why he said how you have changed whether there really was so or not there appeared to her to be a meaning in his words which turned the blood in her veins to ice again the old lady's querulous tone struck in this time she was glad they did when you have finished this unusual interchange of pretty speeches perhaps you young folks will sit down bianchi's waiting maud sit here madeline finding herself addressed as maud placed herself where the old lady signified in a low chair on her right the handsomer of the two men seated himself on one side a little in front in such a position that he could rake her continually with his eyes the girl wished cordially that he had seated himself elsewhere he with the scar placed himself at her back now and then leaning forward so close to her that she could feel his breath upon her neck the consciousness of his near neighbourhood filled her with a sense of comfort as if he were there for her protection to guard and to keep her the countess struck a bell which was on a little table at her left the man in the gallery who had been a keen observer of all that had taken place bowed with something in his bow could those below only have been aware of it which savoured of mockery turning towards the organ he seated himself at the keyboard and he began to play madeline's temperament was acutely sensitive at all times music affected her as it does nervous organizations here and there the man in the gallery was a master the organ was his chosen instrument he did with it what only a master could nor could he have had a nobler example of its kind to pour out its magic under the pressure of his fingers the girl below listened like one in a vision indeed it all seemed to her to be part and parcel of a vision she realized her surroundings half fantastically as one does in dreams a couple of hours ago a harried toiler in mrs griffith's office and now what now was she the chief actress in an up-to-date version of the old arabian tale of the man who was permitted to be sultan for a day the organ to her sang songs of mystery told tales of wonders which by mortal eyes shall never be seen what could have been more in harmony with her own position here she was a puppet not only in another's place but actually in another's clothing an impostor pretending to be someone else and the point of the joke was that she really only had the very faintest notion as to whom it was she was pretending to be the marvel was that the imposture had not been discovered ere now the uncertain light of the place perhaps aided her no doubt the church-like dimness of the chamber assisted her in juggling with the senses of these four people and yet it seemed to her that suspicion had been aroused the searching glances of the countess never ceased to scrutinize her features what was it she sought if it was not evidence of imposture and the man upon her right why were those beautiful blue eyes of his fixed upon her with what seemed laughter in their depths instinct with her moved quickly already she was persuaded that this handsome gentleman was one of whom in any case she would do well to stand afraid he with the scar what he was thinking of she did not know but she had no fear of him the music ceased she sighed the rapture of the rolling chords seemed to have strained her nerves till they were tense as fiddle-strings a voice spoke in her ear 
how do you love music indeed and i've so little of it so little his tone recalled to her that forgetting to impersonate miss dorincourt she had spoken as madeline orme she was conscious that he gazed inquiringly at her flushing cheeks come round the room with me there is something which i wish to say to you without a word she rose from her seat he fell in at her side together they strolled slowly under the shadow of the gallery her nerves were quivering it was on the tip of her tongue to tell him if he could not perceive it for himself that he was being tricked there was something about this man's presence which filled her with so strange a sense of gladness that it cut her to the quick to think of the part that she was set to play with him you seem changed if his words conveyed reproach or suspicion nothing of the kind seemed suggested by his tone and that nothing of the kind was intended what immediately followed showed and for the better he seemed to speak timidly as if he were afraid of how she would take him you do not mind my saying that you seem to have changed and for the better i wish that you always were like this one might almost think that you had ceased to regard me with aversion regard you with aversion i half involuntarily she gave him one lightning look the enormity of the charge had taken her unawares when he spoke again his voice seemed huskier maud do you know that when you look at me like that you set the blood boiling in my veins you are under a delusion her tone was colder not only did his words recall her to a sense of her position but they woke in her a curious consciousness that her own blood was warmer than it was wont to be you are more like yourself when you speak like that i know you better when your voice expresses the repulsion which i am aware you feel still the fact is as i say that when your eyes do meet mine they turn me dizzy and in some odd fashion which i own myself unable to describe you seem lovelier than ever to-day sir sir has it come to that to call me sir what shall i call you then is it quite impossible that you should force your lips to call me conrad conrad the name came to her lips spontaneously not once nor twice but again and again an insane desire seized her to call him by the name which he himself desired but she refrained it would only increase the delusion under which you are labouring if i were to do anything of the kind i suppose it would yet do not imagine that i am under a delusion i am not so silly i am perfectly aware that your present mood is evanescent like all your others there was a bitterness in his words which smote her very soon again you will take no more notice of me than if i were a cur all that i know but your present mood is so unusual and so becomes you that you must forgive me if i desire to make the most of it as i have told you many a time you are in outward seeming my ideal of all that a woman ought to be but never i do believe have i realized your manifold perfection until this hour i don't know how it is i suppose my dear maud it is because i am a dunce but so it is you are under a grotesque misapprehension if you imagine i am perfect in any conceivable sense this outspoken adulation from a stranger made her burn all over he misunderstood her utterly i thought that on that point at any rate you and i were occasionally agreed are you suggesting that i have ever hinted i was perfect he looked at her with something like malicious amusement in his eyes isn't hinted rather a mild word under the circumstances maud are you are you in earnest are you in earnest in your present mood are you really disposed to deny that you have asserted that physically you are a type of the perfect feminine sir sir again what is the meaning of it maud i have known you in how many moods but i confess that in your present one you surpass my comprehension he went closer to her why you're trembling what is the matter with you child they were standing immediately underneath the great organ it was true enough that she was trembling to such an extent that she had to seek the support of one of the pillars which upheld the gallery to help her stand he gazed at her bewilderment concern writ large all over him maud what is the matter with you for god's sake tell me it's nothing i'm 
only a little faint that's all can you get me a chair the nearest chair was that on which she had been sitting about the centre of the room he rushed off for it as he went the instant his back was turned something came quivering down towards her from above it was a flower a lily in spite of the giddiness which had all at once come over her she perceived quite clearly what it was and as if by instinct she understood from whom it came she knew as surely as if she had seen him drop it that it had come from the musician above her head secure in the conviction that in the imperfect light his action would go unperceived by those who were in the centre of the spacious chamber conscious that she was below him he had suffered it to flutter from his fingers over the gallery's edge so far as appearances went she suffered no sign to escape her that the thing had even been noticed the flower dropped at her feet and there she let it lie and there it still was lying when her late companion returned bearing a chair and accompanied by the man with the beautiful blue eyes this handsome gentleman looked at her askance staines tells us that you feel faint that is not a weakness to which you are often subject he has filled us with concern is there anything we can do for you the speaker's tone in spite of its perfect suavity more than suggested mockery she bit her lip as she perceived it was so thank you your concern is quite unwarranted i am better now it was merely a little passing giddiness she seated herself on the chair which the earl had brought her for she realized in the face of the other's words that the man with the scar was indeed the earl of staines as she did so the handsome gentleman's glance was caught by the lily which was lying at her feet he picked it up is this yours she shook her head no i am sorry had it been yours i would have entreated you to permit me to make it mine you are welcome you are very good but since it is not yours one hardly cares to become the possessor of an anonymous flower so we will pass it on to staines he offered it with a mocking gesture to the other the earl in a sudden access of passion struck it from his hand and strode away the other looked after him with laughing eyes there goes his gentle-tempered lordship in a blaze of rage when one is the elder brother one can afford to shower scorn upon the younger he turned his attention to madeline leaning his tall figure against the pillar and looking down at her as she reclined in her chair she thought how handsome he looked and how she wished he was not there the countess struck her bell the sound vibrating through the silent room that's the signal for the performance to recommence how nice it must be to be an organ grinder of an altogether superior kind and to be instructed by bell when to grind i don't wonder that bianchi finds it a trifle galling there was something in the speaker's tone and manner which told madeline that for some reason or other he expected and intended that his words would hurt her feelings but since as a matter of fact he did nothing of the kind she bore them with a calmness which it was plain surprised him he looked at her as if waiting for an outburst which did not come then he laughed you've tried to scratch out my eyes for less than that what ails you maud do you know that there's something about you to-day which i can't make out at all something clear she was conscious that this man was regarding her with very different eyes to her late companion and that his glance and his intention were alike unfriendly the aversion with which he had unconsciously filled her when first she had heard his voice burst on the instant into flame she returned him look for look resolute that at any cost she would not give herself away to him it is very good of you to favour me with enough of your attention to credit me with differences which exist in your imagination i am not so sure that they do exist in my imagination only that remark is more like your usual self but it is hardly malevolent enough in some curious way you seem softer gentler as if you had had your teeth extracted and your claws well pared were it not impossible i should almost have suspected you of having had a serious illness from which you have returned modified a milder meeker edition of the maud i knew and loved so well have you been at death's door within the last four-and-twenty hours dearest maud and kept it hidden from your friends there was a malicious raillery in his words and tone and manner which irritated her almost beyond bearing the organ thundered overhead but to her this man turned its rare harmonies into hideous discords 
apply your criticism to some worthier and more appreciative object permit me to listen to the music bianchi's music there was a covert and yet an obvious insolence in the way in which he uttered these two words which made her feel as if she could have struck him she looked at him with eyes which blazed then stood upright no sir not to bianchi's music but to god's she would have moved from him then and there had he not caught her by the wrist maud consciously or not he exerted a degree of force in holding her which caused her positive pain let me go you are hurting me and you do you not hurt me every hour of every day you live his manner had undergone a sudden and startling change his dilettante air had given place to an intensity which approached ferocity what do you mean you are bad i shall be mad soon before you've done with me you're one of those women who drive men mad but if i am to be destroyed we'll be destroyed together i give you my word for that will you let me go or am i to call for help what is the matter with you now something was the matter he was staring at the hand he held as if he could not credit the evidence of his own eyesight raising it nearer and nearer to his face examining it all the time with eager intentness as if about it there was something which he esteemed miraculous all at once just as she was beginning to wonder if he indeed had gone mad he transferred his glance from her hand to her face you're not maud he exclaimed i felt there was something and as i live that's it he released her hand throwing it from him with such sudden violence that she staggered backwards sir she cried as with difficulty she saved herself from stumbling sir he followed her hotly eagerly examining her features with eyes that burned you're not maud you're not maud there's a juggle somewhere but you're not maud dorincourt and that i'll swear just then the organ ceased as the last notes died away in murmurous tremors the earl of staines came hurrying forward reginald he exclaimed what are you doing to maud he turned to the frightened girl what has happened what is he saying to you child she stared at him with ashen cheeks and palpitating heart hardly knowing whether or not to appeal to him for aid nothing she murmured nothing the handsome gentleman laughed though there was that in his laughter which hardly suggested merriment what have i been saying to maud why as the lady says nothing my dear man i haven't been speaking to maud at all End of chapter three chapter four of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain the stranger in the shadow madeline parted from the others in the music room they went their way and she hers and then something happened which would have been wholly ludicrous had it not been to her so nearly akin to tragedy she could not make out which her way was in what was supposed to be her own home she lost herself she went down corridor after corridor turned corner after corner looked at door after door which led into the room which she had quitted she had not the faintest notion one or two doors she opened only to close them hastily on discovering that they certainly were not the entrances to the apartment which was presumed to be her own at last a maid appeared madeline leaned against the wall she stopped her will you will you help me to my room i'm feeling faint it was a lie and madeline felt unspeakably ashamed of herself for being compelled to utter it the girl stared at her in evident surprise madeline remembering what had been said about miss dorincourt not being subject to fits of faintness understood the cause of her amazement shall i send some one to you miss thank you it is nothing if you'll help me to my room the girl helped her willingly enough offering her arm for the supposed invalid to lean upon it was well that madeline had appealed for her assistance she had been looking at one end of the building while it turned out that the room she sought 
was at the other so soon as she was safe inside and the maid was gone she sank into a chair feeling genuinely overcome but she was only quiescent for a moment the next she had sprung to her feet all agog with excitement the memory of the scenes which she had recently gone through flamed in her brain i will go i will i will not stop another hour in the place better typewriting better mrs griffith's injustice better the workhouse or starvation better anything than this why what i've been doing's criminal i've no more right to be where i am than the burglar who enters through the window to think i should have sunk to wearing another woman's clothes like some dishonest servant girl and to pretending i am her although she was alone she put up her hands to veil her face in the passion of her shame and that man how he spoke to me how easily he found out the imposture as of course he would do as he could not help but do what is there about me that i could delude any one into supposing that i was a relation of earls and countesses glee i'd better while still i have the chance at once he's not the sort to show mercy to me or to any one for all i know the tale's all over the house already and the police have been sent for to hale me off to jail let them come if they do come and find me here they shall at least not find me in another's clothing i will at least stand confessed in the rags which are my own with eager hands she began to unfasten the dress then she stopped to finger the material what a beautiful gown how lovely it must be always to be able to wear such clothes always to be clad in silks and satins and the softest of soft raiment it is the clothing makes the woman why in such things as these i'm positively prepossessing she drew aside the curtain from before the mirror in the wall vain who wouldn't be vain in such attire is it immortal not to feel oneself above the common herd never in my life has my entire wardrobe at any one time been worth a five-pound note and now i wonder how many pounds i'm wearing now another woman's pounds she searched for and found the spring which caused the mirror to revolve and was confronted by her counterfeit presentment it's wonderful marvellous as mrs singleton says it's one of god's own miracles if it were not for my capacity to pinch myself i should be at a loss to know which was her and which was me she was born to be fortune's favourite and i well i hope that i was at least born to be an honest woman so i'll off with miss doran court's gorgeous apparel and i'll return if the police will let me to virtue poverty and heaven knows to peace of mind and to you miss dorincourt so unlike and yet so like myself i'll say good-bye she touched the spring the portrait vanished the curtain returned to its place she recommenced the process of unrobing hardly had she done so than the door opened and mrs singleton appeared the old lady at once perceived what it was that she was doing what is the matter with you child nothing is the matter with me mrs singleton only i'm going home home what has happened everything has happened have you been found out i have by the countess i have no particular reason to suppose that she discovered the imposture not by the earl not by the earl but by the gentleman with the big blue eyes mrs singleton gave what seemed to be a sigh of relief that's mr reginald fanshawe his lordship's brother i was afraid of him i ought to have warned you he's a dangerous man as sharp as a razor and at the bottom of all the mischief that is doing he hates miss maud nothing would please him better than to see her 
robbed of her birthright i believe he would give a good round sum to have her at the bottom of the sea but how did he find you out that is more than i can tell you so far as i can make out it was by my hand your hand which one this the left one madeline held her left hand out in front of her mrs singleton peered at it anxiously through her glasses why of course it's the ring that's missing what a fool i've been i might have done something to supply its place or warned you to keep it out of sight what do you mean by it's the ring that's missing her mother's ring mrs dorincourt's hand was smaller than yours or than miss maud's and quite as beautiful i think ladies hands were smaller when i was young miss maud began to wear her mother's ring when she was quite a little girl on the third finger of the left hand she wears it still although her hand has grown so that it has become embedded in the flesh you would have to file it in two to get it off i suppose that mr reginald looked at your hand and saw that it was missing he did he stared at it as if it were some wondrous thing by it i was discovered so you see that now i have no option but to take myself away my dear i hope you will do nothing of the kind nobody cares for mr reginald except his mother i doubt if he has a friend in the house i know him better than you do he is no more capable of going and telling them right out what it is he has discovered than he is of flying he will keep his knowledge to himself and try to use it for purposes of his own if you suppose me incapable of throwing dust in his eyes you give me less credit than i deserve i am afraid mrs singleton that in any case i shall be unable to assist you in what you call throwing dust into mr reginald fanshawe's eyes i would not go through again what i have gone through in that music-room for a great deal of money i did not know to whom i was talking i had not the faintest notion how to address them or what to say every word which was spoken to me was an added torture i felt all the time that i was standing on the thinnest of thin ice which at any moment might break and cause me to be engulfed in the deep waters for ever and for i no thank you mrs singleton i have acted so far against my better judgment against every principle of honour and integrity by which i have endeavoured to rule my life now indeed you must let me go but my dear it will do you no harm to stay the night it will do me harm to stay another hour listen to me do not be so rash it is you who are rash don't you perceive the discovery which you are momentarily risking and how serious the consequences of such a discovery would be there will be no discovery i am sure of it i am certain besides better run the risk of that than of something infinitely worse now listen to me and be patient with me child my husband has reason to believe that he has scent of miss maud's whereabouts be frank with me have you yourself no notion where she is not the faintest miss maud is hot-headed impetuous discontented i am afraid she is not without cause for discontent she has threatened over and over again that she would vanish and at last she has been as good as her word she is not so blameworthy as may appear but if the countess discovers what she has done explanation will be useless she'll be hung first and tried afterwards my husband assures me he is on her track that she'll be found to-night if she is i promise you she'll be brought back at once and in the morning you'll be free and in the meantime i am to carry on the imposture to continue to act as her double in face of the discovery which has already occurred you need fear nothing rest assured it will be easy enough you needn't dine with the family dine with the family madeline shuddered not for a million pounds you need not you can dine in your own room any excuse will serve miss maud often does i only want to have you on the premises in case of accident in case of accident thank you mrs singleton it is a pleasant prospect which you offer me but my dear 
consider the good that you will do you will save this much wronged child for she has been sorely wronged from eternal wreckage from complete destruction for i tremble to think of what would happen to her if the countess cast her off think of the consequences which may ensue mrs singleton's eloquence was curtailed by a knocking at the door a maid appeared if you please mrs singleton the countess wishes to speak to you the maid retreated the old lady looked imploringly at madeline it is nothing she often sends for me promise me that you will wait here till i return madeline's tone as she replied was a trifle grim i promise you that but you must clearly understand that i promise you no more left alone madeline as she seated herself in a luxurious easy chair was conscious of curiously mingled feelings it was odd how already a sensation had come over her that she was and always would be at home in just such a place as this for which the four corners of the world had been ransacked to make of it a house beautiful never so far as she was aware had she lived in any but the very humblest dwellings yet since her introduction to this strange palace she felt as if she had never resided anywhere else nor had she ever come into corporeal contact with men and women of birth and breeding her lines had fallen in other places yet just now in the music-room whatever else she had been conscious of she had been unconscious of the fact that any mental or even social inequality existed or could exist between herself and her companions it was very odd the atmosphere of the place was getting into her veins she was aware of a reluctance to leave it it was as though she had come into her own at last honour seemed to point one way inclination and just the other she ought not to stay mrs singleton's pleadings were but sophistries and yet after all what harm would ensue if she lingered in this lotus land a single night what she did wonder at was what could have caused miss dorincourt to behave in the eccentric fashion she seemed to have done surely she could not have properly esteemed the good the gods had given her or she would not have flown so rashly to the ills she knew not of surely it must have needed a great deal of goading to have induced a beautiful girl be she as high-spirited and as wayward as you please to have run away from such a home as this as she mused the door behind her was suddenly opened she turned expecting to find that mrs singleton was back again but instead something was thrown into the room by an invisible hand and the door closed as quickly as it had been opened this something was thrown so carelessly or so maliciously that it actually struck madeline on the cheek afterwards rolling down her lap on to the floor so smartly too had it been flung that the impact stung her not a little she started from her seat putting her hand up to her cheek with a cry of pain who threw that she cried forgetting for a moment that she was there alone running to the door opening it she looked out in search of the delinquent not a creature was in sight whoever had thrown the thing had had reasons of his or her own for concealing his or her identity she returned into the room rubbing her cheek you're a coward she told herself whoever you are she looked about on the floor for what as the bright spot upon her cheek was already proclaiming had been used as a missile it was easily found she picked it up it proved to be a sheet of paper which had been folded and refolded until it formed a wedge on one of the sides was written in great sprawling letters as if with a soft quill pen two words and two words only for you madeline turned the paper over and over eyeing the inscription more and more intently for you i wonder if that is meant for me it looks as though it were no name as though the writer did not know my name only that mysterious inscription i am almost disposed to wager that i could not only point out the hand which wrote it but the hand which threw it too mr reginald fanshawe i fancy has paid me part of the debt which possibly he was under the impression that he owed me but she was wrong it was impossible to associate that luridly worded epistle 
with the phlegmatic reginald fanshawe without any sort of preamble it plunged at once in the middle of affairs so you would not have my flower well so let it be you would not have my lily the badge of your innocence of the whiteness of my love for you that i threw down at your feet it is enough he picked it up this reginald fanshawe because you paid to it no heed no you made a mock of it and he this earl of stains he struck it to the ground it is an end you have slighted me not alone my flower not for the first time you have used me as a mat beneath your feet it suffices you think you can throw me from you like an old glove you are wrong i love you unfortunate that i am you so fair so false but because i love you i do not suffer myself to be betrayed and to say nothing no i am not of that kind we will live together yes together or together we will die you understand that is my last word read it clearly make no jest of it it comes from him whose happiness you have destroyed whose heart you have broken you who have no heart paolo bianchi the signature at the bottom ran right across the page it was a triumph of flourishes curiously in keeping with the inflated language which it so bombastically endorsed madeline smiled as she noted it with laughter in her eyes and on her lips she perused the singular letter a second time it occurs to me that there is some slight confusion here this letter is for me and yet it's not for me paolo bianchi with what magnificence he signs his name i fancy i see him doing it i take it he is the gentleman who played the organ and played it like an angel too it would be as well if there was a little more of the angelic quality in his letters i thought that lily of the valley which fluttered over the gallery's edge was directed to my address and it appears that it was hence all these well hardly tears but mr bianchi you have shared in the common error in supposing me to be miss dorincourt there appears to have been passages between you and her which well perhaps mrs singleton does her less than justice in describing her as hot-headed she seems to have been manipulating a variety of strings which an uninterested novice would only be too apt to make a tangle of mr bianchi in particular judging from his letter and the way in which he delivered it strikes me as being the sort of gentleman one would like to have as little to do with as one conveniently could uncommonly difficult to get on with as a friend and still more difficult to get on with as an enemy but no doubt in these matters there are differences of taste and miss dorincourt may have her own why whatever's that the room in common as is seen with the rest of the house was at no time too well lighted the windows were old-fashioned small at an inconvenient height from the floor and the wall in which they were set was so thick that it seemed to cast a perpetual shadow the day was well advanced the sky overcast and cloudy the prevailing tints of purple and gold in which the apartment was upholstered did not especially at such an hour increase the sense of brightness it was between the lights when day is giving place to night the room was in obscurity madeline turning suddenly with the letter in her hand saw in front of her what she supposed at first to be her own reflection imagining that the curtain had been drawn and the mirror exposed a moment's inspection however showed her that she was mistaken what she was looking at was certainly no mirror what then she asked herself with a catching of her breath was it she was standing under one of the windows so that she might have as much light as possible to enable her to read paolo bianchi's letter at the opposite end of the room but on the same side of it as herself was a figure the figure of a woman she was standing close to the wall which shadowed her so that in the half-light her outlines were blurred and lost for some instants madeline was not certain that she was not looking at a shadow or that she was not the victim of some optical delusion how did she know that at the other end of the room there was not some peculiar arrangement of mirrors and that she had not placed herself in a position which brought the peculiarity into play 
the figure was so still so motionless and how could the woman have got where she was how could she have come into the room without madeline's knowledge the door was between them if it had been opened if any one had entered she must have been aware of it but there had not been a sound she could have sworn that no one had entered it was another trick with a mirror impressed by this conviction she moved a step or two forward waving her arms as she went expecting the figure to move in sympathy as figures in mirrors do nothing of the kind this one in front of her remained stock still was it a woman then why was she so still whence had she come and how what was she doing there what did she want or what was it her experience of the day had been of the most unusual kind of a sort to have set the equilibrium of the most matter-of-fact young woman and madeline was scarcely that hers was hardly the prosaic fibre imagination with her was strong the events of the last few hours had given it full scope at that moment it took wing was she in presence of the adventure of the day was all that had gone before to be capped with a fitting climax was this she was looking on a creature of flesh and blood or a thing of air she told herself she was a fool but in spite of it there was a shaking at her knees she had to put constraint on herself to enable herself to speak and when she did the voice which issued from her lips hardly seemed to her to be her own who are you tell me what do you want here none spoke there was a silence which silence reacted on madeline's overstrung nerves as if it had been some dreadful thing she shivered as with cold this made her angry speak to me she cried do you hear speak to me tell me who you are and what it is that you want here if you don't i'll call for help still no reply from the figure standing in the shadow of the wall very good then i'll call for help madeline moved towards the door with the intention of putting her not over valiant threat into immediate execution her action seemed to spur the figure in the shadow to decision she moved also and to more purpose than madeline to a purpose indeed which was wholly unexpected stepping to one side she touched what was probably a button in the wall of whose presence madeline had been unconscious and in a moment the room was flooded with the electric light the effect was startling madeline turned to look at the woman who had produced it and as she did so she gave a cry of inarticulate amazement staggering back she stared at her thunderstruck this woman in front of her was her duplicate her double her very self so like her that as in that case of the immortal twins it would have been impossible for an outsider to have told t'other from which in face form and figure she reproduced her perfectly even to the dimple in the chin and the colouring of the cheeks and eyes to the glorious mass of red-gold hair only the dress was different the stranger was clad in a flowing tea-gown of soft yielding dead gold silk covered with shining sequins and other barbaric ornaments which gleamed and glittered as she moved never madeline told herself had she beheld a being of such resplendent loveliness wholly oblivious of the vision she had beheld in the mirror the stranger spoke even her voice it seemed to madeline was an echo of her own this is rather funny to be asked who i am and what i'm doing here is an unusual experience scarcely were the words out of her lips than in her turn the stranger was struck by the resemblance which existed between them and plainly was to the full as much amazed by it as madeline had been why are you me or am i you either you're my twin sister or my twin soul or else you are my ghost or else you are my affinity my other self which exists for all of us in this world or in some other of whom gerda speaks may i touch you touch me of course you may the stranger advanced and with perfect gravity touched her with the finger-tip on either cheek and felt the substance of her arms you are solid you're not a delusion or a thing of air but this surpasses anything do you know you're my height to a hair my figure to a fraction of a shade do you know that you've my head and face and mouth and lips and chin and teeth and cheeks and nose and eyes and hair i do seem like you 
like me you're me we're each other why you even have my voice we speak in the same key it's a freak of nature it does seem strange strange it's marvellous a modern miracle do you know that narcissus like it's been to me a lifelong sorrow that the world did not contain such another lovely creature as myself whom i might kiss and fall in love with now all my cause for sorrow's gone that is if i may kiss you may i for answer madeline held up her lips the stranger kissed her as for loving you i'll love you if i may or mayn't my dear my dear i've been the loneliest creature in all this wide wide world and now i'll never be alone again and pray my other self what may chance to be your name madeline orme madeline orme it's a pretty name and well becomes you though no name could be lovely enough for you madeline orme i've been looking for you morn noon and night since the hour that i was born and now that i have found you i'll never let you go never never again the stranger folded her to her breast and queerly enough madeline felt as if she was in her proper place and who are you she inquired in a whisper the stranger laughed softly beneath her breath i i'm maud dorincourt End of chapter four chapter five of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain a voice in the darkness so bewildered had madeline been by the sudden appearance of the most enchanting stranger that she had never paused to consider that the probabilities were a million to one that she was maud dorincourt the revelation of her identity came to her as a positive surprise maud dorincourt you you are miss dorincourt the stranger catching her skirt with either hand swept her a laughing courtesy and yours most humbly to command but i don't understand i thought you'd vanished and so i have and reappeared to you in a vision a mere transient mirage yes but i didn't see you enter the room where did you come from ah that's my secret my dear i'm full of secrets to the finger-tips i'm a thing of mystery but the most mysterious thing i ever encountered in all my born days is you may i inquire where you came from mr singleton brought me did he indeed that was kind of him and pray are there many of your sort where you came from who come for the bringing then madeline told her tale miss dorincourt listening open-eyed and open-mouthed bursting when the tale was told into a torrent of words my dear it's a romance a true fairy tale this morning you were a typewriter and now you're here hammering at the keys for daily bread you do hammer at them don't you isn't that the proper word a dream of loveliness like you to think of it it makes one's blood run cold talk of mystery here's one you're me and i'm you we're interchangeable it's a fact there must be some bond of union between us it can't be merely accidental we must be sisters at the very least the evidence is much stronger than in the case of box and cox henceforward i'll devote my life to proving that throughout the interstellar spaces we have been one are one and shall be one for evermore you understand i'm afraid i don't i don't either so i'll try to put it in plain english now that you are here i'll leave not a stone unturned to show that there exists a closer tie between us than a trick of likeness but i shan't be here i'm going going when where why 
because you have returned the need for me exists no longer if it ever did except in mrs singleton's imagination but i've not returned nothing of the kind don't i tell you i'm but a vision purely transient like one of the ghosts i've come to revisit the glimpses of the moon but i must be back before the clock strikes twelve gracious child i'm only taking a peep at things below i'm sorry to have to keep on saying it but i'm afraid that once more i don't understand then i'll try to make you is that door open then we'll lock it and if any one wants to come in they can wait now sit down there and listen madeline placed herself in the indicated chair the other now standing in front of her now moving hither and thither about the room all light and life and fire the words coming from her lips like a stream of lava carrying madeline before them in their tempestuous flow what's the matter with me is that i'm bored to death to extinction born an artist which is my good fortune i've also been born into the caste of vere de vere which is my ill luck my whole frame's alive with music to the ends of my fingers and to the tips of my toes my singing voice is of a sort to entrance the angels it is quality and quantity you shall have a taste of it in a minute or two and then you shall see if that's mere bragging talk of patty and her triumphs and the ovations she's received with my face and form and voice i could and would witch the world as it never has been witched as i'll prove to your entire satisfaction my dearest dear before we're either of us much older and with all this to what am i destined to become the wife of solemn serious stodgy stupid cousin conrad earl of staines i didn't find him either stodgy or stupid no how did you find him well he perhaps didn't speak more than a couple of dozen words to me but what i saw of him i liked did you then you shall marry him miss dorincourt don't miss dorincourt me as the girl says in the play call me maud or nothing to you i'm maud 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 and only maud unless you can find something nearer and dearer but seriously the affair is plain you shall marry conrad how can you say such things they say themselves the thing is evident foreordained the problem which has been tying itself into knots for years is solved you're me and i'm you each is t'other you like him he likes me which is you he'll marry you thinking he's marrying me and all will be well for you for me or for him for all of us it's obvious enough i shall see it all quite clearly when i thought it over and so will you you shall marry conrad consider that as settled but that is by the way to return to our muttons to more serious matters which is me she broke into a peal of laughter throwing out her arms with a magnificent gesture which went far to show that at any rate on the dramatic side she was not lacking behold me unappreciated misunderstood constrained to do the thing i hate to load myself with trammels which would endure my whole life long while always my soul is aching longing to be free god has not bestowed on me this great gift of song for nothing to be treated like that talent which was hidden in the napkin it was given me to share with the world to brighten its dark hours to lighten its heavy hearts to add to the sum of the divine music it contains heaven has its unresting choirs and shall i refuse to be god's chorister on earth since he has set on me the sign nay but i dare not if i would for i am persuaded that the great gift which he has bestowed on me is to be shared with all the world she spoke in a tone of rhapsody to madeline it seemed with the very voice of inspiration all at once she came down from the heights with a plunge to the levels the joke is that my grandmother that's the old countess she has all the money you know 
is almost as much of a musician as i am she loves it i believe that if she had followed the dictates of her own heart she would have lived for it but the old adam of birth has been too strong for her family family is the cry that's always ringing in her ears and she wants me to hear nothing else as well but my dear it's not to be i give you my word for that the girl suddenly sat down on the floor in front of madeline bunching up her knees so that she could clasp them with her hands my dearest madeline this house like the folks who live in it is compounded of mystery i believe that it's the oldest house in london and i'm pretty sure that it's the largest i've lived in it pretty nearly my whole life long and i doubt if i know the whole of it to-day i can quite believe it's difficult to know i lost my way coming from the music-room just now nothing's easier than to lose your way in it it's a sort of maze a kind of rabbit warren with more ways out of it than the rabbits are themselves aware of what do you mean i'll tell you this room in which we are is in the oldest part of the building once when the workmen were doing something to the fireplace they came upon a sort of shaft at the back of the chimney the use of which they could not understand since it seemed designed to give light or air or both to some part or parts unknown the discovery set me thinking i'm of an inquiring turn of mind and it occurred to me that there might be more about that shaft than met the eye during the next few months i minutely overhauled every square inch of the four walls you see about you at last my patience was rewarded i found what do you think i found a secret door a secret door no but my dearest madeline i say yes it was by a complete fluke i chanced upon it after all and although it's within a few feet of where you're sitting i'm disposed to wager a considerable sum that you won't discover it it hadn't been used so far as i could judge for centuries i had to tell no end of stories and do all sorts of things before i could get it into proper working order so resolved was i to keep my secret to myself that i brought some workmen over with me from abroad who couldn't speak a word of english and set them at it and made them do what i required without any one having the faintest inkling that they had ever set foot within the place but how did you manage it ah that's again my secret but i did and that's enough my door leads to a stairway and this stairway to a room and not a bad room either i placed in it all sorts of things so that now it's as snug in its way which is my way as a body could desire and when i'm in it i'm as secluded and as inaccessible and as remote from human intercourse and human worries as if i were at the north pole and i really think a good deal more so for they may discover the north pole but they'll never discover me unless you were to give me away and i'm just as sure of you as i am of myself for you see you're me and i'm you i've been there a good deal of late for the worries have been pressing thick and fast and some nice tricks by its aid i've played on mrs singleton and now there's been an all-round rumpus they keep goading me to marry conrad or to say i will and i won't i won't never so i've taken up my abode there altogether really well as good as altogether one doesn't expect to be taken quite literally sweet but mrs singleton is in a dreadful state of mind about you she fears you've run away or done something desperate her husband's scouring london he thinks he's on your track let him think singleton's a good old soul and i love her dearly but she's not the wisest woman in the world and she's a little behind the times now you're here it'll all be plain sailing you'll keep on being me which you are and i being you will continue perched up aloft keeping a watchful eye on what is going on below but miss the other held up a warning finger maud what you suggest is out of the question i cannot continue the imposition which mrs singleton has forced rather than persuaded me to practice now my dearest be the sweet one that i know you are and the girl kneeling in front of her pressing her lips and cheeks to hers besought her with such hot eagerness and such bewitching grace that madeline unused to such cajoleries found herself unable to withstand her she did resist 
to the best of her ability but the impetuous petitioner drove her from point to point but you don't appreciate the difficulties of the task which you would set me already detection has come from mr fanshawe because i have not upon my finger some ring you wear it has has it she held out her left hand madeline perceiving that a time-worn wedding-ring was embedded in the firm white flesh i am afraid i couldn't give up my ring even to hoodwink mr fanshawe but he doesn't matter anyhow i am quite aware that he's the sort of person who wouldn't stick at a trifle but then nor would we we ought to be more than a match for him between us but that isn't all i used to think that i wasn't altogether a cowardly sort of person you're not you're as brave as a lion it's all very well for you to say so but i feel anything but lion-like when i contemplate the difficulties of the position into which you and mrs singleton are forcing me between you for instance there's this letter madeline held out the epistle which had been thrown in through the door paolo bianchi with what a flourish he writes his name how like the man that is maud read the letter through with a smile upon her face and pray of what conduct have you been guilty to call forth such a thunderbolt madeline told of the flower falling from the gallery i see and he supposes it was i who scorned his offering that's very funny isn't it i fear i fail to see the humour of the situation any more apparently than does the writer i am afraid he has not so keen an eye for humour as i might wish it's his weakness do you know my dear he loves me with the sort of love a cold-blooded englishman could never understand if it's the sort his letter suggests i think it's just as well for the englishman he can't ah my dear you don't understand it either and yet when i consider that i am you and you are me i think that perhaps some day you may then you will speak with other tongues for i may mention as the merest trifle i am giving you all my confidences i never had a confidant before you cannot think what a comfort you will be to me i love him too in my own fashion you love him the man who plays the organ my dearest madeline you must be one of granny's brood your speech betrays you she herself could not have spoken of him with a finer a more spontaneous scorn yes my dear with the man who plays the organ by the grace of god not by rule of thumb he is a genius a musician like i am and when he plays the organ he speaks to me with the tongues of angels just as when i sing i speak to him but what a serious face you wear it's a matter of no consequence i don't fancy i love him as much as he loves me not by not by so much she stretched out her hands on either side of her as far as they would go i feel sure i can i do love to torment him so from the style in which he writes i should imagine he's rather a dangerous person to torment he is excessively he's threatened to kill me more than once maud and he means it i shouldn't be the least surprised if one day he does he gets so very mad the knowledge of the risk i'm running makes our how shall i put it communications all the sweeter i do love a dangerous man don't you to the best of my knowledge and belief i don't and that i can honestly affirm maud laughed outright she sprang to her feet you're a quaker after all you're not exactly me i never was a quaker that i'll swear but come let's go to the music-room and i'll give you a taste of the voice the world is waiting for an idea of what is meant by the music of the spheres to the music-room but suppose some one sees us as we go oh suppose if some one sees us then some one sees us that is all my dear but give me your hand we'll run they did run side by side hand in hand scampering like two young deer as fortune had it they met no one on the way they reached the oaken doors quick urged maud there's some one coming in a moment they were in and standing listening they heard footsteps pass without that was a narrow squeak it's one of the men he'd have thought there were visions about if he'd seen two miss dorincourts how dark it is it is dark you didn't expect broad day 
i've a box of matches in my pocket if you wish it i'll shed a light upon the scene or there's a button at your back you've only to touch it and you can have the sponges of the electric spark but for me i love the dark i love its solitude its silence its mystery when i'm in the dark i always feel nearer to heaven and to god madeline was still she found the varying moods of this strange girl bewildering come give me your hand again i will lead you i'm at home here even in egyptian blackness this place has been to me a sanctuary it is so constructed that when the doors are closed nothing that is done within can be heard without so that it has been to me a temple in which when darkness and i have had it to ourselves i have been free to pour out my soul in song take care this is the staircase which leads to the gallery here we are come to the other end where the organ is that's the place to sing only a trained instinct could have surmised with any degree of certainty whereabouts they were the darkness was unrelieved sight was useless not a glimmer of light found its way within the blackness hung over the place like a pall the girls were enshrouded by seemingly impenetrable gloom madeline finding herself pushed gently backwards discovered that that was maud's method of assisting her into a chair maud passing out of reach vanished into the shadows she knew not where she sat in silence wondering where she was where the other was what was going to happen all at once her heart leaped to her bosom and then stood still the blood rushed to her head her brain was in a whirl her frame quivered with a strange emotion for suddenly a sound rose through the outer darkness which seemed to her in the first flush of her surprise to be supernatural maud was singing madeline had supposed when the other had been dilating on the rare qualities of the gift of song which had been bestowed on her that the girl was something of a braggart in that instant she knew better the circumstances were propitious the strangeness of the situation the spice of adventure which was in the air the romantic nature of the surroundings these things like an effective stage setting were in favour of the singer but in the presence of that voice they were as nothings the words the voice of one crying in the wilderness ring down the ages they convey to the mind a picture of something indescribably pathetic solemn dramatic but here was the voice of one singing in the night and such a voice within it something that was hardly human sweet clear penetrating a celestial melody it rose at first softly breathing through the gloom a miraculous suggestion of coming harmonies then it swelled and grew and soared higher and higher more and more till the very building its every corner filled by it to straining point seemed to quiver with the rapture of the song what she sang madeline did not know nor stopped to think nor cared it was the music of that voice which caused her eyes to overflow with the passion of her tears the voice was still she sat trembling wringing her hands crying as if her heart-strings had been rent then it came again and she ceased to cry for this time it sang some merry air told of joyous happenings of sunlit skies and festal hours and the gloom was lighted madeline beheld before her as in some strange fantastic dear delightful vision an illustration of the singer's theme and it brought brightness to her eyes smiles to her lips lightness to her heart a rare tremblement of ecstasy to her enraptured frame so that her toes and fingers tingled and her whole body quivered with a delicious sense of peace and life and pleasure once more the voice was hushed when it was raised again it was in the singing of a hymn one of those which constant association has made as it were part and parcel of the life of so large a proportion of the english-speaking peoples madeline had heard it in her infancy had sung it in her baby treble had grown up with it ringing in her ears associating it with her better moments and purer thoughts until it had become knitted into the fibre of her being and become a synonym for thoughts of heaven but never had she realized how vibrant it might become 
with angel voices until it rose from the unseen singer's lips an arrow of song seeming to cleave the gloom and to bring flooding down a shaft of glory from the presence chamber of the most high madeline would have fallen on to her knees had she been able but she could not she could but sit motionless trembling with awe and reverence as if the place in which she was was holy ground the hymn was sung to an end the last notes died away lingering lovingly as if the enraptured air was reluctant to let them go silence followed which was broken by a very human voice indeed it was a man's a foreigner's and seemed to madeline to come from close to where she was sitting his english was peculiar but he spoke with such a sincerity of passion that his oddity for the moment passed unnoticed what a gift what a voice what a power oh heaven what a soul you do with me as you will oh yes altogether you make me laugh you make me cry if you wish it with your singing you make me cry so that my heart shall break yes it is true but i say nothing i am content to die born to the grave by the raptures of your song maud there was a pause as if the speaker was waiting for an answer to his personal interrogation none came he tried again maud where are you maud do not play with me do not tease me do not torment me just now after singing like one of god's own angels yes indeed my life my soul my all speak to me stillness again madeline could hear the speaker moving as if he was searching cautiously as best he could in the prevailing darkness for the invisible singer why do you hide yourself do not hide yourself from me i beseech you not to if you could but know how my heart is hungry what would i not give to feel your presence near me to touch your hand my angel my beloved one how can you be so unkind so cruel maud it was plain from his tone that his search was proving as unavailing as his supplications presently madeline heard something proceeding from his lips which although it was not in english hardly sounded like a benediction all at once there was a flash of light he had illumined the solitary electric lamp which cast a glow upon the keyboard of the organ he stood within four or five feet of madeline the light shining full upon his face she recognizing in him the organist who had allowed the lily to fall over the gallery's edge although so close to him her seat was in the shadow at the back of him his eyes never wandered once in her direction travelling round the building in search of the recalcitrant maud ah i see you do not think to conceal yourself i see you plain why do you run away from me what have i done that you should seem to be afraid am i a thing of evil no not so i am the man that adores you more than all the world besides who offers you a life's devotion why then accord to me such usage maud for answer they came from the opposite gallery a burst of song the opening words of the air robert toi que j'aime followed by a burst of laughter the gentleman replied in kind singing in what was probably italian something with the meaning of which madeline was wholly unacquainted the lady continuing to carry out her role sang back to him something whose burden was so little to his taste that he cut her short in a torrent of passionate exclamations no no you shall not say that it is not to be borne no 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 are you then of so cruel a nature of so cold a heart it is not to be believed never never this time the lady condescended to reply to him in her ordinary speaking tones and in intelligible english her voice having in it a ring of mockery as it floated across the building my dear bianchi how comical you are the accusation seemed to anger him comical how am i comical how so it is then comical to behold a man whose heart is broken who is dying before your eyes yes by inches but why are you dying and who are you dying for cruel as if you did not know how can you treat me so my beautiful loveliest of women do you not know what is in my heart for you what a strength of adoration what a depth of devotion how i live for you work for you hope for you for you only how my love for you is as a consuming fire but englishmen don't love like that ah englishmen bah what do they know of love englishmen 
they are as cold as their own skies he spoke with a degree and a force of contempt which caused madeline to positively start but my dear bianchi you forget who i am forget no never that i never do sleeping or waking working or dreaming when i play it is to you when i compose it is from you the inspiration comes until i am dead and cold never for an instant shall you be forgotten i shall bear your memory with me across the grave not only do you forget who i am but you forget who you are after all you are only the man who plays the organ madeline recognized her own words they floated towards her through the darkness aflame with a malicious insolence which scorched her cheeks to her surprise he received them as a compliment well what would you have more i am he who breathes life into a beautiful dead soul that lies buried in the metal and the wood you are a musician and i is not that enough for you as for me i ask from god no more and that absurd letter of yours which you were so kind as to throw into my face i did not throw it in your face then some one did am i to cherish every flower you choose to tumble at my feet at the risk of being bullied it's too ridiculous is not a flower from you to me a sacred thing because i love you if then you love me why do you scorn my flowers suppose i care for neither is it that indeed you play with me my dear bianchi i really find you most amusing don't scream at me like that do you think i'll be afraid of you do you suppose that i am not aware that the threats of which you are so fond are merely elementary examples of italian humour you're not the sort of person to hurt any one not you i will kill you if you press me too far i swear it then kill me now there was a ripple of laughter a ledge ran round the top of the front of the gallery forming a sort of shelf madeline peering through the obscurity perceived that maud had leaped upon it she could see her tall figure dimly outlined against the fall-like background she began to run swiftly along towards where bianchi stood madeline watching with her heart in her mouth fearing every instant she would fall something of the same feeling seemed to actuate the man stop where you are he cried not i i'm coming to be killed why you coward you are a coward after all kill me if you dare he had hastened towards her exactly what happened in the darkness it was impossible to tell but madeline realized that he reached her and that at the same instant she disappeared falling over the edge with a cry into the hall beneath End of chapter five chapter six of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain some interviews at cross purposes madeline's heart stood still the intense silence seemed to breathe of tragedy whatever hand he might have had in what had happened it was plain that bianchi was seized with an agony of remorse as soon as the thing was done madeline could see that he was leaning over the ledge peering into the sombre depths below he broke into speech mostly interjections maud maud my love my life my all madeline had risen to her feet all at once she came out of her obscurity she had been seized with such a sudden feeling of revulsion towards the excitable italian such an excess of bitterness that without staying to think of what it was she did or proposed she went swiftly towards him bent only on wreaking on him some sort of vengeance he heard her come and starting back from the ledge on which he had been leaning exhibited at the sight of her symptoms of a degree of terror which was nothing short of grotesque for the love of god for the love of god she went close up to him holding out towards him her angry scornful hands as if she would shower forth on him from her finger-tips the torrents of her contempt coward she cried coward and murderer so bereft was he of all sense of what was due to his manhood by the appearance of what he evidently took to be an apparition that he turned tail and ran from her like some hunted thing his footsteps sounding along the gallery until he reached a door at the end through which he rushed crashing it after him with a bang as he went through madeline pursuing her onward way gained the floor 
by means of the staircase up which she had ascended maud she exclaimed maud where are you it was the same question which bianchi had addressed to the darkness a little time before but in her case it received an immediate response in the shape of a peal of gentle laughter which scarcely suggested a person in an extremity of pain here i am my dear don't shout as if you thought i was in another world and wished your voice to reach me there how you frightened that poor dear bianchi he's the most superstitious creature alive and since he took you for a ghost i shouldn't be surprised if he never pauses in his flight till he's run all the way back to his own italy so much the better it will be an excellent riddance but my dear where are you hurt where why nowhere i'm a squirrel or a cat the cat for choice i caught hold of the ledge as i fell with my right hand and then i dropped i'm long you know and it's nothing of a drop but the sooner we're out of this the better the dear bianchi may pause to think if he does he may begin to wonder and from that it will be but a step to his coming back to ascertain how that ghost business of yours was worked in which case it will be just as well if you and i were missing they returned the way they came again without encountering a creature as they went when they were back in the room so soon as she had turned the key in the door maud burst into peal after peal of laughter my dearest madeline what treasure trove you are we've only got to keep it secret that we've a dual personality that there are two of us that i'm you and you are me and think of the long vista of glorious adventure which opens out in front of us this poor bianchi he's seen a ghost let's keep the joke going allow him to remain under the impression that yours truly has been slain visit him occasionally as the spectre of the victim of his murderous rage you be the spectre you'll have him in a madhouse in a month thank you i'd rather be excused my impression that you would find him a dangerous plaything has become considerably strengthened yes he is dangerous that's his charm it's an affair of temperament where when i'm in a provoking mood an englishman would sulk he becomes stark mad i'm not sure which is the better the odd thing is that i am not quite sure that i don't love him i really am not in my way he's not always all fire and fury and as a lover my dear in the matter of making love he's just sublime in that respect no englishman i ever heard of comes within a thousand miles of him at bottom he's as tender-hearted and as gentle as a child brave strong patient in his fashion and where i am not concerned and full of a simple faith in god and his exceeding loving-kindness in the face of which i more than once have felt ashamed and then we are united by the bonds of music what did you think of my voice it's the most wonderful i ever heard i tremble as i think of it it seemed to be of more than mortal beauty i can quite understand your feeling that it is a gift to you from god and that therefore you ought to use it for the good of all his creatures my dear i thank you maud put her hands upon her shoulders and kissed her on the brow and lips with a sort of quaint solemnity i'm only truly in earnest when i'm singing i think it's because that voice of mine half frightens me it's as if it were a link between earth and heaven and as it issues from my lips a veil seems to be drawn aside i feel as if i were standing in the presence of the holy of holies and i dare not trifle then but unfortunately people are apt to suppose that because i sing like an angel i am one and i'm not mine is the artistic temperament i'm everything by turns and nothing long and in whatever i may be at the moment i am thorough you see i have the defects of my qualities hush who's that some one tried the handle of the door and finding it locked tapped at the panel who's there it's i mrs singleton maud turned to madeline quick it's singleton get behind the curtain i'll let her in and play at being you we'll see how she enjoys being treated to a card out of her own pack but stay we are not dressed alike that doesn't matter i'll turn out the lights and you'll see if in the darkness she doesn't take me for you her actions were suited to her words madeline found herself hurried behind a curtain which faced the entrance maud plunging the room into darkness by disconnecting the electric light turned the key in the door in came mrs singleton my child are you all alone in the dark 
maud replied with a glib assurance which made madeline behind the curtain wince i thought i should be safer in the dark because unseen besides i love it and i locked the door so that no one might come in mrs singleton's tone in marked contrast to the girl's was full of anxiety she seemed to notice nothing singular in the other's explanation let me turn the light on for you now no thank you don't i tell you that i love the darkness mrs singleton sighed ah my dear how like miss maud you are even in that how often have i heard her say that she likes the darkness because it's full of mystery she appears to be a curious person this miss maud of yours she is though it goes to my heart to have to say so she's a strange young lady but i've come to say how sorry i am to have had to keep you waiting and even now i cannot stop i must be back with the countess directly i've had to manufacture an excuse to be able to leave her for a moment she talks of nothing but miss maud she set upon her marrying the earl so she ought to yes my dear i know she ought to but unfortunately we don't all of us do what we ought miss maud any more than the rest of us it seems to me that this miss maud of yours is a worthless and ungrateful creature my dear she's not that she's very far from being that or i should not love her as i do she's young and hot-headed and impetuous i perfectly understand we speak like that of people when they're thoroughly bad characters my dear you must not talk like that i cannot allow it i wish you to understand nothing of the kind you seem to have changed since i left you heaven forgive me for saying it but you seem to have become more than ever like miss maud but i have come to ask you a favour to entreat you even if you wish it on my knees to stay at least to-night if in her present mood the countess were to discover that miss maud was missing i don't know what would happen to us all you needn't be alarmed i'll stay to-night and as many more nights as you like indeed i'll stop as long as you choose to keep me i promise you that god bless you for saying so and he will bless you my dear you are doing a service to a child whose one fault is the thoughtlessness of youth and i may tell you that you impressed the countess very favourably this afternoon she never supposed but that you were miss maud and miss maud at her best that is very good of her though i am not sure that she gives me cause for feeling flattered my dear miss maud is the loveliest girl in london and the cleverest and of as high a family as any in the world she may be all that and yet you know one may not find the resemblance flattering i do not understand you you did not talk like this just now you perplex me and indeed mrs singleton did seem troubled but i cannot stay i must get back to the countess i can only thank you and assure you your promise has lifted a heavy load from off my heart the old lady was gone instantly maud was on her feet the door was locked the lights were glowing madeline you little wretch come out of that out came madeline from her hiding-place maud began to dance about her like some madcap child what do you think of that didn't i beat her at her own game didn't i hoist her with her own petard that comes of deceiving others you're sure to be deceived yourself take the lesson to your heart my child madeline's countenance was not by any means so jubilant as her companions you have not made the position easier for me when mrs singleton does see me what will she think of my having spoken to her like that like what didn't you hear what she said that i was more like miss maud than ever take the hint miss maud is impertinent and overbearing you must assume those virtues too your mistake is that you're made of sugar and spice and all that's nice it's an error there's nothing sweet about miss maud miss maud is sour but one thing's sure you'll have to stay and keep on being me maud i can't it's impossible you mustn't ask me you must not every moment i feel more and more ashamed of myself that's nothing i'm always feeling ashamed of myself shame's a shrub of much vitality in fact i should feel ashamed of myself if i weren't ashamed because i know i'm always plucking at the leaves but as for you the thing's arranged didn't you hear how you lifted a weight off dear old singleton's old heart and our blessings were rained down upon your head you've got to stay and marry the earl maud madeline don't stare at me as if you had a poker down your back you know you love him love him when i've seen him once and spoken to him a dozen words 
well perhaps the word's a trifle strong though love's not a plant of such slow growth as you pretend at any rate you like him yes already and with that sort of liking which one finds it difficult to describe deny it if you dare maud do you think it's kind of you to talk to me like this i'm a typist a girl somewhere on the same level as a seamstress i think myself lucky if i make fifteen shillings a week my whole life has been a struggle for bread over and over again i've had to do without the butter i've never had five pounds at one time to call my own i've constantly been without five pence insult and contumely work and weariness hunger and despair that's the atmosphere in which i've lived always month after month year after year fate has drawn me out of it for an instant for a freak a jest but i'm returning to it now to remain in it with hundreds of thousands of other girls better and cleverer than myself until i die and you talk to me of marrying an earl if you consider you will perceive why that sort of talk is apt to make one wince you've been luckier than i miss dorincourt you don't know what you say do you think that having her physical needs supplied is all that a woman wants i've been fed like a hog in a sty and like the hog i've been kept in the sty to wallow it's true never have i been treated as if i were a reasonable being as if i had a wish or aspiration of my own worth a moment's consideration it has been dinned into my ear ever since my frocks first began to come below my knees that i was being fed and clothed washed and tended oiled and curled so that in the fullness of time i might be brought to a fit condition to become conrad's wife mine has been a life's imprisonment and not a day has passed on which i have not striven to escape by beating against the doors and windows the only prospect in front of me is the exchange from a larger jail into a smaller and you think i am to be envied if it came to the sticking point and i really had to choose i would make you stay and i would go out to fill your place outside i might have a chance to become the mistress of my own fate here i'll be chained by the leg for life madeline shook her head you talk as a theorist i repeat that you don't know what you say then give me a chance of gaining the knowledge of which you seem so proud stay and let me go hush there's someone at the door again it's mrs singleton come back who's there a masculine voice replied i'm here if you will turn the key and draw the bars and bolts and open the door you will see who i am there was a rattling of the handle as if by way of conveying a hint that the speaker did not desire to be kept waiting maud turned to madeline with flashing eyes speaking below her breath it's reginald fanshaw madeline whispered back to her it's the man who discovered the imposture you talk to me of staying and here's the man who found out in a moment that i was nothing but a trickster come to tax me with my trickery and to punish me for it as i deserve oh that's what he's come for is it then we'll show this over clever gentleman a thing or two you'll have to get behind that convenient curtain of yours again my dear leave me to deal with mr fanshaw she began to hurry madeline towards the curtain under whose cover she had been previously sheltered madeline expostulating with her as she went miss dorincourt maud do be careful what you say i'll be the most careful creature in this wide wide world i'll undertake my dearest to take the most solicitous care of your interest as well as mine there came another rattling at the handle and banging at the panel open this door quick whispered madeline don't keep him waiting you'll make him angry angry maud laughed just as though i could find it in my heart to anger any one very leisurely strolling to the door she turned the key surveying the impatient gentleman outside with an air of calm impertinence oh so it's you dear me what a hurry you seem to be in she retreated towards the centre of the room her arms and hands kept ostentatiously behind her and her glorious head thrown a little back in her eyes there was the fire of battle the glint of malice placing himself right in front of her he looked her up and down as if he were appraising her her bearing seemed to afford him considerable amusement you carry it off uncommonly well don't i it's a way i have and a good way too does you credit and pray who may you chance to be i don't understand you no that's odd you don't look like a girl who was dull of comprehension 
and pray how have you got here i understand you less than ever that's odder still don't let your lack of comprehension advance too fast and pray where may our dear miss dorincourt have gone my dear reginald what do you mean reginald he laughed your dear reginald do you always address men by their christian names when first you meet them reginald are you mad he laughed again seating himself in an armchair crossing his legs clasping his hands behind his head he looked up at her with a smile which was hardly intended to be flattering what is the solution of your little puzzle has the dear maud gone too far at last with her bianchi has he gone too far with his dear maud or is she off on some new caper of her own i know that she's been missing for the last two days being better posted in such matters than you suppose i was considering whether it was not my bounden duty to advise her grandmother of her curious absence but your appearance on the scene has a little floored me whose idea are you singleton's if so the old woman is cleverer than i believed i am waiting my dear reginald to see if there is some glimmer of reason in your new madness you're smart uncommonly and you're like her remarkably the ordinary observer you deceive at sight in fact you have deceived the others they all suppose you to be the genuine maud conrad in particular you seem to have filled with a sort of holy joy but i'm not quite so easily taken in i spotted you at once your hair is like in colour though i fancy it's been dyed to sample it looks a trifle dark about the roots but your head is not shaped like maud's and you're a trifle shorter and a trifle stouter though i see you squeezed yourself into another of her frocks before and beyond all else you lack her hoity-toity i'm the queen of the castle sort of pose that is inimitable and the more i look at you the more obvious the dissimilarities become still it's a fair likeness that i'll own maud sat down she crossed her legs clasped her hands behind her back looked at him and smiled my dear reginald now that you seem to have paused to take a little breath may i ask what your presence here and this burst of eloquence may mean the bluff won't score it's spotted the game's exposed i'm a player myself you're a player what at she tapped her foot impatiently against the floor will you tell me what do you mean he rose from his chair you know very well what i mean after all your methods are only elementary do you think that i don't know that you're no more maud dorincourt than i am my dear girl do you take me for a fool she also rose reginald fanshawe have you really gone stark staring mad bah give it up you really carry the thing too far in a hundred ways the game's shown up the more i look at you the more i wonder how ever any one could be deceived quite apart from that tell-tale hand my hand what is the matter with my hand she held out her hands in front of her first one and then the other with an air of the most innocent surprise there's nothing the matter with it as a hand but unfortunately there's something missing from it as the hand of the lady you're supposed to be a certain ring from the third finger of the left a ring you mean my mother's ring reginald you must be mad she held the hand in question out in front of her as if astonished beyond measure he stared at her why what the devil there's some trickery it wasn't there just now it wasn't there just now my mother's ring it's never left my finger since it was first put on you couldn't get it off unless you took my finger with it is that the explanation of your extraordinary behaviour in the music-room i wondered what it meant whatever made you think it wasn't on my finger because it wasn't it was not on the finger of the girl who was in the music-room that i'll swear there's some infernal jugglery you may be maud dorincourt now that i look at you closely i believe you are do you really but the girl in the music-room was someone who was impersonating you impersonating me she assumed an air of ineffable scorn and do you dare to pretend that there is any creature living who could successfully impersonate me you must be mad i'll tell this to grandmamma and conrad and the rest of them they'll be amused to hear that your latest vagary is to suspect me of pretending to be myself who's that this was in response to another tapping at the door it's i conrad if you are disengaged there is something which i should like to say to you she turned to reginald did you lock the door i did 
i didn't wish our interview to be untowardly interrupted how dare you as she moved away from her he caught her by the wrist don't you make any mistake that there is some manoeuvre afloat i am persuaded i smell it in the air but whether or no there are certain passages in your life with which i have a closer acquaintance than you imagine you shan't marry conrad and so i warn you no no a thousand times no and a thousand times again and what will you do to prevent me do why i'd sooner marry you myself he broke into sudden heat don't pretend to misunderstand me maud you know i love you a hundredfold better than ever conrad can you know there is nothing a man can do i wouldn't do for you you know hang you you cat the quick change in the tenor of his observations was due to maud's having slipped from his grasp and by her manipulation of the electric button having plunged the room into utter darkness in an instant she had rushed to madeline behind the curtain they could hear him groping about laughing to himself unmirthfully as in the enjoyment of a disagreeable joke madeline i'm not going to risk a tete-a-tete -tete with milord of staines that's not in my line you'll have to do the talking to him you'll do it better than i shall maud i can't but my dear you must and will and shall so out you come i'm going to do the hiding now maud but there was none that answered her imploring her piteous her frightened whisper maud had vanished whither in the darkness she could not tell reginald who at last had reached the door threw it open madeline from where she stood could see the earl in the corridor without the brothers eyed each other without much show of geniality reginald's tone though soft enough was distinctly intended to be unpleasant hello conrad is that you i do hope we haven't kept you waiting nor was the other's voice in reply unduly suggestive of brotherly love what have you been doing in there with maud that it was necessary that the door should be locked what the deuce has that to do with you how fond you are of prying you'd better ask maud perhaps she'll tell you with a laugh which was meant to irritate he strolled away the earl came into the room as he did so the electric light was reconnected once more the room was all aglow taking it for granted that this was owing to maud madeline looked round in search of her but she was nowhere to be seen if madeline could trust the evidence of her senses the earl and she were alone in the room together madeline who was standing just where maud had hurried her willy-nilly out of her hiding-place still retained in her hand a fold of the curtain it seemed to her that her heart was beating unnaturally fast there was a booming noise in her head the room swam before her eyes her limbs quivered the sudden rush of events had overtaxed her strength maud's action in thrusting her forward at such a moment in such a manner without consulting her without the slightest warning seemed to have startled the life right out of her her mysterious disappearance had been the final straw the earl mistook the cause of her obvious distress maud he exclaimed what has he been saying to you what has he done madeline all trembling clutching the curtain with convulsive fingers staggered back against the wall he dashed eagerly forward knocking over in his haste a small table which stood unnoticed in the way as this table fell something rolled off it on to the ground something which looked like a small celluloid ball as this ball touched the floor there was a flash of light a thick smoke and the sound of a loud explosion one of those messengers of death which are not among the least curious of the products of modern science had been introduced into the room all unwittingly the man whose one desire had been to convey peace and comfort to the frightened girl had given it an opportunity to deliver its message End of chapter six chapter seven of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain a strange wooing madeline woke as from a dream her senses seemed to have taken to themselves wings she knew not where she was it was as if there was a weight upon her eyes so that she could not open them what was that which touched her lips again and again so warmly yet so softly with an effort which appeared to her 
to be of strange magnitude she induced her eyelids to unclose for a moment and then they shut again but in that second she saw as in a glass darkly a face looking down into hers the face of a man whose face was it whose could it be she wondered in the curious confusion of her intellect and what was it doing so close to hers and why did its near neighbourhood convey to her so odd a sense of satisfaction and of ease once more the something soft yet warm came in contact with her lips again and again a quiver went all over her a flash of illumination the man whose face was looking down at hers was kissing her in the sudden shock of her surprise her eyes flashed themselves wide open in an instant she was caught up in a strenuous grasp kisses were rained upon her lips and cheeks and eyes and brow and hair a voice exclaimed half choked by its own eagerness my love my dear my darling thank god i thought that you were dead god forgive me sweet for thinking so to see your eyes again oh to see them dear never before had she been conscious of so peculiar a sensation of such mastering exhilaration of such a sudden simultaneous flow of hot and eager blood through all her veins her eyes closed flooded by tears which had in them no bitterness her cheeks burned her lips parted her breath came quicker her frame thrilled with a new a vivid a penetrating rapture then followed the reaction on a sudden she remembered all that had happened with flaming clearness how maud had vanished how the earl had come into the room how she had shrunk away from him how he had rushed forward and how the explosion had followed then she knew that she was lying on the floor and that the earl of staines held her in his arms that it was he who had kissed her who had addressed her with such impassioned words oh oh she cried what have i done she tried to rise but he would not let her continuing to hold her fast done my darling you've done nothing tell me are you badly hurt hurt i'm not hurt why should i be hurt the memory of the explosion came back to her to fill her with a new and instant fear and you are you hurt my darling no i'm not hurt i'm a little scorched i think but nothing more scorched in a moment she was out of his arms in spite of him kneeling on the floor at his side she gazed eagerly at him why you're all burnt your poor poor face in her voice there seemed to be a throb of pain sweetheart why it's nothing and if it were i'd be burnt again and again and again to have you speak to me like that better than any oil or ointment is the music of your words he stretched out his arms and put them round her and drew her to him she offering no resistance she could have offered none even had she wished and she did not wish it was as though she was under a spell she suffered him to pillow her head upon his breast to press his lips against her brow your poor poor face was all she said and he replied after all these years and they were still she was more than half afraid it seemed to her that in the whole business there was something supernatural in her excited condition it was to her almost as if they had been drawn together by the hand of god they had been so near to death together that their late propinquity in the valley of the shadow seemed to apply also now that once more they were standing at the gates of life and although he was but the chance acquaintance of as it were a miraculous moment in some strange fashion it seemed to her that she had known him all her life as though his spirit if not his body had kept step with her steps from the beginning unto now so that she who as a rule with strangers more especially when they were masculine was reserve itself was content to continue in the strange man's arms as if the position was a matter of course and from all time hers a right it was indeed as if she had come into her own at last it was he who broke the silence experimenting again with things that go off i what do you mean haven't you been exploring in the caves where nature keeps her secrets isn't it to that we owe this illustration 
she raised herself out of his arms do you think i have had anything to do with what has happened he eyed her as if puzzled then he knitted his brow is it possible do you suspect can reginald have had a finger in the thing she shrank away i do not know maud my darling if he has i'll call him to account for it though he were twenty times my brother he has not hurt us very much that is true perhaps he only meant to frighten us i wonder what was in the thing his jokes are apt to have rather a peculiar flavour perhaps this was meant for one of them hurt us so far as i'm concerned he's done me the best service in his power he's brought you close to me at last my darling do you know that in some strange way you seem to have all at once become more beautiful as if you had become etherealized passed through the cleansing fires and left behind in them the grosser vapours you have become sweeter gentler tenderer a new maud it's the latest and the loveliest edition i'm holding to my heart again he took her in his arms and drew her to him and again she suffered him silently all quivering as he kissed her all her pulses seemed to bound he whispered in her ear tell me that you're happy she answered him in a voice that was tremulous and dry as if it proceeded with difficulty from her throat yes i am happy as he showered on her his rapturous embraces she shut her eyes shivering with an ecstasy which was akin to pain this seems to be a case in which two are company and three are none some one said this while still he was in the very middle of his wooing in a moment the proceeding ceased he was on his knees and madeline loosed was scrambling to her feet the countess of Steyne stood in the open doorway her either hand resting on a silver-handled stick with her withered frame bent double clad in a vivid blue silk dress of some unknown style and shape which was much too large for her she looked like one of the old-time witches brought to life again her enormous head which was over big for what was left of her body hung forward as if in her shrivelled neck there was not strength enough to hold it up her face which was a maze of deep ploughed wrinkles spoke of age which was very far beyond the psalmist's allotted span it was only when one perceived the eyes which glowered from beneath the penthouse of the overhanging brows that one began to understand how it was that so striking an example of decrepitude came to have life in her at all it was the eyes which gave away the secret which told of unbending resolution indomitable will which proclaimed the determination to cling on to existence until even in the owner's judgment it was no longer worth the having the two gleaming orbs revealed the mystery of the woman's strength they suggested the vitality of twenty linked to a knowledge of the world's wickedness through all the generations that have been when one encountered them they conveyed the impression that this ancient female had lived and did live and would live with one end constantly in view to have her own way in large things as in small and woe betide whoever should venture to say her nay grandmother exclaimed the earl following madeline's example by springing to his feet and alone have you come here from your room all alone the old lady looked at him as some old bird might regard an impertinent youngster her voice had in it a rustic quality it creaked as if her throat required oiling why not once i could walk as well as you and better i can walk now when i choose and i have chosen who's forbidding me i'd a fancy to come and see maud thinking to take her unawares but it seems that you have been in front of me i'd no notion you would be her visitor the earl advancing offered his arm to lead her into the room she would have none of him wagging her ancient head she hobbled forward by the aid of her two sticks he hastened to place a chair for her in a convenient position before however she would seat herself she looked about her round the room this is a mad room of yours my girl fitter for dying in than living madeline was silent not having the faintest notion what to say feeling hardly qualified to criticise the absent owner's notions of upholstery the old lady fixed on her her glowing eyes don't you hear what i am saying why don't you speak when you are spoken to i am sorry you don't like it murmured madeline the countess seemed to be as little pleased with her speech as with her silence you are uncommonly mild upon a sudden why don't you tell me that i don't know what i am talking about and proceed to teach your grandmother as is your general way the earl noting the girl's confusion endeavoured to divert the countess's attention come grandmother here's a chair for you hadn't you better sit the old lady turned on him 
i'll sit down when i choose and not before my man do you think that i've no legs of my own to stand on you're a fool if you do but in spite of her words she accepted the sea he proffered leaning right forward the better to glare at madeline there's a change come in you somewhere girl i'm trying to make out just what it is i saw it in the music-room but i can see it plainer now what's troubled you nothing nothing she mimicked the girl's stammering intonation what's come to you your voice and to your insolence you look and sound as if you'd changed your nature between the evening and the morning what's happened to her stains something has happened which will give you pleasure almost as much pleasure as it has given me she has engaged herself to be my wife the blood rushed to the girl's face she trembled with so much violence that she could hardly stand the old lady regarded her intently so has she indeed say that again going to madeline the earl slipped his arm through hers she has yielded to my prayers at last and made of me the happiest man alive and where's her happiness we share our happiness don't we maud the girl was dumb is that so then by the look of it you've got her share as well as yours his voice sinking was intended to reach her ears alone that's not so maud is it don't be afraid my darling say it isn't so but the girl trembling on his arm was still the old lady resented his endeavour to appeal to the girl's private feelings speak up man let's hear what you say don't prompt her to tell lies has the girl gone dumb are you ill no i'm not ill what ails you then are you afraid no i'm not afraid you look as if you were which is something new in you you being as a rule a bundle of forward insolence is it true what stains says have you promised to be his wife no i don't think i've promised she doesn't think in heaven's name girl aren't you sure wasn't he kissing you when i came in yes i think he was she thinks again what's happened to the girl can she do nothing else but think the earl interposed i should have told you grandmother that an accident which occurred just before you came has tried maud's nerves what was the accident something exploded as you see it has scorched my face and startled maud the old lady kept her gleaming eyes fixed persistently on madeline's countenance surveying her for a moment or two in silence when she spoke there was a grimness in her grating tones come close girl and let me look at you if this mysterious accident of which staines talks has not completely shattered your nervous system which i had not supposed an easy thing to do i take it you can answer a straight question straightly madeline did as she was bid bracing herself as best she could to enable herself to bear the further strain which she saw was coming i would rather you did not question me just now you would rather but i choose i've been talking to singleton inquiring since i've seen so little of you of late what it is you say to her and with what sort of occupations you employ your time precious little information i've gained if she's to be believed she knows as little as i my patience of which i'd never overmuch is wearing thin the days are fading i fade too for me the end of days is near at hand it's time that staines was married and i'm resolved he shall be before i go who marries him takes all i have and my blessing on the top of it is it you he is to marry or shall it be another madeline pressed her fingertips into the palms of her hands striving to hold herself as with a tight rein i've told you that i would rather you did not question me just now who cares what you would rather and how long have you been singing me that song i'll play with you no more at waiting it's a game at which you're like to win come girl don't pretend to be a lackadaisical fool i'll swear that you're not that didn't i see him kissing you just now yes and was he not doing it with your good will e yes and would you let any man kiss you who'd a mind to do it no the no came clearly why then the thing is settled if you like him well enough to let him use you as he was using you just now why won't you say straight out that you will marry him i dare not you dare not what afraid of stains then you're the first that ever was he'll make you as good a husband as woman ever had why should you be afraid to marry him in reply madeline put up her hands to hide her cheeks the old lady turned to her grandson in stupefied amazement stains what's the matter with the girl for maud dorincourt to try to veil her blushes is something new she the most brazen hussy that ever yet i met the earl himself seemed puzzled he looked at the hard-driven madeline as if he could not make her out within his glance a wealth of love and longing which became him very well then going closer to her he began to address her in a voice which the strength of his emotion made dangerously persuasive to the girl's bewildered ears 
struggle against the feeling as she might his words coming from his heart brought peace to hers and inclined her irresistibly towards him why dare you not what is it that makes you tremble at the thought that i should call you wife is it because you fear that my love for you is not enough that cannot be you know that there is but one woman in the world for me and were you without a penny or the hope of ever having one you are the only woman i would marry no matter what others say if you will not have me i'll die a bachelor of that you may be sure i cannot doubt but that you know i am of the constant kind or is it you're afraid your love for me's too little i cannot think that either after what chance just now my arms still glow where they held you trembling my heart still throbs because it felt yours bounding my lips still burn because you set them in a flame it's not in nature for a woman to be unto a man as a minute back you were to me unless she loves him are you frightened because your own heart tells you this as plainly as mine tells me why then let me give you a continual courage in the same fashion in which i endowed you with it for a time with my arms about you dear regardless of the old woman's great gleaming eyes he went closer still and closer till his arms stole round her waist and again she suffered him my dear my sweet my love pillow your head against my breast and pray god with me that he may bless us and keep us side by side together until life closes and she obeyed she laid her glorious head against his breast having to stoop to do it and sobbed dry-eyed he smoothed the radiant splendour of her hair consoling her as if she was some frightened child sh sh don't tremble so sweetheart you're in safe keeping he who holds you fast loves you better than his life the countess her long pointed chin poised pendulous between the yellow claw-like hands which still clutched at the silver-handled sticks sat still and watched them breaking the silence with a creaking sound which perhaps was meant for laughter come this is better now girl let's have no more shilly-shallying billing and cooing is more in your way that's plain why you've not been at it long ago is beyond my comprehension now you've got so far we'll lose no time in getting you a trifle further the betrothal we will have to-morrow and we'll have as many there to witness it as can be gathered in the time they'll need no pressing i'll be bound all things shall be done in due and proper form as befits your rank and dignity and mine this shall be no match made behind a hedge and ratified in the first dry ditch it shall be the marriage of the season ay of many seasons the greatest noble in the land you're that stains i protest it is to be married to the richest and loveliest maid the world can find that you're the loveliest maid girl you need no telling you've vanity enough for ten as for riches i'm richer even than you think i've that to give you which shall make those yankee women feel they're poor on your wedding day it shall all be yours all all and the fame of the marriage shall go out to the four quarters of the globe princes shall be there and princesses shall look on you with envy i'll spend a fortune on the wedding i put it aside and planned it ah never mind how many years the tale of it shall be in people's mouths to tell to their children's children i'd have done it for your mother girl had she had more sense but i'll do it for you instead since you have shown yourself to be the wiser it has a spoil for the keeping so singleton they've made a match of it at last these turtle doves of ours yes singleton now they are turtle doves look at them and see don't they bear it on their faces why you old fool what is it you're staring at like that isn't it time the match was made while the old lady had been haranguing in a wild inflated fashion which seemed singularly out of keeping with her appearance another listener had appeared upon the scene while the attention of the others had been absorbed in the ancient dowager's declamation mrs singleton had entered unobserved in the very midst of it to find madeline still enfolded in the earl's embrace and the countess crowing stridently over the realization of her long cherished dreams mrs singleton started back amazed bewildered wondering confusedly to what new tragedy the scene might be the prelude it was while she still gaped open-eyed and open-mouthed that the countess turned and saw her to the dowager's first not over civil inquiry mrs singleton was dumb the countess quickly losing patience striking her sticks against the floor with as much violence as she was capable of assailed her with a shower of vituperation ass idiot fool don't you hear what i'm saying don't you hear what i'm saying don't stand there like a stuck pig staring i tell you that they've made a match of it at last madeline aroused to the fact of mrs singleton's appearance started guiltily from the earl's alluring arms her blood turned from hot to cold her cheeks went white her first impulse was to throw herself 
at the countess's feet and confessed the imposition which had been practised but she was stayed by mrs singleton's stammering reply yes your ladyship i hear you the dowager raged hotly back at her you hear me is that all you have to say did you not advise me not an hour ago not to put pressure on the girl for it would do no good it's done this much good that it's done the business they're to be wed and the betrothal's for to-morrow to-morrow the betrothal so soon the countess half raising herself from her seat shook her saffron-coloured hands in the air in a burst of unbecoming passion so soon so soon what do you call so soon why you smooth-faced cat you've been against me in the business all along i've suspected it i've smelt it now it's plain there's always been the twang of the liar at the tip of your slippery tongue but i'll tell you my cunning singleton that if the girl has not been publicly betrothed by to-morrow about this time if any hitch comes in i don't care what i'll have no more of your shilly shallying or hers out into the street you go and she goes after you and my curse with her what she stands up in that she shall have for her own and nothing more i'll never look upon your face again or hers she shall die in a ditch as her mother did and be buried in a pauper's grave mrs singleton visibly trembled but i assure you ladyship that you mistake me mistake you yes i've mistaken you before for a decent and an honest creature but you've never deceived me quite singleton i believe that not a little of the evil that has come upon my house has come through you you incited the mother to rebel and now if you could you'd incite the daughter too but a change has come over the girl little thanks i'll be sworn to you she's a new creature she's shown more sense to-day than in the whole of her life before be you careful not to undo what has been done or they'll be rude to wear it's a mistake to keep old servants who've a taste for sharpening their pet claws upon your skin mrs singleton stood in front of the furious harridan abashed confounded in evident perplexity what to do or say madeline with white drawn face and distended frightened eyes was plainly more bewildered even than the over-zealous woman who was the primary cause of the dilemma in which she found herself the earl put out his hand to her with a gesture of half humorous half affectionate entreaty but madeline paid no heed for the moment at any rate the countess was mistress of the situation while the spirit of indecision was still in the air and no one seemed to have anything with which to answer the voluble dowager lady hildegard fanshawe came bustling in the high-pitched tones of her metallic voice were in disagreeable consonance with the old lady's angry croaking mother you here i've been looking for you everywhere and conrad why what's happening the countess turned to her this is happening the girl and stains have come to a point at last they are to be man and wife the betrothal's for to-morrow mother the lady hildegard started as if not altogether agreeably surprised the girl's all changed she's become as soft as butter and sugar-sweet stains has not only won her hand he's won her heart as well with as i have seen with my own eyes the freehold of her lips it seems after all that the match was made in heaven all the bells will ring in tune there's going to be a wedding which will set all the gossips clacking wherever there's a tongue to wag hilda give me your arm and conrad give me yours there are matters of which i wish to speak to you singleton we leave the lady in your kind keeping be careful to bear well in mind wherein the truest kindness lies the countess passed out of the room with the lady hildegard holding her up on one side and the earl upon the other they could hear her tongue still going vigorously as she hobbled along the corridor madeline and mrs singleton were alone together End of chapter seven chapter eight of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain the way to the door well you see it has come to this the elder woman did not at once reply she stood listening to the trio receding along the corridor her face averted the sound of the countess's croaking became fainter and fainter when she deemed it prudent and that neither of the three was likely to return she closed the door then she turned to madeline who repeated what she had previously said you see it has come to this the girl's face was set and stern 
she stood upright her head a little back her hands close to her sides in the attitude of one who stands at bay there was an expression in her eyes which the other had not seen in them before a something almost threatening on mrs singleton's countenance on the contrary there was a look of terror desperation almost of despair the cheeks seemed to have fallen in the wrinkles were accentuated she was older haggarder her voice was slightly husky but i don't understand how did it happen because you brought me here to act the lie so it happened but my dear she put her hand up to her brow wearily it's beyond all thinking how came you to commit yourself in such a fashion with the earl i wonder i could kill myself and you when i think of it i'd rather have died a thousand deaths than you had brought me to this shame it is as though you had set yourself to wreck me body and soul she spoke with a quietness which lent her words more weight than clamour could have done they seemed to cut her listener to the heart mrs singleton began to wring her hands my dear my dear you must not talk like that i did it for the best the best for you for me or for whom did you stop to think of the ordeal to which you were subjecting me or did you think it didn't matter in dragging me from the streets into a palace to be wooed by such a man my dear i never dreamt he'd woo you it passes my comprehension how it all has come about it's so unlike the earl he and miss maud are always at arm's length you forget that i am not miss maud mrs singleton sighed on my word i am almost beginning to wish you were it had helped clear away a maze of troubles the earl seems to get on with you so much better than with her is that meant for a reproach my dear how quick you are nothing was further from my mind but come it's no use for you and i to talk to each other in this way what's done's done you'll find that a way will be shown us and whatever comes you'll have no cause to regret the part you've played of that i'm sure i only hope and pray that when miss maud does return she'll make herself as agreeable to them all as you have done as i have done the girl's tone rang with bitter self-contempt you have done more to win their hearts in a few hours than miss maud in all her life you talk nonsense well my dear if you choose to think so why then you must i am expecting to have news from singleton every minute god grant it may be good news i tremble to think of what that wrong-headed child in her folly may have done it's so cruel and yet so like her to have gone away god alone knows where without a word of any sort to me when the old lady had gone in search of the food of which the girl was standing very heartily in need madeline began an instant examination of the walls her first thought was to discover maud or to communicate with her somehow in her hiding-place exactly where or how she had vanished she had not a notion she tried to think she herself had been beside the curtain she placed herself in her former position then the lights went out and when they reappeared maud had gone she felt sure that she had disappeared on the same side of the room on which she had herself been standing on the left it was on that side right up at the other end maud had first appeared she examined it closely not a hint could she discover of any hidden entrance the wall behind the gorgeous hangings was of wood carved in wondrous arabesques it seemed to send to screen it amid such a profusion of bewildering design in a hundred places a spring might be concealed it might take years to find it 
and then an indefinite period to discover how to put it into motion even supposing that the way to the secret chamber was through the wall which she had no reason to suppose madeline recognized that she might as well look for the needle in the haystack as seek to find it out and yet how she longed to speak to her to pour out her heart to her to tell her of the plight in which she stood to appeal to her to help her out of the morass in which her feet were sinking she felt that if she could only reach that beautiful and brilliant creature whom god in his inscrutable wisdom had made so marvellously in her own image her glorified self that all would yet be well and the complications and difficulties which encompassed her weighing her down would vanish as by the touch of a magician's wand if she could only manage to let her hear her voice how did she know how close she was she might be quite possibly she was within a hand's breadth a well-directed whisper might reach her ears she started to try placing her lips against the wall beginning with the very faintest whisper maud 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 it is i madeline maud speak to me if maud heard she gave no sign the girl moving further along the wall tried again she shifted from place to place and tried at each then when her whispers remained unnoticed she raised her voice higher and higher maud maud speak to me maud she cried in vain there was none that answered the wall sounded solid wherever she struck it with her fist seeming to throw her voice straight back at her but she did not relinquish her efforts until mrs singleton reappeared bearing food with her own hands the girl ate heartily urged thereto by unromantic hunger it was the first good meal she had had she did not know since when for days she had been without the means with which to buy herself a plate of meat the good food in the wine which mrs singleton pressed upon her had on her unaccustomed frame a somnolent effect very soon she herself knew scarcely how it came about she was lying like some tired child between the sheets of maud dorincourt's bed this in a material sense was the strangest experience of all her bedroom was a tiny garret her bed a mattress laid upon the floor her bedclothes just whatever she could find to cover her and now she lay on what seemed to her a bed of down poised in the air so that it yielded caressingly to every movement of her dainty limbs between sheets of gossamer fineness which it was a luxury to feel against her silken skin she realized these things with a sigh of perfect satisfaction yet with a half-conscious curious conviction that this was only as it ought to be that they were hers by right as if this was the inheritance to which she had been born and from which she had been kept out unto this hour but though her couch was soft she could not sleep indeed as soon as she was snug and comfortable sleep went farther and farther from her in the darkness the events of the day with their amazing kaleidoscopic transmutations passed before her eyes like ghosts that haunted her and before and beyond and above all else she saw one face a man's not handsome square and serious dark-skinned with a sad mouth and yet with something strong and tender about it too dark eyes which looked into hers with a meaning which she longed to yet dared not understand it was the face of conrad earl of staines as she thought of the passages she had had with him she went all hot and cold and alone there in the darkness though she was she put up her hands to hide her face what was the matter with her had she gone stark mad in the course of a single day had the man cast on her a spell that she should quiver as she was quivering now merely at the thought of him and he as far above her and as much beyond her reach as the stars in the sky she must have lost her senses she told herself or she would not recall with such rapturous delight the pressure of his lips to hers she would not thrill with ecstasy at the recollection of how he had held her in his arms he had told her that he loved her 
had addressed her in terms of tenderness burning tears of rapture welled up into her happy eyes but at the thought of it she burst into a flame of passion he had done these things to her because he mistook her for another yes the thing was true the shame of it he had embraced and fondled her under a complete misapprehension what a hideous what a contemptible what a degraded creature she had been to have allowed him to shower his caresses upon one woman supposing her to be another she did not see the humour of the thing at all she was in no mood to perceive the ridiculous even though it struck her in the face the only thing she saw was the shame of it the shame when he came to hear the truth what would he not think of her the horror of the thought the endearments which he had lavished upon her had been intended for maud dorncourt she sat up in bed stretched out her arms in front of her clenched her fists pressed her teeth together and hated the girl for whom she had been mistaken she herself was she not as good fresh from the work-room trained in necessity's hard school inured to poverty accustomed to eat what she herself had earned and paid for always on the border line which divides the continually starving from the often hungry what was she the worse had she ever done aught of which she had righteous cause to be ashamed had she ever dabbled even the tips of her fingers in the waters of ignominy in which so many women in her position were wont to plunge never she was as true as sweet as pure as any woman of them all who had been cradled in satin and clad in shining raiment as beautiful eye and as queenly had they themselves not said unwittingly that she was an improvement on the absent maud more feminine fitter to sit in the seats of the highest and he had he not dilated on the change of for the better which had taken place in her avowed that his love had been new-born with her she shook as with the palsy again she covered her face with her hands what use this rhodomontade this quibbling with facts this confusing of clear issues the plain truth was she was an impostor she got out of bed a confused whirl of unreasoning febrile frenzied jealousy self-loathing shame falling on her knees pillowing her face on the silken coverlet she broke into a torrent of prayer to god telling him all the tale bringing it all to him revelling in that fullness of confession in which so many overburdened women have found the way to peace she threw herself upon his mercy besought his guidance entreating him to point out certainly surely the path she ought to tread in that moment of cerebral exultation it seemed to her that her prayer was heard and answered presently she stood up calmer if not more contented her resolution was arrived at she turned on the electric light glanced round the room went to a mirror looking at herself in the great sheet of silver glass blushing with half-shamed consciousness that she made a picture well worth looking at she had noted where mrs singleton had placed her clothes and found them neatly arranged in a corner of a huge wardrobe in which there was a bewildering array of lovely garments she cast on these a lingering glance probably there was not one there which had not cost more than she could earn in a year and there were dozens her own clothes were poor they looked poorer still in comparison her stockings originally common enough had been darned and darned again the cheap shapeless boots had been patched already they needed further cobbling and her linen as she thought of the radiant products of the finest looms which had clothed her limbs that day she bit her lips and seemed to shrivel up and to become a smaller and a smaller thing as she put herself into the coarse discoloured time-worn trumpery which was all that she could call her own attired in her shabby old black frock her faded jacket her hardly used hat and her apologies for gloves she recognized with sudden overwhelming force how out of place she was in that great room what an intruder in that habitation of the rich suppose he could see her now costumed as she was wont to be god help her if he did she told herself with perhaps not unnatural exaggeration that he would take her for some scouring of the streets she closed her eyes and shuddered she had all that was her own and all that was not her own she had left behind her adventure was at an end her day as caliph finished it would be as something to look back upon a reminiscence never to be forgotten so that she might be no worse off for it after all 
be philosophical my dear she told herself unconsciously parodying the frenchman the monotony of your days has been not unpleasantly disturbed when you're back in your own life to-morrow you'll know that you have cause for gratitude such adventures as these come seldom even to the adventurous and it's little enough of the adventurous spirit that's in you she switched off the light and groping her way to the door peered out into the corridor beyond how dark it is i've no notion whereabouts in the house i am or in which direction there's a door which leads into the street providence must guide me i'll try this side for luck she turned to the right keeping her hand against the wall as she went so that she might at least be prepared to some extent for sudden turns she had gone round it seemed to her two quarters and had reached a third when a, a clock clanged through the night it chimed the four quarters and then struck one one o'clock only i thought it was later perhaps everybody hasn't gone to bed yet i believe that in these sort of houses people stop up half the night the thought stayed her the risk of encountering some white awake inmate of the mansion was one she had not bargained for and yet she perceived that at the hour the thing was even probable what should she do go back and wait till the night was older she turned intending to retrace her steps and instantly realized that this was impossible she was no more able to find the room she had left than the street door she was in search of the darkness which surrounded her was like a wall on every side already she was beginning to be in doubt whether the apartment she had quitted was behind or in front this is a pleasant situation egyptian darkness everywhere and not the faintest notion where i am she groped her way onward she knew not whither pulling up just in time to prevent herself going head foremost down a flight of steps she felt her way carefully down them to find there were but four that's one thing certain i never went up those steps so i must be going out a different way to the one i came she reached a point at which as she could feel by stretching out her hands the corridor branched out to the right and left on a sudden a light gleamed on her right she could hear the sound of muffled footsteps in an instant she was flying along the passage to her left the light was coming after her she could hear the footsteps advancing from the back was she being followed she did not pause to think she was passing a door without staying to consider what might be inside turning the handle she rushed within closing the door behind her she stood listening with beating heart suddenly becoming conscious that she had passed from scylla to charybdis she was in the music-room a lamp was lit in the organ gallery faint notes were stealing from the instrument the musician was holding nocturnal communion with his art so softly were his fingers straying over the keys that her entry even at the further end of the apartment had diverted his attention his quick ear had caught the opening and shutting of the door ceasing to play rising from the keyboard he advanced towards the edge of the gallery madeline could see his figure clearly outlined against the lamp at his back he listened for a moment in silence who's there he asked as the silence remained unbroken the accent was a foreigner's who is that down there who opened the door he leant over the gallery as if endeavouring to pierce with his eyes the mist of the blackness madeline drew herself up close against the door straining her faculties to detect the passing of the belated wanderer who bore a light bianchi finding his inquiry unheeded became impatient who is it there i heard you come in you have not gone out again is it a game you play with me there was none that replied you will not answer me good i will come down and see who you are he passed from before the light madeline could see him moving towards where she knew the staircase was he began to descend towards her at that moment she faintly caught the sound of footsteps passing the door without the midnight wanderer was going by behind she could hear bianchi making the best of his way towards her through the darkness grumbling as he came she waited as long as she dared until at least she hoped the cause of her alarm had passed out of sight and hearing then she opened the door as quietly as she could but the musician was quicker than she thought and nearer her action was instantly detected ah you are still there he came rushing towards her with a cry she was through the door only just in time to shut it in his face with something of a bang she flew along the passage on the right in the contrary direction to that taken by the bladed straggler hardly had she taken half a dozen steps before bianchi was after her the chase was a short one all madeline's faculties were centred in the desire to escape she did not stop to think of the obstacles which must be avoided 
of the care which was requisite to guide her steps through the unknown darkness she just rushed on and had not gone far before she came signally to grief dashing against one step and falling up the others possibly it was the same short flight which she had recently descended the shock was considerable she was not a little shaken before she could regain her equilibrium bianchi was up on her ah you have stopped good now we shall see who you are you wear a skirt so you are a woman i thought it was a woman by the way you ran a light will show us perhaps a little more taking a box from his pocket he struck a vesta madeline too shaken panting confused to make a further attempt to escape him she turned her head away moved by a sudden impulse stretching out her arm she struck the match from his fingers it went out as it reached the floor he clutched her by the sleeve of her jacket what did you do that for you think i have no more you are mistaken this box of mine is full do not do that again or you will be sorry he struck another giving a startled exclamation as it broke into flame maud it is you is it possible my god in his excitement the second match went out he did not attempt immediately to light another but burst instead into a torrent of ejaculations maud my loved one what is it you would do what is it has come to you why do you treat me in such a way is it that you would drive me to despair compel me to do that which i should eternally regret these two days i have seen and heard nothing of you not a word not a sign you give me no warning that you would not come as you have been used to come not a syllable i eat out my heart in vain this afternoon you scorn my poor little flower you treat me with contempt and then you jump over the gallery as if i had pushed you and frightened me out of my life maud speak to me what have i done that i should deserve from you such treatment you know that the words of your lips are the light of my days do not deny them to me my beloved he put his hands about her arm as if he would draw her towards him a disposition which she resented do not touch me take your hands away maud how can you be so hard so cold so cruel if you could see what this moment is in my heart for you do you hear me remove your hand if you don't i shall make you you will make me for response giving herself a sudden twist she placed her hand against whatever part of him she could reach and pushed him from her he remained for a second silent apparently surprised at the treatment which he had received when he spoke his tone had passed from impassioned entreaty to acrid bitterness so it is to be that way very good it is as well that i should understand it is what i wish to understand perhaps another match may give us light upon the matter he struck another again holding it in the air she could see that his face was distorted by passion that his great black eyes suggested storm he commented on what he supposed to be the singularity of her appearance what is it that this means whose clothes have you got on is it a masquerade to which you go or is it another little romance which you have on hand why at this time of night do you wear a hat and coat and is it from a servant you have borrowed them his words stung more even than he had intended and in an unsuspected sense already more than sufficiently conscious of the figure which she cut she resented his outspoken comments with unwonted heat she stood up straight her head went back her eyes flashed fire how dare you speak to me like that how dare you speak to me at all he laughed mockingly how dare i that is good such a question and from you i've dared to do more than that before much more and at your invitation and i will dare to do much more again oh yes i beg you will not doubt it he lighted another match at the one which was expiring coming closer to her so that he might regard her to more advantage his tone and manner were intentionally insolent do you know my beautiful that in that costume for a masquerade you look as if you were a woman out of the street is that the meaning eh for the second time madeline struck the match out of his hand he rushed at her with execrations she eluded him by springing up the stairs which were at her back he eagerly after her at the top she paused and turned throwing out her arms in front of her she caught him full in the face and exerting all her strength hurled him backwards towards the foot down he went with a crash to the bottom without stopping to make inquiries into any injuries which he might quite possibly have received whirling round on her heels she flew for her life it was an insensate flight she went crashing into a wall which was at the end of the passage and spinning confusedly round the corner cannoned against some one whose approach had gone unnoticed had it not been for this some one's presence of mind she would have gone headlong to the ground as it was the newcomer just managed to keep her 
on her feet dear life exclaimed a laughing voice who flies like an arrow from a bow against a wall can it be it can't be yet it must be madeline is this you yes groaned madeline what's left of me she had blundered into maud dorincourt's arms End of chapter eight chapter nine of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain a refuge from the world maud continued to hold madeline close to her as if she were still fearful she would fall and pray young lady what are you doing voyaging about the house at this hour of the night do you know i've been looking for you for this i don't know how long hush there's mr bianchi along the passage i pushed him down the stairs child he's been running after me he thought i was you and i pushed him down the stairs i didn't stop to see if he was hurt it's so dark and i was afraid he may come and find us here and i'd rather he didn't oh ma tell me where the door is the door into the street i mean help me to get out of this dreadful house with pleasure nothing will give me greater satisfaction i'll personally conduct you this very moment maud do you mean it as if i did not mean it you'd better haste or that black boogie of a bianchi may come and find you and he won't be grateful for your having taken him by the left leg and thrown him down those stairs hiss don't i hear him coming let's run the hint was enough they ran maud holding madeline by the hand steering her guiding her round corners seeming to know her way in the darkness as well as if it had been broad day they dashed through a door maud turned the key the electric light flamed out and madeline found herself back in maud dorincourt's own particular apartment the room of the purple crimson and gold maud this isn't fair i thought you were taking me to the street door i trusted you it's no good i won't stay i mean to go so don't let there be any misunderstanding hark at her the little spitfire she's my other self all over even to the temper open the door let me out not i i'll quarrel with you if you like but let you go i won't do you think i've come in the silent watches of the night to look for you in your bedroom or in mine it's all the same and when i found it empty chased you like some daft creature all over this huge caravanserai of a house with the intention of letting you through the street door when found you're mistaken if you do oddly i've a fish of quite another sort to fry my dear i'm going to do what i never thought to do to any one i'm going to introduce you to my sanctum sanctorum my holy of holies my refuge wherein the world's forgotten if by the world i'm not forgot i'm going to take you to my secret room my dearest child thank you but i have no wish to go i would rather you open the door and let me pass i dare say you would but we don't all get what we'd rather sweetest child when you get to my age you'll find it out alas look at her the fury she is in now i'm the gentle maud and she's the raging madeline now little little thing be good and come and see what may be seen she slipped her arm round madeline's waist who made an impatient movement as if to shake it off again now there's a naughty child control your angry passions or whatever will become of you half laughing half crying half willing half unwilling madeline was cajoled and wheedled into allowing maud to lead her across the room away from the door now keep one eye upon the wall and the other eye on me if you can manage to do it without squinting which i can't abide and you shall behold a feat a veritable hanky-panky observe my hand i wave it in the air once twice thrice thus graceful action isn't it my dear i'm persuaded that you and i are the most graceful creatures the world can show i bring it against the solid wall thus and behold before my touch my magic touch the solid wall flies open it was as she said she did wave her hand two or three times in the air 
and it was a graceful action and she did press her finger-tips against the solid wall and it did fly open notice one apparent drawback the wall does not open quite so much as it might do one has to stoop to enter and a very stout person could not squeeze through in point of fact the cavity revealed by the displacement of the hidden door was under six feet in height and less than two in width yet the drawback is rather apparent than real there is room for me to enter and for you which is the chief thing to be considered were the aperture larger it might be more conspicuous which would be a pity do you know that you are looking at something really like a feat of hanky-panky this wall is a good two feet thick the door is practically part and parcel of the wall it is scarcely less substantial and yet at the instant touch of my weak fingers you see they are slender it swings upon its hinges as lightly and as easily as if it were a feather's weight a man who knew his business made that door and hung it where you see it is hanging now go inside there is another little peculiarity which i wish to point out to you there is just room in here for two madeline whose curiosity was getting the upper hand was followed through the aperture by maud go right back if you go right back there you'll find that you'll be able to stand up straight the two girls found themselves in a sort of recess in which as maud said they were able to hold themselves erect the place in which we are is a kind of crow's nest built in the shaft of a chimney the chimneys in this house are chimneys in some of them there is room for a dozen people to stand i rather fancy that more than one chimney sweep has wondered what architectural freak caused such an obstruction to be placed in this particular chimney when the fires are alight downstairs this place gets pretty warm now notice as we stand here there appears to be this hole in the wall and nothing more a cul-de-sac i shut the door it's fairly dark isn't it the sort of darkness you can cut with a knife almost as dark as it was in the passage i have some matches in my pocket she took them out and struck one madeline remembering bianchi's matches could not help but smile the wavering light showed that where the door had been there was what seemed to be a second hole in the wall maud moving forward illuminated it with her flickering match you see the trick pretty isn't it when the door comes right open and it does come right open every time you open it or it won't open at all it swings back into this cavity which it exactly fits concealing it entirely so that it seems that as if there were nothing but the recess in which we were standing to be seen and it is only when the door is closed that the cavity is detected out goes the match for your sake my dear i'll light another this cavity opens on to a flight of steps we'll ascend them if you please i'll go first showing you as much light as a match will permit be careful how you come the steps are steep the ceiling low the walls uncomfortably close together one has to ascend in a somewhat humiliating attitude stop for a moment there's another match gone bang we'll try a third you see we're at the top we can't go any farther and yet we don't seem any better off for having come so far but observe i raise my hand i touch the ceiling and there's a great piece of it given way vanished into thin air there's a hole just big enough for us to scramble through i'll go first and you come after there was as the speaker said at the touch of her hand a square hole in the apparently solid stonework overhead through this she deftly clambered madeline was more awkward it was only with maud's assistance that she was able to get through it at all you're unaccustomed you'll get more used to it in time then you'll find that there's a trick in it and that this my most private and peculiar entrance is larger than it seems permit me to introduce you to my refuge from the world and tell me have i not a right to call it my holy of holies madeline looking about her found herself standing in an apartment of considerable dimensions 
which is it an attic or a loft whichever you please but whichever it is its existence is known only to me madeline's question was prompted by the fact that the open raftered roof sloped from the sides upward attaining its greatest height in the centre of the room the rafters were of oak black with age the walls also were of oak as black as the rafters on one side there was a huge open fireplace in which there burned a fire although the fire was a large one the room was not by any means too warm you're looking at my fire it's of coal as you perceive but whence the coal comes and how it gets up here is one of the secrets which at present i must keep locked up in my own breast madeline's curious glances were still wandering round it hardly conveys the impression of being the private apartment of a young lady of fashion does it it certainly did not anything less like the sort of apartment one might suppose that the average young lady of beauty rank and fashion would be disposed to take her ease one scarcely could imagine the place contained an extraordinary variety of miscellaneous articles in one corner was a rough wooden table on which were bottles retorts curious glass vessels of all sorts and shapes and sizes yes that's my laboratory i'm a chemist among half a hundred other things i pry unto nature's secrets about as deep as that she marked off a minute space upon her fingernail i dabble in poisons experiment with explosives i'll be exploded myself one of these times maybe on one side there was an easel over which a sheet was thrown three or four cameras leaned against the wall a heap of music was on the floor books were everywhere while in another corner stood what looked like a toy anvil and furnace together with a number of gleaming tools that's my smithy i'm a blacksmith too i make all sorts of curious things you'd be surprised if i were to show you some of the products of my hands i'm an all-round genius and up here in this haven remote from the world i can do just what my fancy bids without any one supposing me to be quite insane but now my sweetest dear perhaps you will be so very good as to tell me what you mean by your singular behaviour my singular behaviour yes your singular behaviour in scouring the passages with your hat on in the middle of the night madeline's face was white she looked at the girl in front of her all glowing with life and vigour the splendour of her vitality lending such enhancement to her unusual beauty and told herself that it was impossible that she could be as this girl was yet she could be one twentieth part as lovely maud submitted to her scrutiny with her hands behind her back her eyes all dancing well are you thinking of a story to fit the situation i wouldn't we all ought to tell the truth at times it's just the truth i wish to tell you i am going i was going when you interrupted me i intend to go as soon as i leave you of course you do and so you shall most sensibly resolved you shall go through the window or up the chimney whichever you please i do hope this is a free country in which we are living but might i venture to suggest that you should give me some sort of cause for this sudden ardour of departure which when i saw you last did not seem to be so very very strong a faint flush came into madeline's cheeks by degrees the tale was told maud listened with unconcealed amusement and delight clapping her hands interrupting like some excitable child with continual questions and you mean to say that conrad earl of staines took you into his arms and kissed you mistaking me for you tell that to the marines my dear do you do you dare to suggest that he behaved like that knowing me to be a perfect stranger bosh your perfect stranger outwardly you looked like me and to that extent he took you for me i've no doubt but inwardly there was something which was not me which was not mine which never would be mine and it was this something which was in you which called to him though you knew it not nor he either which set his blood all boiling making him stretch out his arms to you between which you stole because he felt and you felt that that was how god had foreordained it from the very beginning by now madeline's cheeks were a vivid red 
the other's impetuous words her air of complete conviction caused her pulses to throb made her conscious of a sense of satisfaction maud she said half beneath her breath you're one kind of ass my dear and i'm another but you may take mine for words of wisdom when i say that with you and conrad it's a case of heart calling unto heart the thing is as plain as the ends of my fingers ever since we were the merest children he has never kissed me or wanted to i believe it's years since we have shaken hands we are antipathetic he bores me the poor soul doesn't mean it it's his misfortune i'm pretty glib of tongue but i declare to you that i know no more what to say to him than if he were a wooden dummy and as for me i'm beyond his comprehension but when you appear upon the scene all this vanishes comes sweet sympathy perfect understanding you're in each other's arms at each other's lips one need not be over and above clear-sighted to see in this the hand of providence sweet maid maud and so the betrothals for to-morrow since i may be unavoidably absent may i be permitted to offer you my congratulations now don't talk like that it hurts you don't know how much it's because of what you say that i'm set on going to-night and i will go too will you indeed dear me and pray whose rag bag have you been robbing to get those clothes which you have on the hat is shocking the coat's a bad imitation of a fashion which is five years old the dress my dear is a shapeless tasteless rag which i should be ashamed to see a servant wear you are candid at last you begin to appreciate the situation at its proper worth do i how these clothes of which you speak so plainly and so truthfully are my natural ones hitherto you have only seen me in borrowed plumes these scourings of the rag-bag are practically the only garments which i have in them i live and move and have my being they are such as are proper to my station do you think the earl would perceive that hand of providence of which you spoke quite so clearly if he saw me now or that the countess would be so eager to urge on the betrothal you talk utter nonsense which is unfortunate in one who in other respects is so very much like me in any case they are not your natural but your unnatural clothes my dear you don't suppose that nature ever meant you to be clothed like that you must have very singular notions if you do give me that thing which twere base flattery to call a hat before madeline was prepared for what the speaker proposed to do maud drawing out the dagger-like pin which kept it in its place had the article in question in her hand maud what are you going to do i'm going to tear it into strips and use it to feed the fire a better fate than it deserves then you'll send me hatless out into the streets i'd sooner you went hatless than with a thing like this upon your head possibly you're unaware that a hat is meant for an ornament and not for a disguise better clap a copper saucepan on your crown than a libel in straw it was already too late to interfere to any purpose maud grasping the hat with her strong white hands had already torn it into two clean halves which she was again dividing madeline eyed with mingled feelings the process of destruction the fragments were thrown on to the fire there now let them ascend to heaven in horrid smoke will you oblige me with the thing which once upon a time was perhaps a coat as maud advanced the other retreated instinctively putting her hands up to her throat as if to shield herself from personal attack i think you must be mad then you'll find there's a method in my madness will you have the extreme kindness to hand me over that recollection of a jacket no but my dear you will you shouldn't speak so unkindly to your sister come twin soul may i play the part of the lady's maid and help you with your buttons she went close up to madeline and before the girl had suspected her intention deftly unbuttoned the jacket at the bottom madeline making a futile effort to reclose it exposed it at the neck in an instant that was opened she was spun round like a teetotum the jacket was drawn right off her and maud had torn it clean in two down the centre of the back the audacity of the deed seemed to have taken the victim's breath away she stood and stared and gasped 
you you are a wicked girl i suspected it from the first now i am sure is that so my sweetest pet do you think these pieces of cloth will smell if i put them on the fire there is a very strong updraft it ought to carry away any disagreeable odour we might try anyhow we will very quietly she went and placed piece after piece of what had once been madeline's jacket carefully in the heart of the fire stirring it up with the poker to assist the process of combustion as the blaze went up the chimney she turned still with the poker in her hand there you see there isn't any smell and how well it burns she put the poker down now heart's beloved will you show me how you put yourself outside that relic of antiquity which never was a frock it's kind of you to make fun of me and it's very easy and to laugh at the only clothes with which my poverty has enabled me to provide for myself but can't you understand that what to you is just to me is deadly earnest and isn't it deadly earnest to me aren't i conducting this affair with the most serious precision isn't it down the side that the bodice sweep is hooked madeline retreated hastily towards the corner of the room don't come near me if you do i'll yes you'll but of course you will one can always rely upon your doing just what is right true heart i feel sure it is down the side will you let me out of this this place certainly when you've put yourself outside that thing then do you propose that i shall take my walks abroad without even this thing on by way of a frock you wouldn't present a more shocking spectacle than you do now even if you did i do assure you that it is altogether out of the question that i should allow my sister to be seen by any one in such a horror i'm not your sister you're not only my sister sweetest but i suppose in a manner of speaking you'll soon be my cousin-in-law as well your cousin-in-law haven't you bound yourself to marry conrad aren't you to be the future countess of staines isn't the betrothal for to-morrow your mind must be very full of weighty matters if such trifles as these slip out of it so easily can you be seriously suggesting that i should commit this this shameless crime that i should allow a man any man to publicly pledge himself to become my husband while he supposes me to be some one other than i am is it possible that you can't see the monstrous nature of the thing you are proposing maud laughing held out her hands in front of her with a little air as if in mockery of the other's tragic gestures there's nothing monstrous in betrothing yourself to a man who has asked you to marry him and whom you have promised to wed i believe you are stark mad dropping on to a chair placing her elbows on the table which stood beside it madeline covered her face with her hands aren't you aware that there is truer nobler higher reason in some forms of madness than in certain kinds of sanity you know very little of the world's story if you don't know that you love the man love him don't tell me that you have only spoken to him for five minutes and sundry seconds i know all that but it's white of the mark you're like me tinder which a spark sets in a flame but which nothing can extinguish conrad's been to you the spark you're aflame with love for him deny it upon oath if you dare even supposing that what you say were true there's no supposing it's just bald fact and conrad's in love with you with a typewriting girl stuff your typewriting girl you're his equal and you are my superior his instincts told him that already besides a man doesn't fall in love with a woman because of her profession or want of one be he prince or peasant he loves her because she is the creature of flesh and blood which his eyes behold and his heart desires don't tempt me don't tempt me don't tempt me madeline springing to her feet threw out her arms with a gesture of almost hysteric passion instantly springing behind her unhooking her skirt at the back maud had her out of it and was rushing away with it in triumph before she realized what had happened now i've got the skirt you can keep the bodice if you choose though it's hardly supposed to be the correct thing to wear nothing but a bodice into the fire it goes all in a heap just as it is crushing it into a bundle she crushed it down where the fire was hottest it smouldered then broke into flames throwing open a door she disclosed a cupboard full of feminine glories there's something with which to cover your nakedness take what you choose what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine since you don't seem in a choosing mood perhaps you had better throw this over you while you're making up your mind she advanced towards madeline holding out a gorgeous silken dressing-gown you beautiful true-faced simple-minded pure-hearted daughter of the gods you're too lovely to be human 
can any man behold you without loving hardly any of those i remember to have met come play the comedy through is there in you none of the salt of adventure here's a romance ready-made don't spoil it in the telling see it to an end and live an hourly momentary terror of discovery a living lie starting at every shadow reading hidden meaning in each passing word knowing full well that exposure shame and punishment must come turn and twist and double as i may is that your notion of a comedy it seems you're all for tragedy so soon as you're betrothed and the intrigue set a-going you'll be at liberty to tell him you're not me or i will tell him i'm not you or we'll tell him both together if you choose then if he prefers to have me for his wife instead of you i'll not say him nay that i promise you here's my hand on it she held out her hand madeline shrunk back don't tempt me don't don't and to make the intrigue run the smoother and the surer there are these opening a drawer and a cabinet maud took out three or four rings here are these rings of mine which you may have i'm known to be a jewel-loving savage so that without any your fingers may seem to be a trifle bare but here's the crown and capital of the entire edifice with this in its proper place the duplicate of mine even the inquiring reginald may be defied she was holding out a small gold wedding ring but i could never get that on my finger oh yes you could and can and shall leave that to me i'm more skilled in certain matters than you may perhaps suppose suffer me to manipulate your finger in a certain manner of my own and i'll have it on inside two jiffies though i allow that you may find it a trifle harder to get it off again don't tempt me don't 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 dropping on her knees laying her head upon the table madeline sobbed as if her heart would break maud leaning over her shoulder held out in front of her the wedding ring invitingly on the palm of her extended hand End of chapter nine chapter ten of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain the betrothal in the music-room there was quite a crowd the sun slanted through the stained glass windows throwing splashes of colour upon the parquet floor lending to the place something of a church-like atmosphere an appearance however which the bearing and behaviour of the persons who passed to and fro amid the lights and shadows hardly emphasised the tale had been told last night at the duchess of colmshire's ball and the marshness of filey's dinner at lady loon's reception it had gone the round of the clubs been talked of in the house had even found its way into the papers we are able to announce said the morning post that a marriage has been arranged between the earl of staines and his cousin miss maud dorincourt it will without doubt be the wedding of the season the bride will not only bring a great fortune to her husband but her beauty is unique she is probably the loveliest young lady of her age some say of any age in the world we understand that the betrothal will take place at staines house this afternoon at the express desire of the dowager countess the function will be semi-public time had not been lost informal cards had been sent out that same evening to such of the fanshawe clan whose presence was desired on the morrow the countess was all agog to see the dream of her life consummated ere its close her matrimonial schemes had met with many a rebuff and one hideous failure but victory was crowning them at last and she was desirous that all the world should learn the fact and on the instant there she was in her great armchair on an impromptu six-inch high platform which had been raised in the centre of the room bent double her yellow claws clutching at the arms her great eyes travelling shrewdly hither and thither and in particular glowering at the people who came to pay her compliments and offer her congratulations scant were the words she uttered in acknowledgment and each was barbed she belonged to a period when the language used was stronger and tongues were rougher than they are supposed to be to-day besides one forgives all manner of rudeness in a lady 
who has seen a century extraordinary old woman declared lady penelope miridu sir jasper is an offshoot of the cadet branch of the fanshaws she's been at the girl to marry staines ever since she first set eyes on her for my part from what i know of the young lady and the old one i shouldn't be surprised if pressure of a curious sort has not been brought to bear upon at least one of the contracting parties the girl's stark mad returned mrs trefusis yarmouth to whom the observation was addressed she's the most insolent creature i ever met and conceited she's eaten up by it i pity staines but then it's always been my conviction that all the fanshaws are mad thank you my dear perhaps you forget that my husband is one of them the other shrugged her shoulders so's mr trefusis yarmouth and i'm sure i tell him often enough that he's stark mad the honourable dudley fennel exchanged a few remarks with mr reginald fanshaw so it has happened i thought you told me that it never would it never will mr fennel eyed him curiously reginald spoke with an easy lightness which seemed to suggest that he himself was assured of the truth of what he said and as if he found the entire business most amusing it's all very well for you to stick to your fancy and of course i'm perfectly well aware that the marriage will put your nose most uncommonly out of joint and that you'll do your level best to prevent its ever coming off but it seems to me that you've precious little to go upon there is more in every situation than meets the public eye what the deuce do you mean by that what may you happen to be driving at hasn't the girl thrown up the sponge and knuckled down to stains i doubt it then what the devil have we been all brought here for to assist in an act of a little comedy that's all dudley fennel stared you're pleased to speak in riddles can't you say straight out what you mean to me do you wish me to understand that the girl has not agreed to marry staines i'll put it in this way i'll lay you two to one in anything you please that maud dorincourt has not said she'll marry staines make a note of the exact wording of the bet and i'll take you again at the same price that she never will and why on earth have we been brought here to witness their betrothal ah that's another question which you must address to my dear old granny or to the saintly staines the bishop of fulham was there and a couple of canons and three or four parsons of lesser degree it seems as if the dowager designed to throw a religious flavour over the affair the bishop went up to staines and took him by the hand i congratulate you from the bottom of my heart it gives me the greatest pleasure to be here on so auspicious an occasion and one so pregnant with the promise of future happiness the earl's brown face was glowing an unusual light was in his eyes his ordinary gravity seemed to be in eclipse as if the sun of that happiness of which the bishop spoke had come in front of it it's very good of you to say so i can assure you that if love sanctifies marriage mine will have a certain consecration never man loved woman better than i love my wife that is to be the bishop who had some intimate acquaintance with the speaker was struck by his buoyant tone and by a certain flamboyant quality in the words he used which was scarcely in keeping with his general reserve yet hardly suspected him of a capacity to talk with such outspokenness of loving anything or any one you must show us an example of one of those marriages which are not failures i promise it sorrow may come and disappointment and material worries but i undertake to guarantee that happiness shall stay with my wife and me whatever steals in at the door the bishop who had as much matrimonial experience as any one felt that this man was unduly sanguine having some knowledge of miss dorincourt he would have been very far from willing to undertake a personal guarantee of the sort to which the speaker referred above all he was amazed to learn that the earl seemed possessed of bumps of devotion and of faith with which he had never for a moment credited him up in the gallery the organ was being played the piece being an odd stormy irregular thing an impromptu possibly of the performer's own scarcely in touch with the occasion full of fire and fury with nothing in it of that strain of joy and jubilation which one is apt to associate with the sound of wedding bells signor bianchi was the player he played as if he were ushering in a scene of strife bloodshed murder every note he sounded seemed to be a shriek of rage on a stool at his side but facing him so that he leaned with his back against the instrument was another man who seemed to derive 
considerable entertainment from the passion of bianchi's playing he kept addressing to him little satirical remarks as if he found it impossible to keep his enjoyment holding to himself that is a tender little thing you play it is very soothing you breathe forth the spirit of perfect peace on a sudden the instrument burst into a very hurricane of sound there now you distil the very essence of the ideal marriage it is always like that so calm so seraphic the touch is perhaps a little sentimental but it comes from the heart my friend it is false bianchi's exclamation did not seem intended to apply to what the other had been saying but to refer to something of which they had been previously speaking the organist tossed back his head covered with its mane of thick black hair and glared up at the organ pipes above him as if they were so many demons sent for his destruction his companion plainly understanding his allusion eyed him queerly then shut his eyes and smiled very well then it is false but it is in the papers the papers what are the papers nothing but lies i tell you it is false then it is false only the people are here behold them for what then are they come is it for nothing how do i know for what they are come what do i care what is it to me it is to hear your pretty music they are come bianchi glared at him with a look of rage which was murderous in its intensity only its effect was lost since it happened that just at that moment the speaker was leaning as far back as he conveniently could with his eyes fast closed as if he were about to indulge in the luxury of a little doze all that you say is nonsense it is impossible she loves me i swear to it has she not given me the proofs those proofs what is it that you call proofs my friend they are enough for me i promise you and it is i who am the chief concerned and even if she did not love me she would have nothing to do with that lump of ice that frozen thing she has told it me a dozen times he is to her a wooden dummy she cannot bear to be left alone with him for a minute has she not said it with her own lips there never was a woman yet that lied she is not one of that sort i am sure besides is it not the common talk that she has refused him a hundred times she will not even look at or speak to him have i not seen her turn her head away when he came near refusing to answer treating him as if he were something worse than a dog and is it to be supposed that she would change her mind become another creature all in a moment and i know nothing no 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 it is false all that is in the papers it is false so you know best it is false that you have a mind at ease is plain that is why you play so very tenderly again the organist cast at the speaker a glance of murderous rage the effect of which again was lost and for the same cause as before as if in harmony with the condition of the performer's nervous system the instrument thundered out a tumult of sound which recalled the madness of a witch's sabbath the incongruity of the thing was noticed down below with what very odd music the gentleman upstairs is favouring us remarked pretty mrs pendleton to handsome young davis urquhart it seems hardly reminiscent of the voice that breathed o'er eden he's a married man that chap he sees with the prophetic eye he's giving us a forecast of what always does come after she tapped him on the shoulder with her gloved hand you always do know so much you boys it's a comfort to reflect that you know less as you grow older but what i want to know just now is where's the bride that is to be others were beginning to put the same inquiry here was the bridegroom and the wedding guests but where was the bride time was passing why did she still tarry even as the question fluttered from between mrs pendleton's lips it was answered the great doors at the end of the room were thrown wide open and through them there came a vision of youth and loveliness the bride that was to be had she purposely designed to choose the most effective fashion of making a dramatic entry she could scarcely have succeeded better her continued absence was on the point of becoming the topic of every tongue and behold she was a chorus of welcome went up on every side people hastened forward to give her greeting congratulatory words rained down on her most girls finding themselves received in such a manner at such a moment would have been disconcerted there was no appearance of anything of the kind about her she faced them as if she were a very queen as if in rendering her homage they were but giving her her due she advanced four or five steps towards the centre of the room and then stood still by all it was admitted that never had she looked more beautiful she stood quite straight as she always did one foot slightly forward her head thrown back her face looking a little up and in her glorious eyes a look which those who had sufficient penetration to observe such things 
found more than a trifle strange inscrutable indeed it was as though declared lady penelope merridew when all was over perhaps a little fancifully she saw something which we didn't see and never should see or ever could something which was inspiring her holding her up leading her on making her oblivious of the presence of any living creature except her own most lovely self in this latter statement of her ladyship's there was some truth she did appear unmoved by the throng which crowded round her not flatteringly unmoved it was only when the hero of the hour threaded his way through the eager little mob that she evinced any signs of interest at all but at sight of him all in a moment her face and throat were dyed a vivid red into her eyes there came a sudden recognition of things material the change was so marked that none could help but notice it reggie observed the honourable dudley fennel to mr fanshawe your information is all wrong put your money on some other filly this one will answer to every touch of stain's hand upon the bridle she loves the very ground he walks upon reginald was staring with all his eyes as if bewildered i can't make it out there's some infernal jugglery there can be no sort of doubt about the jugglery and the name of the juggler's love don't you be a fool my boy and make a row because you're beaten you ought to know enough of the sex to be aware that a woman loves a man to-day because she didn't yesterday and that the more she didn't yesterday the more she does to-day it's a way the darlings have on my word i envy him so far as looks are concerned there isn't a girl about who can hold a torch to her and with all your granny's money stains is a man to whom the gods are going to be kind among those who were interested in the advent of the bride that was to be not the most backward was the organist his curiosity was unmistakable and of a peculiar kind some might have supposed that he would have greeted her appearance with some sort of musical salutation but no this gentleman had ways and manners of his own so soon as she appeared he stopped short in the hurricane hubbub in which judging from appearances he had been endeavouring to give vent to his emotions stopped short just as his fingers were about to press the notes in the middle of a bar he rose from his seat as if actuated by springs rushed to the edge of the gallery and leaning his body half-way over it stared at the young lady with might and main his companion leaning back in his own particular corner appeared to find his conduct more and more amusing his whole body seemed shaken by silent laughter she does not see me she will not look at me her eyes are for all others no that is not it she sees me but it is as if i were some dead thing she makes no sign i am as nothing is it that she wishes me to understand that i am a thing despised is it so name of god is it so the excitable musician uttered these disconnected sentences in eager trembling broken tones as if they were merely the ejaculations of his troubled soul and were addressed to no one in particular his companion however chose to take them as if they were addressed to him his face as he replied was wreathed in smiles my friend is it that your mind is troubled not possible yours is a sure and a certain faith have you not the proofs well then what is in the paper is all false there is nothing that need cause you the least concern the organist turned upon him with a snarl like a savage cur for an instant it seemed as if he would assail him with physical violence but on a sudden the speaker opened his eyes as if he were drawing shades away from in front of them till they shone out of his head like two lighted lamps meeting the other's anger with a glance before which bianchi's eyelids were quickly lowered the old countess seated in state upon her dais deserted for the moment by the little throng who had gone to offer greeting to the maid whose presence they attended noticing that the instrument was on a sudden silent and that the organist had advanced to the gallery's edge beckoned a servant to her side go up and tell bianchi to keep on playing the servant went and presently there was another burst of tumult which if it was meant for music was distinctly not of the kind which soothes the savage breast amidst the din the earl and the lady advanced arm in arm towards the watchful dowager the others falling in on either side and behind so as to form a sort of impromptu retinue the old lady did not receive them with any special show of enthusiasm she looked the girl up and down appraisingly when she spoke her croaking tones seemed rustier than ever you've kept us waiting i suppose you think that's nothing after keeping me waiting all these years raising her ghoulish eyes she kept them fixed upon the other's features you're a lovely girl worth waiting for stains you've got the loveliest girl in all the world for wife there isn't a woman in the room fit to touch the hem of her skirt 
this was pleasant hearing for those of the women who heard and by now they were all gathered closely round the dais glances of varying import were exchanged the old lady went on wholly indifferent to any impressions her words might have made she kept her eyes fixed upon the other's countenance kiss me a look of momentary indecision seemed to pass over the girl's face her skin seemed to whiten then moving a little forward she lightly brushed with her lips the withered cheek kiss me again the girl's lips perceptibly tightened again she hesitated then did as she had done before i'll be bound stains that she kisses you more warmly and takes longer at it the jay's kiss is like the touch of thistledown and gone before it's come kneel down in front of me you stand too high above me i cannot see you as i would i'm getting old this time without a moment's hesitation the girl did as she was bid she knelt holding the fingers of her two hands loosely intertwined come closer she went closer till her face was within a few inches of the dowager's the old woman regarded her for some seconds silently none of those who were looking on uttering a word when she spoke there was that in her creaking tones which struck an unsuspected note in the hearts of some of those who heard you're like a dream of my own youth i was pretty when i was young long time ago not so lovely as you no nor half you're beauty's queen a credit to the family but i was pretty in my way soft cheeks bright eyes and waving hair and as i look at you i seem to see myself again as i was when i was young she placed her hands upon the girl's shoulders who with an impetuous little burst threw her arms about her neck and kissed her with an ardour of which she could scarcely have complained on the score of coldness the action seemed to touch the old woman in a fashion which was not in keeping with her notorious character she touched the girl's hair lightly almost reverently with her tremulous fingers my child my child my child when you come so close to me i can see how beautiful you are then she broke into a strain which took those who knew her best completely by surprise god guard you and keep you from any more of the knowledge of evil than is good for you and give you joy with your husband and children who shall be more to you than mine have been to me and length of days so that when you reach my age you may have known less of life's bitterness than i have done and be a better woman at the end she turned to those who stood about her this is my grandchild maud as you all know well to whom may god grant wisdom i'm going to give her all that i have so you may all take warning those who know me know that what i have said is said i never change my mind so from this time forth none of you need expect to receive from me one penny she is to marry stain so that she will be the head over all of you though you search the world you could not find one fitter as you all know it is the usage in our house that the head shall plight his troth in the face of all of us stains this is our betrothal ring with it i was betrothed and all the women who have been wives to the lord till the record of them's lost to you i hand it to use it in your turn she spoke with a certain dignity as if something of the decrepitude of age had dropped away from her in presence of her consciousness of the unique importance of the scene in which she figured she drew a ring from her shrivelled finger a single diamond set claw-like in a chaste band of time-worn gold the earl received it from her with a deep inclination of his head then turned to the girl who had already risen to her feet as he did so reginald fanshawe coming on to the platform addressed himself to the expectant lady pardon me i rather fancy there is something which you ought to miss suffer me for one moment to see your hand without waiting for the permission he requested he took her left hand and raising it in the air examined it with an eager scrutiny which presently changed to dissatisfied surprise he looked up at her as if puzzled to which she replied with a scornful stare in her voice there was a sarcastic intonation what's missing i was afraid you had lost your mother's ring yesterday it was not on your hand she held up the third finger of her left hand in the flesh of which was deeply set a plain gold ring that ring has not left my finger since it was first put on what's all this to do exclaimed the countess what's the matter with the man reginald take yourself away this hour is none of yours reginald obeying returned to dudley fennel's side you're a fool murmured sotto voce his sympathetic friend mr fanshawe frowned and muttered there's some infernal jugglery somewhere i'll swear to it now that that over-clever brother of yours has obscured himself for once went on the dowager it's for you stains to play well your part except the lady hildegard who stood a sufficiently truculent figure at the countess's side the earl and the maiden had the dais to themselves 
all eyes regarded them taking the lady's hand in his drawing it towards him he slipped the betrothal ring upon her finger saying in tones which rang out clearly through all the room with this ring i pledge to thee my plighted troth may god destroy me root and branch if while life is in you i take any but you to be my wife and the sharer of my bed and board it was the ancient form of words which had always been used on such occasions by the heads of his house there were not a few among those who listened who deemed them to be of a strength which it is as well for all our sakes is out of fashion stooping he kissed the ring then standing upright the lady's lips on which she burst out crying whereupon he put his arms about her and drew her to him none noticing that the organ had ceased to play and that the organist leaning over the gallery waved his arms in the air with frantic gestures as if beside himself with frenzy and that his companion holding him by the shoulders was exerting his strength to draw him back End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain a lover scorned a room cumbered with a musician's litter a musician apparently who was the master of many instruments on one side and a little in a corner an open grand piano on a small table just in front of it a violin the bow upon its belly afforded to further a harp against the wall one of its strings broken low down near the pedals the detached wire dangling in the air on a sideboard opposite leather cases one open disclosing a flute with its parts unscrewed a cornet stood near by on the floor and on the other side of the fireplace a four-stringed double bass the bow hanging on one of the pegs music on the floor chairs tables piano sideboard mantelpiece everywhere a good deal of it in rags as if the soul which it enshrined had been torn to tatters pacing hither and thither gesticulating as he went was the room's proprietor paolo bianchi he was in such a temper and whirlwind of passion as to be rather mad than sane his arms were in continual movement branching out in every direction behind in front towards either side up towards the ceiling down towards the ground as if they had been hung on springs which every motion of his body put in action he flung his head with its thick mane of hair this way and that his eyes rolled his voice rose and fell now rising to the roar of a bull now sinking to a hoarse whisper of the intensest bitterness some persons might have found the gentleman's frenzy more than a little ridiculous and one of those persons happened to be seated at the piano at that particular moment this was the gentleman who in the organ loft had seemed to derive so much entertainment from the peculiar quality of the signor's performance he was an unusually tall man and although his shoulders were broad suggesting striking lung capacity almost grotesquely thin his head was too small for the size of his body it was bullet-shaped his light brown hair was cropped close to the scalp in continental fashion he had a trick of holding himself so very straight that one was apt to wonder if the vertebrae of his back and neck sloped outwards one would hardly have been surprised to see him unconsciously fall into one of the postures of the professional contortionist his cheeks and chin were shaven but he wore a huge moustache whose proportions amply compensated for the absence of any other hirsute adornment underneath this moustache his jaw stood out suddenly with a squareness which recalled the muzzle of a bulldog and its tenacity his nose though small was slightly hooked two little lobes at the side stood out a little on either side there seemed to be some singularity about the structure of his eyelids as if the tendon of the upper lid was unduly long so as to make it more convenient for him to allow it to droop than to hold it up at least it seemed to be his natural habit to keep it only just sufficiently raised to enable one to perceive that there was an eye behind it was conceivable that one might be an acquaintance of some standing without becoming aware what sort of an eye it really was the predominant expression of his face was a seemingly perennial smile so curious a smile that the more one regarded it the more one wondered what it meant one felt that this man would smile at all things more especially at those which moved others to tears 
while bianchi dashed to and fro raging and storming calling on all the gods to witness his afflictions this gentleman sat at the piano and strummed in a fashion which hardly suggested the cultured musician a little jig the thing which was the merest jingle he repeated over and over and over again with a monotonous iteration which in itself was maddening and he sat very straight with his head thrown back peeping at the other from beneath his nearly shut eyelids and he smiled i will kill her i will destroy her she shall be as the thing that has not been i will show her what is the reward of treachery she shall know that my hate can be as hot as my love that my vengeance is like the thunderbolt that it blasts consumes erases the gentleman at the piano restarted his senseless jingle for the dozenth time bravo he cried she supposes that my anger is not a thing to be feared that is because i have forgiven her again and again but why why was she forgiven my love for her was great it was the whole of my life it is true she has offended me not once not twice but a hundred a thousand times but each time the offence was but a trifle so great was my love it was as nothing when the occasion of the offence was past and i heard again the music of her voice and saw the beauty of her eyes my heart leaped up within my breast there was not room for anger any more therefore she supposes that because in little things my love was before everything it is not a thing to be feared my wrath wherein she mistakes in the presence of a great betrayal a monstrous wickedness a scarlet sin my love it goes it is transformed it becomes another thing and in its place there arises the spirit the spectre the colossus of revenge my fury drives me on it is unstoppable it is so that is plain and the jig continued in my wrath which is a just wrath i pronounce on her sentence of judgment which is in accordance with the principles of the eternal justice i pronounce it to all the world i proclaim her destruction i will destroy her with the fingers of my own hands branch and root i will destroy her she has ruined my life broken my heart betrayed me lied to me played with me the fool and robbed you of her voice eh that voice of which i have heard so much ah her voice my god her voice lazarus i do declare to you that never was there a voice like hers never never i do not speak as a fool i speak only of what i am certain i know all the great voices which still live i have a perfect knowledge of all the great voices which are dead their range their quality their timber i could tell you just as if they were this moment in this room all the things which made them great but never was there one of them which could be compared to hers never never you never heard one like it in your dreams and i have heard some voices in my dreams yes whose every note struck against a treasure chest and brought out of it a rain of gold ah as for gold it is to me as nothing it is not a thing for which i care no gold is not a thing for which you care it is sure bianchi seemed totally unconscious of the sarcasm which was in the speaker's tone my tastes are simple oh yes they are most simple my wants the things which i esteem which i desire they are all within the range of a modest purse of a most modest purse there is not the slightest doubt of it you are one of those men who desire only whatever they can get eh is it not so the organist still appeared impervious to the other's irony it is so what you say is quite true whatever i can get i am content to have i am a child of nature a little flower of the field i am content to bask in the sunshine i ask no more to me it is a pleasure to be alive in the beautiful world of the good god that is how it is with me as you know but all the same as for the gold of which you speak in her voice there is as much gold as there is in africa or in australia either compared to it her grandmother's money is as nothing pa like a halfpenny which i toss into the air and yet the old lady could build up a pretty pile of sovereigns eh her riches are immense enormous stupefying but what is it compared to the money which is in that false girl's voice i know i know patty gets a thousand guineas when she sings well she will get five ten fifteen twenty thousand this is a day when for what is unique you get what you choose to ask that her voice is unique i give you my word there may be voices like it on the other side of purgatory which i ask the good god to forgive me if i venture to doubt but that there are none on this side and never have been i promise you i would not let her sing for all the world no not i she has a strange notion that her voice has been given her 
for the enjoyment of the whole world to give it pleasure that of course is folly pure i let her sing once twice thrice perhaps four or five times a year in this place in that place in some other it may be in each country once i charge a hundred pounds for a seat i get it too for as many seats as i choose to sell it will be to give yourself out a poor person not to be able to pay to hear her sing and in these times there are few of those who consider themselves to be any one who will be willing to proclaim their poverty to the whole world now and then every ten every five years something like that i let her sing to the people to the great crowd for that i ask from each of them a mere bagatelle it may be five pounds in this way i make a hundred thousand a hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year i live at my ease i have the nations at my feet i twiddle my thumbs i say this is a pleasant world in which to be and she what will there be for her out of this little plan which is the child of your simple tastes eh for her there will be the satisfaction of the artiste the great artiste she will know that it is out of her throat her beautiful throat that these things all come as a woman the pleasure of such a conviction will be immense immense without the slightest doubt besides for her there will be the incense of my love of my unceasing love of my undying devotion the adoration of one artiste for another artiste i have a soul all sentiment all poetry all kindness i have a great heart which will compel me to kneel always at her feet looking up with rapture into her lovely eyes ah my friend in that future which i propose for both of us her future will be larger than mine i give you my word and to think that this pretty scheme of yours should have all been spoiled by my lord of staines that stupid englishman who has no soul for song bianchi broke into a flood of imprecations he shook his clenched fists tossed his mane of hair danced about as if he had a difficulty in finding an adequate vent for the torrent of his passion i will kill her yes that is certain and i will kill him too that is also certain and before the sun goes down their bleeding bodies will be the proof that a noble spirit is not to be outraged without the sword of justice falling mr lazarus for the first time ceased to strum that dreadful jingle he bent back on his stool until one felt that if his anatomical structure had been of the common type his spinal column must certainly have fractured he raised his long arms above his head his fingers fully extended and he burst into laughter which was so sudden so loud and so hearty that bianchi started back as if it had been a missile aimed at him at what are you laughing is it at me is it at me that you laugh the other gave no answer he ceased to laugh as suddenly as he had begun he rose from his stool his enormous length towering above the other so that beside him bianchi seemed a pygmy he went to the table on which there was the violin taking it up he picked the strings with his fingers sharply bianchi clapped his hands to his ears ah do not touch it it is all wrong it is out of tune that is all right i play out of tune what does it matter he drew the bow across the cords with a discordant screech which made the organist spring from his feet ah for the love of heaven do not make that dreadful noise put down that horrible thing not at all i play you a little tune all wrong he played a little tune all wrong indeed with such a torturing of air and tune that it was difficult not to suspect that he was playing it as badly as he conveniently could bianchi stared at him with a face of anguish for one who has had all his life to do with music it is extraordinary that you should have so little there is no more music in you than there is in that board nor one-tenth part as much out of that board an instrument may be fashioned out of me never he went on wrenching discords from the maltreated violin bianchi paced up and down racked by his thoughts and probably also by the music of his friend at last the performer spoke bianchi lazarus what a pity it is that you never mean anything at all that you say i mean everything i say i swear it you will do nothing to her i will kill her you will do nothing also to him i will kill him too bah your words are as froth if they were to hear you they would not be at all afraid i swear to you in the name of the virgin the father the son the holy ghost i will kill them both mr lazarus continued to make the fiddle give forth groans of agony presently he spoke again no you will do nothing don't i tell you i will kill them both you will do nothing you will let them pull you by the nose you will let them kick you you will let them make a fool of you 
all that you will say is do it again you are of that kind i swear to you that i will kill them you shall see it if you please once more mr lazarus was still then spoke again in a sort of quiet drawl as if he were giving half unconscious utterance to ideas which were passing through his brain and all the while he racked the fiddle it is a pity that you do not mean sometimes what you say do i not swear to you a hundred times that this time i mean it every word so supposing you to be not the chicken-hearted creature she takes you for and that she cannot use you like a poor little dog of which she is tired i will kill her for you you will kill her for me how and also him lazarus it is a small joke that i would play i am fond of quips and jests and fancies i do not understand you in the least no it is true that you would kill her do i not tell you over and over and over again and him by the living god mr lazarus removed the violin from his shoulder he looked at it this is a good fiddle of yours it is all out of tune it is possible you do not know it holy virgin it is so that i like it all the people in the world are out of tune it is when they are most out of tune you can do with them the most curious things as if you choose i will show you the organist gave a gesture which seemed to denote that he was mystified what is it you mean mr lazarus returning the violin to its former position recommenced its torture how if i were to make her kill him make her kill him you could not do it no maybe but i could try i wish you would tell me what it is you mean you play with phrases better than you play the violin it is in this way it is a little amusement i would have for men not for fools i am not a fool no perhaps not she takes you for one that is sure i will show her i am not a fool and you tell me what is it you mean have you ever heard of odd never in my life it is a sort of force i have with which i make you do as i choose not what you choose do you mean the evil eye it is a sort of evil eye you have the evil eye the holy virgin protect me i thought you were the fool she takes you for i am no fool but the evil eye that is not a thing with which one trifles it is to you then that i owe the whole of my misfortunes it is to your own folly your own stupidity she judged you well this girl when she slapped you across the face she knew that in spitting at you she was safe she will die for it i promise you she will not die for it she will suffer nothing at your hands you are too great a fool she knows that well we shall see what we shall see supposing i were to make her kill him for that she would be hung you would be revenged upon them both without any trouble to yourself or any risk but how would you make her kill him by casting on her the evil eye holy virgin bianchi crossed himself for the second time mr lazarus continued to torture the fiddle and to grin it is a little experiment i would make i am of an experimental turn of mind i do not say that i would do it but i would try try hard i seek always to try everything that can be tried to find out to know it is my nature i will use this force i have it is called odic force and by the use of it i will try to bend her to my will i will say nothing not a word but when i have brought her to a state in which she will do just as i choose in my own thoughts i will think to myself i would like you my girl to go and look for my lord staines and when you have found him to take a knife one of your own if there is one at hand and drive it to the hilt deep into his heart and if this force of mine has had on her its due effect she will go straight off and she will search for my lord and so soon as she finds him no matter where or who is looking on without saying a word she will snatch up the first knife there is and she will drive it into his breast and he will fall dead and there will be an end of your affair it is impossible perhaps i do not say no but i will try that is if you are not altogether the fool she takes you for will she know what it is that she is doing no she will know nothing at all that is where the joke will be 
but they will not hang her for having done a thing when she did not know what it was that she was doing so much the better for you for then after all she will be yours she will be taken to prison they will try her for murder that is sure that will break her spirit so that in your turn you will be able to do with her as you will her voice will remain she will be only delighted to use it as you may desire at the lifting of your finger she will make you your hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year you will be all that there will be left to her all else she will have lost surely than that nothing could suit you better is it not a pretty little scheme a beautiful revenge eh you think that she would have me after all it is sure why not her family will be glad to give her to the first person who will take her off their hands you need fear no opposition in that quarter and perhaps the old lady will give you her money too who knows bianchi ran his hands one after the other through the wilderness of his long black hair he gnawed his under lip he knit his brows he seemed to be turning something over in his mind mr lazarus still smiling continued to extract excruciating sounds from the untuned fiddle while from beneath his nearly closed eyelids he followed every movement of his friend after an interval of silence the organist began to make short jerky remarks as if they fell from him haphazard the fiddler commented on them as they came a certain saturnine humour seeming to earmark every word he uttered she has been false to me as false as the grave and falser did she not tell me that she loved me over and over again with in her voice the raptures of a young hot love the proofs are in my heart and in my pocket too certainly of themselves they are enough to hang her her voice i have done all for it without you it would have been not anything no i have made of it a perfect organ out of nothing yes how has she rewarded me with a slap across the face the excitable gentleman again began to prance up and down the room by heaven by heaven by heaven it is a thing too horrible a crime against nature a treachery not to be believed it is more than she deserves if i throw her to the dogs and they use her as if she were carrion or if you throw her to me to make of her a little joke as for him he deserves a double death yet such is our mercy we propose to only kill him once you understand my friend that what we propose to do is in the cause of science that great cause we take up you and i the position of two scientific inquirers no more that in all simplicity we have heard that certain things it is possible to do we desire to know if this is true we make our little inquiries for every experiment you need a subject what viler body could we choose for a subject than that of this traitress trebly died the organist was standing still again he was biting his fingernails and you do not think that they will hang her not at all she will live to be your wife that is if you think her worthy of such honour it is not i who does this thing of course not nor is it i lazarus who is it then you need not get hot why do you always get so hot i shall not be near when she does it i shall not even see it done by nature i am of a very tender disposition i ought to know myself and i tell you i am all tenderness the whole of me i would not hurt my lord with the tips of my fingers why should i he is no enemy of mine it is you who guide her hand it is odd i know nothing of your odd it is a fool's word it is the evil eye that is in you that is you it is all the same listen to me dear friend you talk too much it is an error there are some things which never will be done if you talk of them you should not talk of them either before or afterwards take that from me the tongue and the sword are not good bedfellows if you wish to fight much talk little that is an excellent prescription there is too much of the strain of a coward about you i am no coward maybe you sound like one i sound like one how do i not tell you i will kill her and him you say it but it is only saying she has slapped you across the face it is as if i could see the prints of her fingers flaming on your flesh but you only talk if you are not the coward she takes you for you will let me do with her as i will you will say revenge me lazarus and i promise you that a vengeance you shall have your belly full bianchi came striding towards the fiddler he held out his hands in front of him you think i am afraid to bid you take vengeance on this serpent 
she thinks so that is sure then she lies and you too if you think with her i say to you cast on her the evil eye do with her as you will revenge me lazarus raising his voice he assumed an attitude which seemed intended to suggest that he was putting pressure on his softer impulses so as to enable himself to consign without flinching a creature of iniquity to righteous if radamanthine justice lowering his fiddle his companion tapped him on the shoulder approvingly with the end of the bow so now you play the man i see that you are not altogether the fool that she supposes you can depend upon your lazarus he will forsake you never he will give you as beautiful a revenge as you can possibly desire so beautiful as that my friend and soon so soon as he finds himself within reach of her as he spoke the door opened and maud dorincourt came in he glanced round and seeing her turned again to the musician so it will be sooner even than i thought it will be already now dear friend End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain the singular behaviour of mr lazarus the girl remained standing just inside the door with her hand still on the handle she glanced from one to the other of the two men with on her face a look of laughter noting it seemed with an air of considerable amusement the black looks with which bianchi greeted her she wore pinned to the bosom of her dress a single white rosebud as she stood there raising her right hand she touched it gently with her fingers silence followed her appearance her eyes rested on mr lazarus as if struck by the singularity of his appearance she wondered who he was holding the violin in one hand the bow in the other he remained with his back towards the door glancing at her over his shoulder bending his spine as if it had been made of india rubber the better to enable him to do so without moving from where he was her entrance seemed to inspire bianchi with sudden anger as if he had been some ill-tempered terrier he clenched his fists he ground his teeth his eyes flamed he looked as if he were disposed to spring at her and without any sort of parley assail her with tooth and nail if she noticed the peculiarity of his demeanour she treated it with the sublimest unconcern she dropped a little curtsey half mocking wholly charming i hope gentlemen i do not interrupt you bianchi turned to lazarus like some snarling cur you hear her this is how she comes to me all smiling fresh from her treachery is it to be believed lazarus did not reply his whole attention was occupied in observing the girl it was strange considering how strained was the position he was standing in how motionless he remained maud still regardless of the singularity of his deportment turning to bianchi favoured him with a little curtsey all to himself signor i haven't seen you to speak to since since when not since the great betrayal not since you plighted your cloth is that not what you call it to the english lord no that is so how odd it was not even an hour ago that you were guilty of this great this inconceivable crime you call it odd to me it is still odder that you should come to me so soon with a smile upon your face why mayn't i smile oh you may smile your kind always smile they smile with their lips while with their hands they push men down into hell Shh! she put her finger up to her lips her eyes alive with laughter we are not alone reserve your italian idioms until some other occasion present your friend to me throwing out his arms in a melodramatic gesture 
he broke into a peal of affected boisterous merriment she put her hands up to her ears senor laugh in tune you're all in flats he continued his affected merriment moving his arms up and down as if they had been semaphores she tells me to laugh in tune how is it possible when everything is in discord lazarus he slapped his companion on the shoulder which he managed to do by reaching high above his head for the first time mr lazarus moved he drew himself up straight all in one piece as it were as if he had been moved by clockwork bianchi continued in the same noisy tone of unnatural joviality i am desired lazarus to present you to this lady i have the pleasure miss dorincourt in presenting to you mr lazarus my very good well-trusted friend mr lazarus his arms close to his side still holding the violin and the bow bent not only his head but his body too as if saluting with profound obeisance some great princess while she as if entering into the humour of the thing bestowed on him the profoundest curtsy in return regaining her perpendicular she gazed at him with open candid yet merry glances as if seeking to ascertain whether in his oddity he was serious to which he replied by lifting up the whole of his eyelids pulling them up it almost seemed by a string which was inside his head and meeting her laughing looks with the full glare of his own extraordinary eyes i have much pleasure miss dorincourt in meeting you it is to me a great pleasure indeed either something saturnine which was in his tone or the amazing change in his appearance which was produced by the sudden unveiling of the eyes affected the girl unpleasantly so much was plain her cheeks went a little white she gave a startled movement backwards as if her instinct told her to place herself beyond his reach bianchi commented on her action disagreeably what is the matter with you miss dorincourt are you afraid of lazarus the girl made an evident effort to get the better of her transitory emotion facing him with a mocking smile my good signor bianchi what do you mean by asking if i am afraid of mr lazarus is your friend an ogre that he should inspire with instant terror every one who looks at him i am not an ogre miss dorincourt i give you my word i am just an ordinary kind of man no more than that in spite of his assertion to the contrary when the girl looked half laughingly at him again he affected her as if he had been a very extraordinary kind of man indeed his eyes were opened at their widest as she met them they seemed to act on her as if they had been the eyes of some malignant reptile to hold her disagreeably spellbound it was with an obvious struggle that she wrenched herself free turning away from him as she did so with a movement of unmistakable repulsion again the organist broke into forced discordant laughter why miss dorincourt are you not well or is it that lazarus has the evil eye she bit her lip as if annoyed with herself for having exhibited confusion but she kept her back turned towards mr lazarus and evinced every disposition to keep it turned i had hoped signor bianchi to have tried over a new song with you but since you are engaged some other time will serve it's a kind of a song that's not at all in a hurry lazarus glanced at bianchi this time from under his closed lids then seeing him slow to take the hint he intended to convey himself hurriedly said we are not engaged miss dorincourt believe me we are not at all engaged not in any way at all on which bianchi followed somewhat tardily the other's lead that is so it is quite true we are not at all engaged it is you who are engaged oh yes indeed she evinced no symptoms of a desire to avail herself of their joint assurance it's very good of you to say so but i've changed my mind the song's all gone out of my throat good-bye signor some other time she moved towards the entrance 
i entreat you miss dorincourt not to permit my presence here to alter in you the purpose you have formed as lazarus said this he gave the organist a push behind the girl's back which induced that gentleman to take a position between her and the door you say that you have come here to try your song well i am here i am ready we will try your song but signor is it not permitted to a lady to change her mind ever it is not an affair of being permitted with you you change your mind a hundred times this is one of those times the hundredth perhaps my mind is changed allow me signor to reach the door but this is the folly of a child you are not a baby you say that you have come to try your song and you shall she held herself a little straighter i shall you shall try your song yes i say you shall signor bianchi moved on one side she gave a little imperious and contemptuous movement with her hand meeting him steadily eye to eye he perceptibly wavered in another second would have suffered her to pass but at the critical moment mr lazarus touched her on the shoulder from behind i entreat you miss dorincourt not to deprive me of so great a treat under the light pressure of his finger-tip she seemed to shiver remove your hand from off my shoulder mr lazarus he paid no heed to her request in pity's name miss dorincourt do not dash away the cup which is already at my lips i have heard so often from my good friend bianchi of your beautiful voice that i have dared to hope that i might one day have the extreme felicity of hearing it request your friend signor bianchi not to touch me the organist laughed vacantly it is not for me to give orders to lazarus command him yourself you may be sure he will have the greatest pleasure in doing as you will so far she had remained with her back towards the over-persistent supplicant the tips of his fingers rested lightly on her shoulders but it was as if he had held her in a vice it was apparently with an actual exertion of force that she succeeded in freeing herself from their contact with flushed cheeks she turned to face him sir you presume she was going to add something further something of a distinctly angry tenor but whatever it was it was as if it were dried in her throat encountering the full glare of his horrible eyes she seemed to fall into sudden confusion the flush in her cheeks gave way to pallor she shivered from head to foot as if indifferent to the effect which his glance had upon her he continued in the same half whining half sardonic tone i too am a musician though a very poor one after all music is to me my life i entreat you to permit me to listen to the music of the gods to sing with bianchi here your little song she put her hand up to her face looking this way and that as if she were feeling dazed touched her throat with her fingers as if there were something there which troubled her then with a curiously startled air turned to bianchi since since it would give such pleasure to your friend i i will sing to him this song her voice was not as it was wont to be in it was a muffled cadence as he perceived the sudden change which had taken place in her outward bearing bianchi on his part was evidently taken by surprise and even slightly troubled an expression of doubt came into his black eyes he furtively crossed himself which latter action was at once observed by maud what did you do that for the question seemed to take him completely aback he began to stammer it it is a habit which which i have at, at certain moments of the day as a preservative against the evil eye is it not so bianchi mr lazarus's scornfully bitter accents seemed to lash the organist as if they had been thongs of whips he shrank back abjectly apologetic it is a sign of my faith no more not a jot not a tittle more as you say it is a sign of your faith in a good many things is it not so eh the girl's eyes travelled from one to the other with in them the same dazed look as if seized with a sudden access of sleepiness she could not make out exactly what was happening when she spoke her voice and the words she used pointed to the same queer mental aberration well am i to sing i would rather not i don't think i will something seems to have happened to my voice i don't feel as if i could i i will sing to your friend signor bianchi some other time sing now 
mr lazarus stretching out both his arms touched her with the tips of his fingers lightly on either shoulder looking up at him she met his eyes as she did so all expression seemed to go out of her face she spoke thickly yes i will sing to you now mr lazarus turned to the organist with an air which was half jaunty half malignant and entirely disagreeable come bianchi miss dorincourt will sing to us now play your little accompaniment but the musician's eyes were fixed upon the lady's face he seemed disturbed by what he saw there perhaps it is as miss dorincourt says she is not well enough to sing he threw out his hands with a little burst of natural passion oh why have you been so false to me tell me are you not in a mood to sing paid no heed to lazarus paid no heed to him at all she turned to him with something of the air of a timid doubting child which was in singular contrast to her wonted bearing of impetuous careless laughing disdain she kept touching her throat as if anxiously with her long white fingers as if there still was something there which gave her trouble and she spoke with a hesitancy which was altogether foreign to her nature do to be quite frank with you i don't think that i am in altogether a singing mood there there seems to be something the matter with my throat and my eyes are heavy i don't think that i'm quite well then you shall not sing if you do not want to you shall not i tell you lazarus she shall not sing and i tell you that she shall as he spoke mr lazarus departed very markedly from his bearing of saturnine placidity with one of his contortionist like movements he inclined his body towards where the organist was standing and seizing him with both hands beneath the armpits lifting him clean off his feet he held him out in front of him within a foot of his own face the smaller man was so taken by surprise that he made not the faintest show of resistance and when he found himself confronted by those baleful orbs which seemed to burn themselves right into his brain all latent notions of the sort were stifled at their birth mr lazarus repeated his own observation i tell you that she shall sing he replaced the organist on his feet the little man seemed limply miserable very good if you say it must be so i suppose that it must be his friend tapped him smartly on the shoulder and you will play for her the little accompaniment the signor sighed but acquiesced all the spirit seemed to have departed from him if you will that is a trifle that is nothing i am always ready to accompany her she knows that very well mr lazarus turning towards the girl extending his long tentacle-like arm pointed at her with the index finger the piano is ready for you bianchi waits sing twisting his arm slowly round as if it were some boneless muscle he gradually brought it into line with the instrument which was at his back the girl following the outstretched finger with curious precision until at last it landed her as it were at the piano side mr lazarus then directed his attention to the organist addressing him with considerable irascibility now bianchi how long is miss dorincourt to be kept waiting a eh? do you not see that she attends her your leisure to your seat my friend the musician moved towards the music-stool with a degree of haste which was not dignified as he seated himself upon it he glanced up at the girl who was standing like some lovely automaton at his side and once more the spectacle which she presented appeared to trouble him she was so very still she who never in his life before had he known to continue quiescent for a dozen consecutive seconds the gaiety the buoyancy the joyousness which were the characteristics of the ebullient life youth vigour which were in her veins these things seemed to have wholly disappeared no longer was she impertinent tender bewitching disdainful all in a single breath from her cheeks the colour had faded the light from her eyes the merry curves from about the corners of her mouth her countenance was shrouded with an unwonted gloom a preternatural gravity dullness heaviness she looked half stupefied half imbecile a phlegmatic fool the sight of these things and the reflections they entailed seemed to pain the particular conglomerate 
which the italian called his heart he fidgeted on his seat then throwing out his hands in front of him with the familiar monotonous gesture he reverted to the subject which was uppermost in his mind ah why did you betray me why did you tell me so many lies declaring that your cousin was to you a thing not to be endured and then with perjuries fresh upon your lips to go and promise to be his wife in public holy saints in public i ask you that what have i done that you should make of me a fool without the slightest warning answer me that false one if you can it appeared that she could not or at least she did not instead she put her hand up to her face with the feeble foolish trick she seemed to have suddenly acquired she smiled vacantly as if she were making a fatuous effort to collect her thoughts then she murmured indistinctly as if she had plums in her mouth i don't know what you mean it seems stupid but i feel so strange she looked and sounded strange a stranger coming suddenly upon her might have been excused for imagining that she had had too much to drink rising from his seat stretching himself across the open instrument bianchi began to rain imprecations on his friend what have you done to her with your witchcraft your evil eye your accursed evil eye i have changed my mind i will settle with her for the way in which she has used me myself it is her affair and mine it has nothing to do with any one besides i will not suffer the thing which you would do to her to be done undo it undo it i tell you i will not have it done remove the spell which you have cast upon her and take yourself away far far away or by the living god i will hear you instead of her in face of the other's excitement mr lazarus remained entirely unmoved he merely shrugged his shoulders and said with his habitual smile if anything a little more pronounced than usual play for miss dorincourt her little accompaniment my friend signor bianchi shaking both his fists vociferated in reply i will not i will not i will not play a note for her or for you either not a note mr lazarus came a step forward he lifted his arm as he had done before only this time the index finger was pointed towards the emotional musician and with his arm he raised his eyelids you will play for miss dorincourt my friend at once or i will use you worse than her the italian began to dot himself with crosses mr lazarus smiled not pleasantly they are no use your crosses against me not at all you yourself know that quite well if you do not i will show you now sit down and play signor bianchi sat down he placed his hands upon the keyboard what shall i play he asked what you please any of those beautiful songs which you tell me so often miss dorincourt sings like the angels sing i am content bianchi played the opening bars of a song of mozart's sing that he said but she was still sing it he repeated why do you not sing it you know it very well but yet from her lips there came no sound do you not hear what i say am i to play it again what is the matter with you he looked up at her askance her head was thrown a little back with the fingers she was doing something to her throat pressing it seemed the windpipe a gurgling noise issued from her throat almost as if she was choking on a sudden she spoke uttering with difficulty a few words as if she was being strangled i i can't sing i can't some something's the matter with my voice leaping to his feet the organist snatched up some music books which stood on the piano and with all his force he threw them at his friend mr lazarus drawing himself a little back struck them with his fist so luckily or so dexterously that he drove them full back into the thrower's face bianchi put his hand up with a cry of pain the blood was streaming from his nose you are a fool my friend you tell me again and again and again that miss dorincourt can sing like all the angels it is all fudge your swan is a goose here is the proof you see for yourself she cannot sing a note you are all lie 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 you are a devil gasped the italian his whole attention occupied by his streaming nostrils very good i am a devil i will prove to you that at any rate i have some of a devil's power so saying lazarus went close to the apparently already more than half unconscious girl putting his hands on her two shoulders he twirled her unceremoniously round till she confronted him look at me he said straight in the face 
with rare docility she did as he bade her her eyes turning towards him with a tremulous haste which in its way was pitiful his own eyes were open to their widest limits they were fixed on hers with a concentrated glare which seemed as if it threatened to devour her by its sheer intensity it seemed to hold her motionless even breathless by degrees a singular change began to take place in her appearance the muscles of her face became rigid her jaw dropped a little open her eyeballs turned convulsively round in their sockets leaving little more than the white perceptible in this condition she remained while lazarus for still another minute continued to glare at her with unblinking eyes then he pushed her from him as if she were some senseless thing i think that will do he laughed what have you done to her demanded the musician ask her perhaps she will tell you maud miss dorincourt my angel heart of my life bianchi addressed her warmly thus one hand extended the other holding a handkerchief to his ensanguined nose but she was still standing like some lay figure staring woodenly at mr lazarus's grinning countenance you see she will not speak to you perhaps it is because she no longer desires your acquaintance what is it you have done to her cast on her the evil eye holy virgin it is a little experiment that i have made a little door which i have opened into one of nature's hidden chambers in obedience as it seemed to a movement of his hand the girl turning across the room where is she going to kill my lord of stains it is to carry out the little joke which together we have arranged bianchi broke into a torrent of exclamations she shall not do it she shall not dear god i tell you she shall not do it he made as if to rush across to her lazarus gripped him by the shoulder and i tell you that she shall the girl had paused as if waiting for further instructions again he moved his hand she opened the door bianchi continued to struggle and to scream maud maud dear god heart of my life maud his friend held him as in a vice you are a fool all through it is well i am the stronger or you would spoil all that i have done the girl passed from the room you see she has gone to kill my lord of stains this lovely young lady is the most perfect subject i have ever found a singer a musician is nearly always a good subject it is because they are so sensitive their nervous system is all open the greater the artiste the finer the subject but to have succeeded like this the very first time to have inspired an innocent girl with a desire to kill her lover that is a triumph of science a veritable triumph my dear friend the organist persisted in his efforts to escape from the other's grasp maud maud he cried you fool what a fool you are do you not see it is too late if she has found him he is already dead in an access of playful savagery mr lazarus whirling the little man above his head flung him in a heap into a corner of the room End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain the six dagger it was plain that mrs singleton was in a fever of unrest she went to and fro between miss dorincourt's sitting-room and bedroom doing a dozen things which did not need the doing she was all eyes and ears every sound real or imaginary seemed to make her start now and then stealing softly to the door she stood peering anxiously out into the passage as if waiting and watching for some one who did not who would not come then returning into the room she stood wringing her hands her sweet old face all troubled and disturbed her whole frame shaken by some overmastering emotion i wonder if i'm a wicked woman i wonder if i am i did it for the best the position was so hard all had to be done in an instant there was no time to think just at the instant it seemed so providential if i have done wrong god knows i did it for the best some one came into the room she turned with a little scream it was her husband she hastened to him with a cry of welcome the whole expression of her face a vivid note of interrogation charles have you found her is she coming is she here 
where is she charles her questions tumbled over each other's heels he shook his head she was quick to note the air of depression which marked his entire bearing her voice sank to a whisper charles don't tell me you you haven't found her but i haven't not a trace of her it seems that i have been on a false scent all through but charles where can she be what shall we do he waved his hands in the air one could see as he did so how they trembled as for where she is i haven't the faintest notion i i'm half afraid to think charles as for what we are about to do i'm beginning to fear that we've done more than enough already i wish i'd never set eyes upon that girl upon miss orme she's in the music-room the earl is plighting his troth to her i knew it a pretty state of things this a nice trick we've played on the earl and on the family if anything has happened to miss maud we've made bad worse if the truth does come out i wonder what'll take place then but what can have happened it's only some freak of miss maud's she'll be back directly you know how sensitive i've always been to her presence well i feel her now that she's close by that she's in the air i'm sure of it i shouldn't be surprised at any moment to see her walk into the room when she does come back she'll know we've done it for the best for her sake and and you'll find that she'll be perfectly contented with everything we've done in spite of her ardent desire to speak with perfect confidence there crept into her voice a quaver of doubt which rather diminished the effect she intended to produce her husband plainly insufficiently impressed by her attempt at assurance stood rubbing his chin with dubious hand his honest countenance a chaos of uncertainty i'm sure i hope she will you hope who will what in that hopeless tone of voice my singleton husband and wife seemed to jump nearly out of their shoes as they turned to find mr reginald fanshawe regarding them from the open doorway their conspicuous discomfiture seemed to afford him much amusement really if i did not know you to be the respectable mr and mrs singleton i should have taken you to be conspirators of the deepest dye you look the parts upon my honour he closed the door behind him as he came into the room pray what gunpowder treason and plot are you engaged upon husband and wife eyed each other both were tongue-tied mr fanshawe smilingly stroked his flowing moustache with the long thin fingers of a well-shaped hand must i put you to the torture or will you unburden your conscience without compelling me to have recourse to the question for once in a way the man regained the use of his tongue quicker than the woman the truth is sir i've received some bad news about about a relation and i i was just speaking about it to my wife when you came in mr singleton an unpractised liar lied with difficulty which the handsome gentleman himself a finer practitioner of the gentle art was not slow at perceiving was the relation in question your mother or your mother's mother or your mother's mother's mother mr singleton coughed discreetly well sir it's it's not exactly a relation it's more of a kind of a a connection sir i see it's more a kind of a connection is it the policeman who locked up your great-aunt's second cousin's brother-in-law's grandmother for telling stories i presume i understand you perfectly and am sorry to find you addicted to falsehood mr singleton you may go opening the door mr fanshawe bowed the discomfited singleton through it as if the shamefaced old servant had been some person of high degree when however mrs singleton showed symptoms of following in her husband's footsteps he shut it in her face not quite so quickly mrs singleton if you please 
there are one or two inquiries which i should rather like to make of you i take it for granted that you never vary from the truth like he concluded his sentence by a movement of his thumb towards the door at which insinuation the old lady promptly bridled i am sure my husband is as truthful a person as there is upon this earth and is well known to be such we all of us tell stories now and then sir that's true even i yes sir even you he laughed how fond you have always been of me the pursing of her lips and the stiffness of her bearing did not suggest undue affection now if you'd only been as fond of maud by the way where is maud i'm sure i don't know where miss maud is sir i only know that she is not here just now is that all you know indeed i wonder she moved towards the door will you be so good as to let me pass sir i expect miss maud back every moment and there is something i must do before she comes he showed no sign of budging from where he stood what little game are you up to little game sir what do you mean you know very well what i mean what little game are you up to that sort of thing is more in your way than mine sir i am told that only yesterday you tried to do my young lady a mischief and your own brother too my dear mrs singleton that was the purest accident i had something in my pocket by accident which i left behind by accident and if it made a fuss by accident no one was hurt so there is no one to blame it is no business of mine sir i only say what i've been told and that is not what i've been told will you let me pass or must i ring the bell sir he thrust his hands into his trouser pockets a subtle change took place in the expression of his face which altered it unpleasantly he addressed her with a cool insolence which seemed to suit him better than the tone of studious politeness which he had hitherto employed come you old idiot you don't suppose you can play the fool with me who's that girl out there girl out there what girl the girl who's pretending to be maud dorincourt pretending to be mr reginald what do you mean he eyed her with scornful approbation upon my honour i believe you're a smarter old tabby than i took you for you've taken them in out there you and she between you but there's one person you can't take in and that's me would you mind telling me what you're talking about mr reginald when you try to play the innocent like that and pretend to take me for as big a fool as you are yourself i feel more than half inclined to batter your head against the wall my ancient singleton you had better batter it perhaps i may be for i've done there's still time a little banging might do it good understand me at present my intention's friendly indeed i'm more than half disposed to come in and take a hand myself at the little game you're playing it would amuse me very much to see stain's trick but i should make it a condition of my association that you should let me know what cards you're holding mrs singleton made a little movement with her shoulders she folded her hand resignedly in front of her you are so much cleverer than i am mr reginald you forget i am such a very stupid person i don't in the least know what it is you're talking about perhaps if you will tell miss maud when she comes she will understand you better miss maud there was in his utterance of the name a wealth of contempt which she suffered to go unheeded yes miss maud and here is miss maud sir as the door opened mr fanshawe wheeled round to find madeline confronting him mrs singleton welcomed her advent with evident anxiety which the gentleman had he not turned his back on her would have instantly detected and probably have done his best to score off the old lady's fingers fidgeted nervously with their gown she looked up at madeline with affrighted eyes there was a little stammer in her voice mr reginald was just speaking of you miss maud she emphasized the maud though ever so slightly it is possible that she intended to convey a hint if so it was unnecessary the newcomer was equal to the situation on the instant she came into the room without a word of greeting then facing him with a self-possession which was almost insolent she met his eyes mr reginald does me too much honour 
then in the same breath turning to mrs singleton she presented her back to mr reginald well singleton i'm here again the folks have all gone you do it very well the words came satirically accented from behind she was content to glance over her shoulder towards the speaker are you still there please go after having enjoyed the favour of your attention for half a dozen seconds miss pray what shall i call you she turned to him again sweeping her skirts about her with a little twirl she met his smiling eyes with a smile in hers giving him back something more than scorn for scorn had he been some loathsome thing she could hardly have addressed him with greater contempt i had nothing to say to you i wish you to have nothing to say to me simply go that would be convenient to you no doubt it would hardly be so agreeable to me i am afraid i must have some sort of explanation with you before i do go miss really i wish you would let me know what i ought to call you madeline continued for some moments to meet her unwelcome visitor's glances without showing the faintest symptom of discomposure then completely calm she turned to the anxious woman at her back mrs singleton be so good as to ring the bell just at that moment some one was heard approaching along the corridor stay it may not be necessary the earl of staines appeared at the door conrad i am afraid your brother must have misunderstood me i have asked him more than once to leave my room but he still remains there was silence the two brothers faced each other reginald looking all the better because of the glitter which gave light and fire to his usually expressionless blue eyes the earl's sallow face was a shade darker his square jaw seemed squarer his lips were drawn so close together they seemed unpleasantly thin his tone was icy cold he moved aside as if to make room for the other's passage you hear go there are one or two matters on which i should like to have a settlement with you at the earliest possible moment this moment is hardly convenient my dear staines why do you speak to me in that exceedingly acidulated fashion as if you were endeavouring to cultivate a snuffle i assure you there is no point on which i wish to have a settlement with you so far as a settlement is concerned i really think i am content to leave you in this lady's hands long before she's done with you i am persuaded that for all old scores i shall be able to give you a quittance in full i am inclined to suspect that she's almost a match for me and i am sure that she's much more than a match for you good-bye you turtle doves with a playful wagging of his hand mr reginald took himself away his face all wreathed in smiles so soon as he was gone his brother shut the door then crossed towards madeline was he rude to you she made a little wry face raising her eyebrows daintily he might have been if you hadn't come you just came in time he turned to mrs singleton well you know what has happened have you no congratulations to offer us my future wife and i instantly the old lady was all of a fidget i'm sure i wish you well your lordship knows i wish you well he seemed to notice nothing peculiar about her manner though she could hardly have shown greater signs of disturbance had she been persuaded that with him all would go ill he held out his hand to her she yielding him hers in return after a marked period of hesitation i do know you wish me well i am quite sure of it and you are on safe ground in doing so for something seems to tell me that all is going to be well i thank you mrs singleton for all you have done to maud in the past and i hope and i believe that you will be the same true and constant friend to her in the time which is to come the old lady curtsied almost to the ground she applied her handkerchief to her eyes she struggled as if to speak exhibiting all the signs of mental agitation and distress he turned to madeline probably mistaking the ground of her confusion is there anything for which you need detain mrs ingleton no as madeline caught the dame's agitated glances something which was demurely malicious came into her tone and bearing just at this moment i don't think there's anything for which she need allow herself to be detained 
the old lady began to stutter and stammer are you are you quite sure my dear don't you think that perhaps you'd better avail yourself of this opportunity to to madeline cut her remorselessly short no i don't i don't think anything at all and i'm sure you needn't wait still the old lady seemed to hesitate until the earl crossed the room allow me mrs singleton to open the door for you then in a sudden access of confusion gathering her skirts about her she scurried like a frightened hen through the door which the earl held open he closed it after her with a little laugh mrs singleton seems to be hardly her usual tranquil-minded and motherly self she doesn't does she and you how do you feel i i feel as if i were in a dream from which i fear to be awakened what sort of a dream a happy one yes a happy one i am glad it is a happy one but why should it be like a dream at all it's real enough am i not sufficiently substantial and why should you fear to be awakened what cause is there for fear in my experience of life there's always cause for fear the future has in its hands the promise of fearful things my dear you mustn't talk like that now it cuts me to the heart he was leaning against the table by which she was standing she had picked up a curious-looking dagger apparently of eastern manufacture which she was twisting about in her fingers her eyes possibly unwittingly were looking down at the glittering blade while his with complete consciousness were fixed upon her features maud well there's something which i wish to say to you which i'll have to ask you to forgive me say that you'll forgive me anything yes i will i'll forgive you anything as she said this there was an odd note in her voice almost like an exalting ring which seemed to set his pulses quivering he put out his hand and touched her softly on the arm my love he said and then was for a moment still again what i wish to say to you for which i crave forgiveness in advance is this do you know how much you've changed changed she bent her head still lower how have i changed how that is just the marvel i cannot tell you in so many different ways physically do you mean no not physically and yet i'm not sure i do not know if my eyes are playing me a trick i've been asking myself the question but in some strange inscrutable indefinable fashion you have changed physically even how you have grown he tightened his grasp upon her arm we understand each other now so i may say these sort of things without rebuke you have grown so much more lovely do you think so i'm sure of it physically mentally morally at every point you're lovelier do you remember how untender you used to be did i used to be untender did you it is possible you don't remember never was a woman so transformed during the passage of a single night i'm another woman you are indeed and for once in a way i prefer the new woman to the old the old was true the new is false lift up your eyes look with them into mine she did as he bade her fixing her great violet orbs upon his more commonplace dark ones in hers there was a light a glow a brightness and yet with all a softness too which endowed them with a beauty which was marvellous it was as if he could not see enough of them as if they conveyed to him a sense of ecstasy to which he was unwilling to put a period sweeter eyes were never seen he whispered nor truer is it possible that a woman with such eyes as those is false i think not at least i think she will be true enough for me i would like there was a little break in her voice to be true to you you would like he laughed you shall be can't you be i would like to be again there was that break oh i would like to be putting his arms about her he drew her closer to him till their faces almost touched i love you do you love me i do with all my heart and soul there is nothing i will not do for love of you if god will give me strength their lips met suddenly with a little exclamation he unloosed his hold why you're still holding that dagger do you know you've pricked me with it lady mine by some mischance the point of the dagger which she had put behind her when he took her in his embrace had touched the back of his hand 
the blood was flowing freely she went all white did i do that i'm so sorry it's nothing don't look so concerned it's only a scratch only i do wish that in the matter of playthings your taste wasn't quite so bizarre why for instance you should insist on using that as a paper knife merely because of its being responsible for the deaths of a wagon-load of men women and children is beyond my comprehension what do you mean has this has this killed any one she was holding out the dagger at arm's length in front of her as if the thing were leprous he looked up at her with a glance of surprise of course it has you don't mean to say that you've forgotten why that's the pretty bodkin that a sick trooper ran amuck with at allahabad pinking every one he came across and when he was cornered himself as well by way of a pleasant finish it's odd you should have forgotten considering how you begged it of colonel dauncey as a memento as you put it of a lively five minutes she replaced the weapon on the table with a gesture of shuddering aversion i i'll go and look for something in the other room with which to bind your hand i shan't be long she flitted across the floor into the bedroom beyond he looking after her as if taken aback how very odd what's the matter with her she put it down as if it were something of horror of whose history until that moment she had not the faintest notion and i remember how she worried dauncey into giving it her which i believe he did do just as it was drawn from the unfortunate wretch's body anyhow i know she stipulated that it shouldn't be cleaned or anything and i wouldn't be surprised if the bloodstains are on it to this hour why more than once she's threatened to stick it into me and give the blade another coating as he spoke the door into the corridor was opened and a girl came in he turned to her hallo you've come back that way have you i was just wondering if you'd allow me to dispose of that sick chap's dagger and half a dozen trophies of a similar kind which you possess as i might see fit would it be to ask too much of you just at that moment the bedroom door was opened and madeline about to hasten out hearing him speak glancing about to see whom it was he was addressing saw maud standing at the other door for an instant she was so taken by surprise that she stood as if rooted to the ground then with a tremulous movement she drew back into the room but no sooner had she withdrawn them impressed by a vague suspicion that there had been something singular in maud's bearing and that her appearance on the scene at such a moment was altogether inexplicable urged by an instinct which she could not have diagnosed she reopened the door an inch or two and so remained an unseen witness of all that followed it was plain the earl had not the least idea of the substitution that had taken place when maud received his remarks with perfect silence he looked at her as if surprised and noticed that as he supposed she had on a different frock to the one she had just been wearing but even that only moved him to comment on the rapidity with which she had made the alteration why you've changed your frock how quick you've been that shows what you can do when you like on a future occasion when you take three-quarters of an hour to arrange a hatpin i'll quote that frock against you see what a weapon you've put into my hands but talking of weapons won't you present me with that collection of horrid trifles which we have hoarded i believe out of pure perversity and permit me to signalize our betrothal by giving them the coup de grace they so richly merit i am bound to assert that in my judgment they are hardly the sort of things one would care to live with come lady what do you say the lady in question said nothing she stayed for a moment at the open door in an attitude suggesting a curiously statuesque rigidity then without a word she advanced towards him in an odd jerky undulatory fashion as if her movements were automatic and her limbs actuated by springs as she came he did perceive that there was something singular in her appearance maud what is the matter with you why do you look at me like that maud tell me what is wrong she did not tell him she told him nothing she moved towards him with her strangely distorted features and the whites of her eyes all showing and then straight past to where the dagger was lying on the table she took it up then turned again to him he held out his hand as if supposing that she intended to accede to his request and entrust it to his keeping come that's right give it to me such a gruesome relic will be better in my charge than in yours 
but when he saw the way in which she looked at him or rather the way in which she did not look at him but stared right past him with dreadful glassy eyes he fell back a step maud what has come to you all in an instant what is wrong maud that was the last word he spoke and that was a cry of love she stuck the dagger once the property of that homicidal suicidal sick trooper into his side and without a groan he fell to the floor End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain stabbed to the heart it was all done in an instant without the slightest warning the blow was delivered the weapon driven home the earl lying on the floor before madeline watching through the three or four inches of the open door had the most elementary premonitions of what was about to happen and when it had happened it was a moment or two before she was able to realize what it was that had actually taken place her feeling was one of petrified amazement of sheer stupefaction the most extraordinary of all the extraordinary things which had chanced since her entry into that fateful house had been done before her very eyes so incredible a thing that it seemed her sight her senses or something must have played her false maud's bearing had been so quiet so self-contained so gentle so unassuming so wholly void of any hint of an offensive purpose that it was impossible that out of pure devilry mere wantonness she could have done this thing maud dorincourt the woman in whose image she herself had been so marvellously moulded and yet the man who a moment before had been so full of life and love and hope lay on the floor so still madeline woke with a gasp of horror to the knowledge that this thing was fact and not part and parcel of some hideous dream throwing the door wide open she rushed into the room maud 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 she cried repeating the name again and again what is it you have done but her eyes were not for the woman but the man although he lay there so still it was as though his presence filled the entire room she reached his side bent over him it was dreadful to see him lying there so motionless she called him by his name conrad conrad has she hurt you very much yet he was still her voice died in her throat she called to him again conrad conrad speak to me but he did not speak he continued in that awful quietude it seemed as if her heart was shrivelling up within her her veins running dry her whole nature being changed she did not recognize her own voice when she spoke again maud she screamed maud go and tell them to send some one here go and tell them none replied no one moved she sprang to her feet in a sudden paroxysm of rage driving her finger-nails into the palms of her hands in her insensate fury maud go and tell them to send some one here do you hear me maud she screeched rather than screamed dragging out the name as if it were a polysyllable but again there seemed none that paid her any heed she looked round at her like a thing possessed and for the first time realized that she was alone with it this discovery seemed to restore her after a sort to her senses as if unable to credit the evidence of her own eyesight she looked round and round before she was willing to admit that she was alone the thing was so maud had vanished but where and when and how madeline had not been conscious of her moving she had not seen her go she had supposed her to be still standing on the same spot of ground from which she had struck her victim down madeline had to rub her eyes and to look again before she was actually sure that the room was vacant then on a sudden she thought of the secret door there was the secret of maud's mysterious disappearance through it she had fled irrationally enough the reflection that this was so filled her with a resentment against the girl which was far greater than anything which had gone before to have struck her victim down god or the devil alone knew why was crime enough but to have fled like a coward that to madeline in those first wild chaotic moments seemed to stamp the deed with a brand of blackness worse even than the crime itself she put her hand up to her throbbing temples striving to collect her thoughts 
what was she to do she glanced down again at the silent figure its appalling stillness appealed to her with a sudden overwhelming sense of pathos the tears gushed to her parched eyes falling back upon her knees in the whirlwind of her emotion she would have stooped and kissed him only he was so still he had fallen a little on his right side so that his right arm lay stretched out hopelessly helplessly beside him there was an eerie eloquence in the way in which it was twisted with the palm turned upwards the whole position being suggestive under ordinary circumstances of muscle knotting cramp and extreme discomfort his left arm is under him serving as a lever to place the body still more on the opposite side he was lying stomach downwards in falling his left cheek had been the first to strike the floor so that his left side and his right cheek were uppermost the position giving him the appearance of a twisted neck the more madeline regarded him and the sight judging from her fixed and stony glare seemed to have for her an irresistible fascination the less she liked what she beheld for some cause the long slender blade which had so grim a history had snapped in two the handle lay upon the floor while less than half an inch of steel protruded from his side all about this remnant was a crimson flood which grew larger and larger welling out as if it were being pumped from the man's unconscious heart it was a sight of this increasing stream which moved madeline at last to action for as she glared and stared she began to realize that the man's life-blood was flowing from him while she looked on leaping up rushing to the door she began to shout and call with the full force of her lungs presently people came hastening to her from either side first to arrive was mr singleton puffing along as fast as his stout old legs would carry him he drew up at the sight of her standing shrieking in the doorway what's the matter he demanded the earl she gasped the earl pushing her unceremoniously aside he passed into the room seeing the prostrate figure he rushed towards it with a cry my lord is your lordship ill what has happened what is the matter with you my lord then perceiving the broken dagger in the blood he started back as if he had been struck a heavy blow he's been murdered murdered my god he rushed to madeline shaking as with the ague who did it tell me who did it do you hear who did it seizing her by the wrist he drew her towards him till their faces almost touched she stared at him with apparent lack of recognition he persisted in his inquiry who did it he repeated they were brushed aside by others who came hurrying in men and maids and among them mrs singleton when she beheld the recumbent peer she broke into exclamations as her husband had done echoing him almost word for word his lordship's murdered oh my god who has killed his lordship the members of the household seemed to have lost their senses the men and the women alike they wrung their hands and exclaimed stared and trembled but they did nothing the man whose fate they bemoaned might be dying while they wailed for want of the succour which no one offered the horror of the shock had unhinged their minds old singleton still held madeline by the wrist his wife went to her with his inquiry who killed him who killed him madeline was about to answer when the words froze on her lips a sudden flood of thought came scurrying through her brain if she were to tell the truth what would be the result to maud would they not seek for her high and low break down the outposts of her hiding-place drag her out pillory her in the face of all the world and perhaps hang her in the end despite appearances some inner voice seemed to whisper to madeline that her act was not so heinous as it seemed that something was behind it an explanation which might serve even as an adequate excuse all at once a sense of loyalty towards the girl in whose shoes she actually and literally stood blazed up within her bosom she registered an unspoken resolution that she would not by word or deed betray her until at any rate she had herself been afforded an opportunity to declare the truth so when mrs singleton again pressed her question madeline simply tightened her lips and looked at her with lacklustre eyes her silence however had an unexpected effect the old lady came nearer she searched her countenance with eager inquisitive glances the muscles of her face seemed all to be working at once her voice was low and harsh and husky did you kill him i madeline gasped then the absurdity of this suggestion moved her to incongruous mirth is it likely i should kill him when i loved him so singleton struck in with a common-sense interpolation you love the his lordship don't talk such nonsense how could you when you only saw him for the first time yesterday madeline turned to him with startled looks was it possible that she had only seen him for the first time yesterday 
and that all these things had been crowded within those few hours why it seemed as if these happenings had been the events of years as if she had known him all her life one thing she was sure he would be the central figure in her life henceforward to the end the end why while they dallied chopping phrases the end might already be at hand and they were doing nothing to stall it off she turned passionately on mr singleton why do you do nothing but stand and talk he may not be dead i don't believe he is dead but if he does die and you do nothing his blood will be on your hands on yours suddenly reginald fanshawe came into the room he stood just inside the door looking about him at the agitated servants as if he found their excitement more than a little amusing what is the matter he inquired what is the meaning of this eruption and the noise no one answered but singleton and some of the others moved aside so that he saw the figure on the floor stains he cried going quickly forward he stood looking down at his brother with a puzzled look upon his face as if he could not make out what was the meaning of his lying there so still what has happened stains what has come to you then he saw the broken weapon and the blood his puzzlement seemed to increase who has done this singleton chose to take the question as addressed to himself he began to tremble and to stammer you you must ask you must ask her he motioned with his hands towards madeline reginald following the indication with his eyes her does he mean you who has done it madeline glared at him like a creature distraught her clenched fists held close to her sides why do you ask questions now there will be plenty of time for that he may be dying while you chatter if he does you will have done it you reginald smiled as if the situation was beginning to have for him a psychological interest i see your logic is your own if he dies because i have nothing to do with his death i shall have killed him it's a sort of syllogism but he may be already dead what then kneeling he leant over his brother it's been a workmanlike stroke he picked up the handle which had snapped away from the blade from what i remember of this interesting toy he's been spitted with a good six inches of cold steel it suggests hearty digestion if his stomach's got the better of such a morsel don't you think so cousin she had come close up to him is he dead do you think he's dead you have killed him among you if he is the logician again let's see if the crimson stain is really on our bloodless hands he laid his hand on his brother's side it's odd but his digestive organs do seem to have proved the stronger he breathes why he even moves as he spoke the earl did make a faint attempt at motion which presently became more perceptible he tried to turn reginald was at once on the alert it's all right staines you continue to lie still like a good boy we'll do all the moving that's required the earl's lips twitched as if he were endeavouring to speak and don't chatter there'll be plenty of time for asking questions a little later on the speaker gave a malicious glance towards madeline then turned to the servants now some of you men go and fetch a board an ironing board or something of that sort will be best and move yourselves singleton send someone for a doctor or half a dozen and see that at least one of them is here inside of sixty seconds my dear cousin i'm afraid that the patient will have to be borne into your own bedroom you must forgive me for turning it into a hospital for the time the servants once directed what to do were quick enough in doing it a board was brought and the earl was being carefully carried on it into the adjoining room when lady hildegard appeared her eyes behind her glasses seemed more prominent than ever and her voice more strident what is this that i am told gracious is that stains what is the matter with him reginald turned toward madeline with one of his sweetest smiles you had better ask dear maud maud what is the matter with stains madeline replied through her clenched teeth looking at reginald while replying to lady hildegard he has been stabbed 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 stains the lady hildegard's voice rose in a penetrating crescendo her son put his hand upon her shoulder addressing her with a bland smoothness which seemed to invest his words with a meaning which they themselves did not convey hush my dear mother the time for emotion is not yet presently the doctors came three of them hard on each other's heels there ensued an interval of suspense they made their examination in the inner room while madeline remained alone without and waited still her brain seemed numb what had been done had been done so quickly and had come upon her defenceless unsuspicious unprepared with such overwhelming such hideous force that as yet she was unable to focus the rush of events so as to observe them in their proper sequence while the next act of the tragedy was being enacted behind that closed door she stood helpless hopeless crushed waiting she herself could scarcely say for what presently falling on her knees with bowed head and hands tightly clasped in front of her she began to offer voiceless petitions unto god the effort brought her a measure of relief 
it at any rate enabled her to some extent to disentangle the chaos of her thoughts she prayed for the man who had been brought suddenly so close to death for the woman whose hand had cast him in this plight and for herself it was a formless prayer scarcely logical if only the prayers of the logician prevailed there would be but the outer darkness of despair left for the prayerful as she prayed some one came out of the inner chamber it was mrs singleton as she glanced at the girl upon her knees she started back with an exclamation as of horror what are you doing praying madeline answered with the directness of a child but her reply seemed to fill the other with an added sense of horror in her voice there was a note of repugnance praying you you wicked girl the girl's lovely eyes opened wider as if involuntarily wicked for praying yes for praying that such as you should venture to pray you dreadful creature to dare to mock your maker i had never thought that such wickedness existed i wish i had died before i set eyes on you to be so like my darling and yet to be so different it is you who have brought all this upon us i what have i done you ask me with his blood wet upon your hands his blood wet upon my hands she held out her hands with a simplicity which was again reminiscent of childhood examining them askance as if in expectation of finding on them the vital proof of the other's words there is no blood upon my hands you lie as if goaded to madness by what she judged to be the girl's fictitious appearance of perfect candour with a sudden fury which was altogether foreign to her usual hearing she struck her with her open palm a savage blow upon the cheek madeline reeled all but fell then smoothing with the tips of her fingers the place where the blow had fallen glanced up as if surprise had deprived her of the power of speech at that moment the bedroom door was open a procession issued forth in the front came a tall portly grey-whiskered bald-headed gentleman who advancing towards her with outstretched hands raised her from her knees and addressed her with a degree of emotion which irresistibly recalled the old-fashioned stage father in the presence of his child my dear dear child how i feel for you how i feel that you should have been so visited on this day of all days wonderful are the ways of providence yet we have cause to be thankful great cause madeline perceived that this was a doctor though his manner was unlike that of any member of his profession she had come across will he live she asked the question with bated voice palpitating heart tremulous lips yearning eyes which signs of emotion he noted with a benignant smile which seemed to cover the whole of his countenance he patted her hand which he retained in his with a mixture of gallantry and jocularity which on the whole became him tolerably well he will i hope and believe for many many years you have no cause for fear my dear young lady none at all had the weapon deviated from its present course had it moved a hair's breadth to one side the result might have been fatal we should have found ourselves once more in the presence of the great mystery but as it is i think i may venture to pledge my professional reputation that no evil results will follow that is if he receives proper attention which he of course will do and is not allowed to exert himself unduly if our patient is only reasonable which i am sure his lordship will be all will be well you have much cause for thankfulness my dear young lady she has the echo came from mr reginald and conveyed a volume of meaning which the physician ignored as it seemed almost ostentatiously he continued to regard the girl with the same benevolent smile his lordship wishes to see you as is only natural she moved a little back to see me yes alone alone her face went white his expression never changed he stipulates to see you alone as again is only natural if you do not remain too long and do not let him become agitated and above all do not allow him to move there is no reason why he should not be allowed to have his way he expresses himself upon the point with such vehemence that it will probably be more prudent to concede his wish than to risk the agitation which would result from an attempt to balk it so my dear young lady with your permission we will not keep him waiting any longer i'll be bound that your impatience is as great as his own before she realized the full drift of his proposal or could offer any sort of expostulation the doctor had slipped her arm through his and was leading her towards the bedroom as he opened the door she passed inside closing it behind her he left her standing just within the threshold of the room a voice came to her from the bed the voice which she knew so well the sound of it set her heart in a tremor who is there it is i come closer she went closer her knees seeming to shake beneath her as she moved 
she felt each moment as if her limbs would refuse to perform their office of holding her upright a face regarded her from the pillow she knew although for some cause she could not look at it that it was white and worn and wearied as if it had been overtaken on a sudden by age and suffering and perhaps disillusionment the eyes were fixed unblinkingly upon her features while hers were cast down as if affrightedly there was silence and in the silence a flood of thought swept over her she thought of the false position in which she stood of what she really was and of what she was pretending to be of the impudent imposture she personified abashed ashamed she stood like some conscience-stricken wretch who stands self-condemned at the bar of justice the stillness was interrupted by his question what did you do it for she started making a frenzied effort to collect herself she was conscious that he could hardly have grasped the true inwardness of the situation then she remembered to what his inquiry actually referred i did not do it maud the tone in which the name was uttered was half supplicatory half accusatory words rushed to her lips but did not pass them she would have given much to have been able to say she was not maud but she could not why is it necessary to lie to me do you think i did not see you do it do what she passed her hand across her brow dazedly his tone changed it became bitter have you forgotten that i saw you try to drive your dagger to my heart do you suppose i am stone blind or is it on my stupidity you count why did you resort to such a drastic measure was it because i permitted myself to suggest that the dagger should be entrusted to my keeping that it was a little out of place among a lady's bric-a-brac if so don't you think that the punishment was almost greater than the crime i did not do it why do you lie to me why do you lie i am not lying he half rose in bed she recalled the doctor's warning don't move you are not to move the doctor says you are to lie still why for your health's sake you may do yourself an injury if you are not careful the doctor only let me come in on condition that i did not let you move his features were distorted by a smile i hope for the sake of human nature that you are the most amazing example of hypocrisy the earth has seen for you to feign solicitude for my health after what has passed betrays a love of make-believe which is beyond my comprehension all your life you have played with me knowing how i have hungered for you you have made of me a jest until at last i suppose in sheer wantonness you thought you would let me see how desirable a creature you indeed could be and then when you had intoxicated me with sudden undreamed-of happiness you chose that very moment to slip off the mask and my god to try to butcher me is it because the stroke did not go right home that you're once more at the game of pretense she stood with her face half turned aside from him lacing and unlacing the fingers of her two hands with feverish energy her voice was husky she spoke beneath her breath i did not do it don't lie to me tell me why you did it let me try to understand the reason which was present in your mind so that for once in our lives we may if possible see eye to eye but don't add to your sin the sin of all the sins child tell me why you did it i did not do it are you stark mad or do you really believe that i am is not the feel of your blade still in my side how long ago is it since i saw it darting at me in your hand i did not do it with what a nausea the sight of me must fill you with what a sense of hatred that you should persist in such a lie at such a time with such an air you give me the key i'm seeking for it's plain i must be to you a thing of unutterable loathing if because of me you make of yourself so poor a figure good my life's to me a little worth it's in my brother's way and if it's so much in yours i'll put to it a point i've but to tear away these bandages and it'll be a case of suicide instead of murder so all of us will be contented sitting up in bed a position which he attained with difficulty he began to loosen the bandages which were about his waist rushing to him throwing herself on her knees at the bedside she caught his wrists with both her hands don't don't you don't know what you are saying it's all a mistake i love you i would die for you at this moment you would die for me yes having killed me first but i will save you from that predicament by making certain of a verdict of phalo de se 
he continued to fumble with nervous hands at the linen binding showing in his purpose a resolution which appalled her she broke into shrieks don't don't help help she cried End of chapter 14chapter fifteen of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain put to the question help arrived upon the scene in time to prevent the earl from carrying out his design in its entirety but too late to stop him from doing himself serious mischief indeed the physician who dealt in platitudes was so far removed to bluntness as to declare that he had probably done himself more injury than he had received from the weapon for this madeline was made to feel by their bearing glances and innuendos that she again was held responsible mrs singleton put it plainly in the midst of the first confusion she drew the girl aside you'd better go now while there still is time madeline looked at her askance i don't understand you this irate viperish old lady was quite a different being from the sweet-faced soft-spoken person madeline had hitherto known she began sotto voce to abuse the girl with the volubility of a fish-wife you wicked creature to keep on pretending in such a way first you try to kill him then you try to make him kill himself him the best and kindest gentleman that ever lived whose shoes you're not fit to wipe hanging would be too good for you and it's hung you'll be if you don't take care if it wasn't that i'm to blame for giving you an opportunity to show what a dreadful wretch you really are i'd denounce you on the spot but as it is i'll give you a chance to save your skin so take to your heels while yet you may and take yourself outside the house i wish to heaven you'd never darkened its doors is it possible that you are under the impression that it was i who attacked the earl of staines mrs singleton held out her hands with what was meant for eloquent protest hark at her to listen and to look at her one would think that she was the best and greatest lady in the land instead of being what she is it's no wonder she's imposed on every soul in the house it's my belief she'd impose upon an angel the old lady's vituperation acted on madeline like a cold douche drawing herself upright she resumed her natural dignity of bearing confronting her assailant with a quiet self-assertion and conscious rectitude which took the other aback not for the first time mrs singleton we misunderstand each other you brought me here to play the part of an unwilling puppet because it was your whim since i was so weak and foolish as to allow myself to fill the part which you propose you imagine that there is no depth to which i cannot sink that i can first stoop to murder and then be willing to snatch at a chance to run away as you put it to save my skin in at least the latter supposition i will prove that you are wrong there was a time when i was willing enough to go then you wouldn't let me now i am unwilling with or without your approbation i propose to stay in order to show you that i am not the kind of person you apparently imagine me to be she walked into the other room with her head in the air leaving mrs singleton to stare after her open-eyed later there was held a sort of informal court of inquiry there was present the dowager countess who on being informed of what had chanced to her grandson had insisted on straightway going to see him demanding of him point-blank who was responsible for placing him where he was on this point the earl with perfect courtesy declined to give her any enlightenment whereat the old lady turned raging on all about her and now sat bent double in an armchair her chin between the two sticks on which she had propped her hands all agog to learn the why and wherefore of his lordship's indisposition by her stood the lady hildegarde her eyes flashing behind her spectacles like two live notes of interrogation at one side sometimes sat but oftener stood mr reginald fanshawe he conducted the examination in chief 
assuming the whole management of the case and endeavouring as it were to turn darkness into light with him was a tall slightly built gentleman who had an air of such excessive youth as to cause one to begin by suspecting its authenticity and end by believing him to be at least the co-equal in years of any person present not even excepting the dowager mrs singleton hovered somewhere in the rear and now and then mr singleton made his presence rather felt than seen before them all stood madeline the one person on whom all eyes were fixed redknold addressing her with that sort of jocularity which is felt to be and is meant to be insolence in its most insidious form my dear cousin we are actuated by two desires one is to avoid scandal and the other is to have some notion of whereabouts we are staines declines to give us any information so we are obliged to come to you we know that you can tell us all about it and we are quite sure you will i in particular am sure allow me to introduce to you mr augustus champnell a very old friend of mine the excessively young-looking gentleman with about him the indescribable suggestion of age bowed madeline treated him to a frigid movement of her head which scarcely amounted to a nod he is a gentleman in whom you can place perfect confidence and used to bear a part in delicate affairs i ventured to ask him to favour us with his company on this occasion in the assurance that he will act as the friend of all the parties now to begin i believe that you were present when staines met with his accident madeline was silent while they waited for her answer she was standing her right foot a little advanced her arms hanging straight down at her sides her head held a little back perfectly self-possessed in front of the battery of their glances her cheeks were a little white her lips were compressed there was a slight distension of the pupils of her beautiful eyes these were the only signs of mental disturbance she betrayed she did not look at mr fanshawe while he was speaking but when he ceased she turned to him with something in her expression which was more than a trifle contemptuous her voice was low and clear at present i can give you no information my dear cousin at present what are we to understand by that my meaning is quite clear but how long is your at present likely to continue when will you be willing to give us the information we require very soon it may not be necessary for me to give it you at all you will probably be able to learn all you wish to know from other sources you are enigmatic but in the meantime you can have no possible objection to telling us whether you were present when the accident occurred i decline to tell you anything at all don't you see that by your refusal you are placing yourself in a very invidious position that you are compelling us to draw conclusions which are hardly to your advantage i am indifferent to any conclusions you may draw her emphasis on you was pointed that is very good of you my dear cousin the meaning of the stress which in his turn he laid on cousin she understood perfectly well still i fancy you scarcely realize the serious position in which you may be placing yourself when people have accidents with daggers the law is apt to have a disagreeable knack of asking questions to which it is well to be prepared with answers her lip curled i am not a child my dear cousin that is the last thing of which we should dream of accusing you it is because we know you to be so fully equipped with all the discretion of age that we make our appeal with so much confidence the dowager's grating tones interposed she had kept her gleaming eyes fixed on the girl unblinkingly look at me girl madeline turned towards her they faced each other youth and age did you stab him i did not the answer came direct and instant producing an evident sensation as though each one who heard it had been taken by surprise did he stab himself he did not again the reply was prompt then who stabbed him this time there was a momentary pause not apparently so much of hesitation as for consideration that i decline to tell you do you mean that you can't or won't i won't the refusal though blunt enough was not by any means uttered with an air of defiance it was spoken unfalteringly 
rather as if the speaker had arrived without fear or favour at a final resolution after due consideration the dowager continued to eye her for a second or two then turned to mrs singleton who was hovering about in a conspicuous state of fidgets singleton who stabbed him plainly taken aback by this sudden address mrs singleton's fidgets perceptibly increased she rubbed her hands feverishly together she shuffled from foot to foot my lady i can't tell you do you mean that you can't or you won't i'll have no nonsense with you answer me my lady i don't know what do you know my lady i know nothing don't lie to me my lady is quite true singleton was in the room before i was singleton where's singleton singleton was in the background and now came to the front not looking by any means at his ease singleton who stabbed the earl my lady all i know about the matter is that i heard there was an obvious pause then he committed himself miss maud calling for help and when i got to her she was standing at the door and his lordship was on the ground was any one else in the room i saw no one did any one pass you as you went to it no my lady did any one leave it after you were in not to my knowledge what did miss maud say when you reached her singleton reflected i believe she said the earl as if she was frightened i went into the room and i saw what had happened and i asked her who had done it then what did she say she said nothing she made no reply is that all you know yes that is all i know i don't believe you don't flatter yourself i do i believe you and your wife could tell us more if it suited you you've made a practice of deceiving me for years i am quite aware of it i may have something to say to you later now leave the room the pair of you they left the room with a crestfallen air singleton tried to bear himself bravely and he succeeded better than his wife but still looked very far from happy when they were gone the dowager returned to madeline come here girl the girl went close up to the old lady's armchair looking down at the hawk-like eyes which gleamed up at hers with an air which if a little troubled was still fearless and even a trifle scornful answer me again and think before you speak did you stab stains i did not you swear it i say that i did not if you will not believe my plain assertion you are hardly likely to do so merely because i supplemented with an oath that's true enough the old lady seemed to be turning something over in her mind was it an accident were you two engaged in some tomfoolery or other and was it done between you is that the explanation of what you're trying to turn into a mystery madeline reflected in her turn i cannot tell you then in heaven's name what can you tell me what can any one tell me here's stains tongue-tied and you'll say nothing is murder to be nearly done and are you to keep it to yourselves come girl be honest i've come to feel for you all at once what i have thought that i should never feel when one has had no feelings all one's life at my age they're not apt to grow into sudden being but something seems to have come into your face to have come all over you which has moved me with a new sensation with a desire to be on terms with you so tell me plainly like an honest woman did you try to kill him frankness will be better for you in the end he's not going to die so you need have no fear of what will follow i have no fear so far from trying to kill him i would have given my life for his and would do so now either you lie like truth or your truth is very like a lie here are you two in a room alone together he is stabbed you say you did not do it nor he how then came the thing about madeline was silent this sudden fondness which you feign for him is suspicious after the way you've used him all these years again madeline was silent did you quarrel no do you still pretend you care for him i love him though the girl's face and neck were crimson there was nothing about her bearing which suggested that she was in any way ashamed indeed as she withstood the hot fire of the old woman's shrewd questioning she seemed to carry herself with an added pride you love him since when since yesterday it's a sudden growth yes it is a sudden growth and will die as suddenly it will not die think her you have blown cold and now blow hot yet you dare say that 
i shall not change but you have changed madeline was silent the dowager was also still seeming to be endeavouring to read with her unblinking eyes the girl's face as if it were a printed page you're a lovely jade whatever else you are and in some queer way the devil looks as if it had gone out of you and the soul of goodness come instead or my eyes are playing me a trick for the first time since i've had them well a girl's a weathercock and it's all the better if the wind has blown you round towards loving him though you need not try to kill him to show your love madeline held her peace which did not content the dowager why did you try to kill him i did not tell that for a tale you've lied to me too often for me not to know it's not a trifle that would choke you however if staines is content and it seems by his talk as if he were it's your affair and his and there's many a marriage has had quite as queer an introduction as the lady sticking a knife into the gentleman mr fanshawe who had been listening with a smile of almost too obvious amusement to the dialogue between the old woman and the young one now moved a step forward caressing his moustache as he spoke permit me for one moment to make a suggestion i think it is just possible that i have hit upon the key to the mystery his grandmother did not receive his interpolation with any show of geniality it's no affair of yours that i know of though it would be against nature to expect you to keep your fingers out of other people's pies he assumed an appearance of pain no affair of mine when my brother lies suffering from a felon blow the old lady stared at him in silence for a second then uttered an exclamation expressive of profound contempt do you think to take me in with such talk as that you to pray to felon blows and your brother why man if you are a man which sometimes i misdoubt you've spent your life in striking felon blows and most of them against your brother the only thing for which you are grieving is that he isn't dead instead of being all the better for a little letting of blood mr fanshawe placed himself in an attitude which he possibly intended to be expressive of injured innocence it is not the first time i have been misjudged i fear it may not be the last but no amount of injustice will cause me to deviate from what i believe to be my duty and my duty constrains me to say that i quite believe that this lady had no hand in placing stains in the condition in which he is what do you mean by that the gentleman addressed himself to madeline with a courteous inclination of his head shall i explain or will you the girl met his mocking glances with unflinching eyes i am indifferent to what you do or say you are at least a lady of infinite courage and you are a man of none of a calibre so unusual that against my better judgment almost you have me on your side the fates forfend that the almost ever may be quite he went closer to her speaking hurriedly beneath his breath which is it to be say quickly friends or foes she stretched out her arm as if to ward him from her foes foes always foes he bowed mockingly good the cast is against you of your throwing not mine the dowager ruthlessly interposed what is all this rubbish talk between you two come man out with what you have to say as straight as your crooked tongue will let you my dear grandmother you always pay me compliments one more or less makes little odds speak man speak or follow singleton a little of you soon tires the fashion in which the gentleman kept his countenance under what some might have felt to be trying circumstances did him credit he pointed the old woman's plain language with another bow i merely wish to observe that your ladyship has been made the victim of as ingenious and also as impudent a conspiracy as ever yet i heard of who is at the bottom of it i don't as yet quite fathom though i have my suspicions i never knew you when you hadn't and i have mine of you it is very good of you to say so but that at this moment is not the point it is with me will your ladyship permit me to explain explain man explain you keep on explaining and never reach the explanation with your permission i will reach it now this lady mr champnell suddenly advanced excuse me fanshawe but were i you i would allow the lady to be her own spokeswoman you have heard me offer her the opportunity which she refused i will give her the choice again he turned to madeline will you speak or shall i at your bidding i will not say one word it is not a question of my bidding one of us must speak the question is whether it shall be you or i that is not the question you must understand that i know you and i know you 
you mistake i am not sufficiently contemptible to come within your ken at least you are more than sufficiently brazen-faced the girl quivered she bit her lip mr champnell put his hand on the speaker's shoulder come fanshawe you must not speak like that i think that after all it may be you who are mistaken there are one or two things of which i should like to speak to you if you can spare a minute if you will give the lady time for consideration unless i am in error she will herself say all that is requisite and say it better than you could i have given her time enough already and more than enough give her a little more come fanshawe he slipped his arm through reginald's with an airy certainty of manner as if the matter was signed sealed and settled mr fanshawe turned on him with a sort of snarl champnell he looked and sounded as if he would have liked to say more of a forceful kind but perhaps something which he saw in his friend's eyes they were at such close quarters they could not but see each other very clearly induced him to change his mind a perceptible alteration did take place in his demeanour he assumed a sudden air of entire acquiescence come said mr champnell and without another word the two gentlemen went mr champnell holding the door open to allow his friend to pass out so soon as their backs were turned the dowager with a curiously mirthless grin looked at the girl who still was standing in front of her well young woman what's the meaning of the little comedy what is the mystery that's in the air which is the thread that unravels this skein madeline was silent she did not seem to have recovered from the home thrust which reginald had dealt her lips kept quivering and her eyes were dim which things the keen-sighted old woman noted what ails you girl that all at once you're puling those who use their claws must look for scratches that's a kind of game at which a woman is likely to be worsted play she never so shrewdly i know it well there was a new note of bitterness in madeline's voice the dowager continued to concentrate her gaze on her the uncannily gleaming eyes seeming as if they would pierce her through it was some moments before she spoke again you've changed my lass more than a snake that's new cast its skin it's queer as our dear reginald says there's a mystery in the air of which if i were you i'd be rid as quickly as you can i will i do mysteries another game at which in the end a woman seldom scores be off and when i see you again let there be a clearance of the air i'm too old to be able to breathe at my ease in fogs madeline thus unceremoniously dismissed went away feeling much like a dog might feel which carries its tail between its legs she was conscious of a sense of humiliation which stung she was aware that she was suspected by some of an attempt upon the earl's life and by others was known to be guilty of something which she realized might be easily held to be worse never in her most sordid moments of privation and of poverty had she conceived it possible that she could have sunk to such a depth as this wherever she looked she saw herself confronted by exposure punishment shame a threatening brand of infamy which should so mark her that all who ran might read and which nothing could erase as a fitting crown and climax the man she loved loved god help her that such as she should dare to love the man she loved was fully persuaded that it was her hand which had endeavoured to take away his life and was being watched and guarded lest in the fullness of his persuasion he did his best to end what he supposed her to have left unfinished what thoughts he must be thinking of her as he lay there brought so suddenly and so foully low by the woman as he conceived who in the same instant had been breathing to him vows of love she writhed with shame and agony at the mere contemplation of the picture conjured up by her own imagination oppressed by such reflections she entered the room on the other side of which he lay and in which so much and such fateful history had been made in so short a time scarcely had she crossed the threshold and was looking about her with dull pain-worn eyes than the wall on the opposite side seemed to start clean open and out of its very thickness as it appeared some one sprang it was maud dorincourt end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain a declaration of innocence she had a roll of music in one hand as she came out of her hiding-place 
she glanced quickly around her at sight of madeline she drew a little back laughing softly you from where have you sprung i thought no one was here maud's sudden appearance had taken madeline unawares her thoughts had been occupied upon such widely different themes that it gave her a sense of shock and as she noted the young lady's light-hearted bearing her careless tones her merry laughter some dissonant note seemed struck within her own brain which almost stunned her putting her hand up to her brow she gazed at the other stupidly speaking as though there was an impediment in her speech i've only just come in this moment maud came hurrying across the room waving her roll of music in the air why sister mine what a sober face you wear are you tired of playing at being me that you look as if you were borne down by all the troubles of the universe and you've only been at it for a dozen hours think of what i've endured as the occupant during all the long passage of the years of the birth of which already you have wearied and take pity dear madeline gasped she felt as if all evidence to the contrary apart that she must be dreaming that this girl who chattered like some volatile light-hearted child who had never known what it meant to come into contact with the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil could be the creature who so short a time ago had perpetrated so dastardly a crime seemed indeed to be incredible it was to madeline as if the foundations of the world were giving way beneath her maud how can you talk like that why my dearest i take it it is because i was built that way but how can you talk like that i hope it's not for the same reason because you remind me of nothing so much as the lady in the melodramas who never opens her lips without a clutch at her throat and a gasp madeline imitated the action of which maud spoke with such derision she put her hand up to her throat and gasped maud don't i must speak to you i must well my sweetest must and so you shall let's go to the music-room that's where i hold all my tete-a-tetes just now i'm going to pour out my soul in song which at this moment is attuned to sacred numbers see she flashed a sheet of music before madeline's startled eyes i know that my redeemer liveth that's a song for you when sung and you shall hear me sing it brandishing in the air the melody the words of which madeline had learned to associate with her most hallowed memories throwing the door wide open maud ran out into the corridor for the second time madeline followed her guidance to the music-room again without meeting any one upon the way once inside maud scampered across the floor humming some gay air in the gallery she would have immediately begun to sing had not madeline stayed her maud i must speak to you before you sing i must then my pet speak on maud why did you do it madeline's voice sank to a whisper which whether she would or would not was uncomfortably tremulous to her the question was big with the fate of rome the other however ignored her earnestness altogether treating her inquiry with a rattle of frivolity because the spirit moved me i suppose but what serves me as the spirit though as a rule it's wisest not to ask me why i do a thing because i never know i do it and it's done for me that's enough and sometimes more after the event i have occasionally asked myself why i did a thing and wished i hadn't but never under any circumstances have i burdened myself with such a useless inquiry before any other information can be had while you wait maud madeline why did you do it my poor child how exceedingly how deplorably grave we are is it indigestion or is it because you've had too much of stains in the latter case even an exaggerated gravity is only to be expected i who speak i have been there how can you talk of him like that my gracious how would you have me talk of him as the emperor of fee fo fum or as the sultan of rum titum after trying to murder him that's nothing i have been trying to try to murder him since the day when first we met in an amateurish dilettante sort of way but the mischief is that i've never got beyond the trying as a more level-headed person might would and should have done you call it nothing to try to stab him to the heart well perhaps that hardly does deserve to be called nothing it is an appreciable sort of quantity when you come to think of it 
you wicked girl you are the most wicked person i ever heard of your wickedness is beyond anything of which i ever dreamed madeline had flared into sudden passion and moving a step or two away glared at the other with flaming eyes and heaving bosom maud plainly taken aback by the sudden outburst stared at her as if she were some curiosity which she was encountering for the first time my goodness gracious am i really how nice it must be to have come upon a unique specimen at last you laugh at me and jibe and jeer with blood upon your hands maud repeated madeline's own gesture when accused by mrs singleton she held out her hands in front of her turning them over and over regarding them askance blood upon my hands on the inside or the out it is not possible that you can be human you must be something of evil in a woman's shape since you can persist in making a mock of such a dastard crime maud rested her hands on the little shelf against which she was leaning smoothing out the sheet of music with her fingers and glancing quizzically at madeline as if she suspected her of playing a part the meaning of which she was trying to unriddle my dear dear twin sister what a state you must be in it must be cucumbers if it isn't stains let us sing or rather let me sing i know that my redeemer liveth it will help to clear the air and believe me it needs some clearing not that song at any rate you shall not sing that song indeed why not what's the matter with the song you to sing that you know that your redeemer liveth you with the stain of murder on your soul of which you make a jest maud folding her hands in front of her turned towards the speaker with an air of patient resignation my sweetest madeline are you mad you must suppose i am or you would not treat me as if i were another fool even you can hardly seriously expect the third party to regard your act in the same jocular light in which it seems to appear to you maud turned still more towards madeline and she sighed there seems to be some method in your madness if you're really mad there appears to be some haunting impression in your mind that i've done something in the name of all that is fortuitous what have i done you ask me that you it is plain that as i say you regard me as a fool and perhaps what you have seen of me warrants your estimate but there is a point at which even my folly stops and that point is there was silence maud her hands gracefully clasped together regarded the other with a pleasant smile which seemed to drive madeline almost to the verge of imbecility her breath came in short gusts her fists clenched and unclenched it seemed that it was an effort she kept herself from assailing her smiling double with actual violence i believe you are a devil maud's smile grew rather more than less how like me you are even when you're in a rage it's really most remarkable but why devil madeline threw out her arms with a movement of dismissal so be it it will come back to you in the end you may laugh now but you will weep before you've done i've been charged with your sin i'm not sure that i've not been threatened with the police mrs singleton would chase me from the house into which she dragged me even he thinks that it was i who struck him if you have decided that so far as you are able i am to bear the weight of your offence god help us both yours will be the greater punishment after all for you cannot cheat god even if you succeed in cheating man whatever comes i shall have the satisfaction of knowing that as you know that in this matter at least my conscience is clean as are my hands she stretched out her hands with a touch of sudden pathos and turned to go maud watched her as she went when she had gone a step or two she called to her madeline the girl stopping looked around well i really begin to think that after all you are in earnest you must forgive me for laughing at you because you speak in such a very dramatic way but i don't understand you child you forget that i have been shut up in my dungeon tower and know nothing of what has been passing in the world below what mysterious thing has happened and what deed do you suppose me to have done of such a very dreadful kind again madeline's eyes began to blaze why do you talk to me like that why do you i won't laugh at you again at least i'll try not to though you don't know what a tempting object you seem to me to be evidently something very curious is in the air which at present is quite beyond my comprehension please tell me as plainly and also as calmly as you can 
of what in your judgment i stand accused you stand accused accused how long is it since you tried to stab your cousin to the heart i tried to stab my cousin to the heart madeline you must be mad i'd rather be mad ten thousand times than such a thing as you he lies there with the wound in his side into which you drove that dreadful knife and he thinks i did it that i came to him with his kisses fresh upon my lips with them all aflame with burning words of love and tried to take his life and you who did it you stand here and laugh at me pretending you don't understand god's curse will light upon this wicked house would that i had died before i had ever seen it for since i knew it yesterday i seem to have entered into the inner chambers of sin and to have been drawn into the very gates of hell madden i thought i was feather-brained but you go beyond me altogether you don't know what you're saying or if you do i don't has there been really someone stabbed you pretend again to ply me with your questions past mistress of dissimulation yes there really has been some one stabbed it and by you by you by you i suppose that now you will deny it was by you if you are making such an accusation in earnest which i find it hard to credit if you are sane i do deny it altogether so it is as i imagined and you do propose to shuffle away from the consequences of this thing which you have done under cover of a lie but perhaps you are not aware that i saw you do it you saw me stab my cousin i was standing at the open bedroom door and was just returning into the room in which i had left the earl of staines when you came in when i came in i heard him speak to you and you returned no answer he thought you were me and spoke of how quick i had been as he supposed in changing my frock and you were careful not to undeceive him i saw you take the dagger from the table and him hold out his hand for it and how you drove it with all your force into his side perhaps as you say you were not aware that there was a witness of all you did as madeline continued to speak the envenomed words pouring from her lips as if they were so many missiles which she was hurling at the other the fashion of maud's countenance began to change it commenced to assume a look of odd vacuity the light faded from her eyes the expression from her features when madeline ceased she looked about her with an air of unpleasantly strenuous attention as if her faculty of hearing were strained to the utmost what was that duncan's funeral knell wasn't it some one calling if so it was the voice which called to cain maud putting her hands up to her face as if to veil her eyes began to shiver as with a paroxysm of sudden cold she moved closer to the other's side madeline where are you don't leave me i'm feeling so afraid at last what do you mean by at last it is so strange i cannot explain but i seem to have gone through all this before i don't know when it's as though i had woke out of a kind of nightmare still acting is it because you're an actress through and through only an actress nothing real why do you speak to me so cruelly what is your standard of cruelty don't you think it was cruel to drive that knife into your cousin's side maud looked at her askance it was plain that that wave of curious emotion was passing over her she drew herself up with a little movement of disdain i believe you are mad whether this queer tale of yours about someone being stabbed is or is not a pure invention i cannot say in any case i am not interested you know all the world knows that i am indifferent to whatever it may concern my cousin staines if he has had an accident that is his affair and if you like to make it so yours cry over him if it pleases you to your heart's content but don't plague me with your melodramatic posing suppose i go from here to the police denouncing you for murder what then you rave it is not your fault if it was not actual murder you did your best to drive the knife well home my queer creature i'm beginning to think that after all you cannot be so very much like me i don't believe i ever drivel i'm not at all like you thank god maud shrugged her shoulders no doubt you have something to be thankful for only do go and be thankful somewhere else and let me sing you shall sing in a moment if you dare and god will let you only let me understand you clearly before i go is it your unalterable determination that so far as you're concerned i am to be made to bear the brunt of your offending that in other words you intend to take advantage of the superficial likeness which exists between us to give the world to understand that what you did was done by me that the innocent is guilty and the guilty innocent look here madeline to descend to the vernacular i believe you're cracked 
when i first set eyes on you i was ready to jump out of my shoes with joy i took you in my arms i am willing to take you in them again this moment though you do seem to be turning out to be nothing but a bundle of prickles what be you have in your bonnet i haven't the faintest notion or whether you're subject to delusions but if staines has been stabbed and saving your presence the bare suggestion seems to smell of the sacred lamp i can only say it wasn't i who stabbed him i'm no stabber and haven't had the slightest inclination to enter that line of business since i saw you last you appear to continually forget that i saw you do it you carry yourself with such an air of honesty that you begin to impose on me until i remind myself that i did see you with my own eyes then my dear girl you must have been seeing double why i haven't seen the man for a week or more as i live it's true i'll swear it to you in half a dozen languages if it will give you any sort of satisfaction it gives me no satisfaction to hear you perjure yourself you stand there like a radamantine judge with a poker down your back what a female brutish you would make unfortunately it's the humour of the situation which appeals to me because the sure fact is that if you did see what you thought you saw there must be visions about and it was my wraith which made itself visible to you in that singularly ostentatious fashion the puzzle is why you should wish to lie to me i can understand why you might wish to lie to others but why to me it makes no difference you know i saw you and i know i saw you to persist in a denial of the plain fact when we are quite alone together seems to me pushing deception to an unnecessary length my most charming madeline what do you wish me to do or say do you wish me to go to staines and observe my dear boy i felt like stabbing you over and over again and now i've done it or my wraith has and if you'd like to have a prod at me to make things even why you're welcome is that what you want me to do if it is i've half a mind to do it right straight away just for the sake of smoothing out your ruffled feelings madeline was still she was examining the girl in front of her noting the careless air of frankness with which she spoke to suppose it false suggested almost supernatural powers of duplicity her own assurance wavered she began to wonder if it was not possible that she might have been guilty of an injustice after all if her eyes in some inexplicable fashion had not been playing her a trick even a momentary doubt occurred to her as to whether there might not be something in the girl's wild words and if as she put it it was her wraith which she had seen she was conscious of an overmastering desire to reach to the bottom of this strange business to ascertain how much was true and how much was false about this being of wondrous loveliness she looked all innocence was it possible that beneath that garb of purity was a monster of iniquity madeline's manner became more collected she put her questions with a calmer intonation it had become her one desire to bring the truth to the light your statements and mine are in direct conflict i believe that i saw you do this thing you say that i did not if you really mean what you say you will be desirous of proving that i am wrong in which case you will have no objection in explaining how you have spent the day not the least in the world come i'm ready fire your questions sweetest this grows interesting i've often wondered what it felt like to be cross-examined now i'm going to know she pushed herself on the shelf which ran round the gallery so that one foot dangled in the air madeline found her irrepressible frivolity difficult to combat she herself was so oppressed by the horror of the thing that the other's persistent refusal to treat it seriously galled her into a frenzy her tone in spite of herself was harder because the other's was so light when did you first leave that hiding-place of yours well i'll tell you let me think i don't want to be caught tripping and then to have you fasten on me a point-blank charge of perjury first of all i came out to cheer you up i thought you would want cheering up before you went you know before you went to promise to marry staines by way of being deputy for me but you were gone and it seemed that you didn't stand in any need of cheering up because i stole after you and from a corner of my own i saw the show you saw the show yes wasn't it fun goodness knows what would have happened if anyone had chanced on me but nobody did i never enjoyed anything so much in my life you look so much like me that more than once i was positively startled it was so supernatural there were little tricks of yours which reminded me of myself in a way that was quite miraculous and you looked yes you looked every bit as lovely as i myself could have done and i'm not sure that in a way you didn't look lovelier you did me the greatest possible credit my dear and as i looked at you i realized for the first time 
in my whole existence how positively charming i myself must be well when the show was over i went she paused and as she did so the same odd change took place in her expression which had obscured it before it seemed all in an instant to become apathetic and dull i went it's very odd let me see where did i go i went she put her hands up to her brow as if to aid her memory i think i went to see bianchi do you know it's very singular but i don't seem to remember what happened while i was with bianchi it seems all muddled what happened after you left him maud wrapped her temples with her knuckles as if violence were put in motion the apparently dormant powers of her brain she glanced up at madeline with a look of half comical bewilderment i can't remember it really is very queer indeed but i can't the next thing i can actually recall is finding myself back in my dungeon tower though whence i came or how i got there i don't seem to have a notion by the way i do remember this that when i discovered where i was i myself wondered how i had got there perhaps i had been walking in my sleep do you think i had you went into what you call your dungeon tower with your cousin's blood wet upon your hands when i caught you in the act you fled for your life is that so dear me how very odd then from that do you infer that i did the shameful deed while walking in my sleep is there anything of that kind upon the records of the nougat calendar for instance madeline's attitude was expressive of the disgust she felt this tergiversation this dexterity and shuffling as she felt it to be seemed to her to be almost as horrible as the crime itself she turned away with a movement of uncontrollable contempt to talk to you is to waste one's time i can only conclude that in you the moral sense if ever existent is long since dead it is quite plain that you are altogether void of any perception of a difference between right and wrong she moved towards the staircase which led down into the body of the hall maud called after her my dearest madeline what an extraordinary style of speech you do appear to keep in stock you don't mean to say solemnly that you don't believe me i don't believe you but i do hope that merely on that account you are not going to place me under a ban of excommunication i'll tell a lie i really will rather than you should think i am untruthful thank you i should not wish to put your powers in that direction to an unnecessary strain then i'll sing to you you little horror and in a moment she broke into song the magic of the melody filled madeline with a kind of intoxication her pulses throbbed her heart-strings seemed to quiver but she moved across the room without pause or stay never pausing to look back when she reached the door rushing from the room with the music of that marvellous voice ringing in her ears as if to mock her when she was without she leaned against the wall pressing her hand against her side trembling so that even with the support afforded by the wall it seemed to be all that she could do to be able to stand hardly had she taken a dozen steps after she had to some extent recovered her self-control when a voice addressed her from behind so it is you is it i find you again after all you and i will understand each other if you please alone together where there is no lazarus to interfere the speaker was signor bianchi End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain the signor is astonished madeline still tremulous turning looked at the italian without for the moment quite realizing who he was or what he said he on his part was in the usual excitable condition it seemed it was his wont to be his words stumbled over each other in their haste to be uttered it is good that i find you very good most excellent more it is about time i looked for you everywhere up and down all over the place you are nowhere oh no there is nothing to be seen of you not a thing until now just when i am going what you call dark staring raving mad he appeared to be in a state of singular agitation his big black eyebrows went up and down his eyes rolled 
his head twirled about on his shoulders his whole body was in continual movement as if it had been hung on springs his volubility added to madeline's bewilderment she allowed him to grip her wrist and to lead her through an open door into a room which she had a misty consciousness was lettered with all sorts of odds and ends without offering the faintest remonstrance it was his own apartment the one in which mr lazarus had illustrated in such an uncomfortable manner what he called odic force the signor banged the door behind him madeline sank limply onto a chair on which there already was a pile of music whereon bianchi crossing his arms upon his chest stood in front of her in an attitude which suggested fury rather than grace he showed an inclination to indulge in vain repetitions so it is you at last as i have said there is now an opportunity for you to explain what you mean by treating me with such monstrous cruelty me whose soul is all tenderness who would not hurt a fly you will now be able to make me understand what is the meaning on your lips of deceit falsehood ingratitude black-hearted treachery to let me know if you are indeed a woman or a thing of horror i wait for you to tell me these things as you see i am at your service i attend only your convenience madeline's only response was to rise from her chair her manner was as cold as his was very much the reverse be so good as to let me go springing to the door he prevented its being opened by placing his back against it never never i give you my word until you have told me all that i have a right to demand we shall understand each other altogether at last i promise you before you leave this room he waved his hands in the air as he was speaking as if he were doing his best to shake them off his wrists madeline momentarily regaining more and more of her composure began to eye him as if he was some sort of curiosity you are making a mistake off went his hands again wiggle waggling in the air they seem to be in constant danger of dislocation it is a mistake i make no doubt it is not the first but i swear to you that it shall be the last there shall be no more mistakes between us two i desire i command you therefore to tell me why you have played with me the fool why you have lied to me as if you were a thing of infamy to tell me now at once madeline reflected it occurred to her as being at least within the range of probability that this man had had something to do with maud dorincourt's crime it was even possible that it was he who had been the direct incentive that he had actually urged her to the act she resolved to commence to break through the tangled web of misconception in which she had become ravelled by giving him clearly to understand who and what she was the mistake you make is in supposing me to be miss dorincourt the words were clearly uttered yet that they conveyed no meaning to his mind seemed evident he stood staring at her with knitted brows as if she had addressed him in an unknown tongue what is that you say i say that the mistake you make is in supposing me to be miss dorincourt 
i am not i'm no connection of hers i'm a stranger to her she had never heard of me nor had i heard of her till yesterday i am madeline orme the musician's brows still were knitted as if he was struggling with some knotty point the solution of which was beyond his mental capacity then moving quickly towards her putting his hand upon her arm he said with a degree of earnestness which placed his sincerity beyond all question what a liar you are what a liar or as a doubt seemed to cross his mind is it that you are mad madeline smiled faintly in spite of herself the little man's bluntness coming so clearly from his heart seemed to appeal to her sense of humour i'm not a liar on this occasion nor am i mad i almost wish sometimes that i were it is the simple fact that i'm not miss dorincourt look at me closely do you mean to say that you cannot see for yourself that i am not he did as she bade him thrusting his face within six inches of hers searching her features with eager yearning staring eyes what new lie is it that you tell me maud why do you tell me such a lie you must be mad can you not see that i am not she whom you call maud he made a hurried movement backwards sweeping his hand before his eyes as if to brush away some threatening illusion it is impossible it cannot be it is not a thing to be believed if you are not maud who are you then i am madeline orme madeline orme who is madeline orme nothing and no one a creature picked out of the gutter to play the part a great lady for a day i do not know what you mean what you say is beyond my understanding it is a new game you play with me maud he flung his arms above his head with a frantic gesture of appeal i cry to you out of my soul for mercy i ask you to remember how often i have told you the story of my love with what willingness you have listened to me and all that you have promised i ask you not to forget madeline interrupted him don't you think it is unwise to talk in this strain to a perfect stranger a perfect stranger you dare to call yourself a perfect stranger maud is it possible that you are such a one that you will even deny that you are yourself my good man i tell you that i am not maud and it seems to me that you can scarcely have such an intimate acquaintance with the lady as you pretend if you are unable to discover that fact for yourself a man who knows a woman as well as you would have me believe that you know miss dorincourt is surely able to detect the imitation from the real he went three or four steps backward as if to be able to observe her from a more advantageous point of view by degrees as he continued to stare there seemed to enter into his mind the beginnings of doubt i do not believe you are maud i do not believe it she would not speak to me she would not look at me like that and yet you are maud you must be maud it is another game you play with me it is altogether impossible that two persons can be so like each other it is one of those impossibilities which have an inconvenient knack of translating themselves into facts the thing's a freak of nature nothing more providence has seen fit to make me in externals so like miss dorincourt but even to me the resemblance seems incredible you must know that it's almost as much a novelty to me as it is to you i'm still in a state of continual surprise but 
if what you say is true and you are who do you say you are i am madeline orme who is no one in particular where then is maud madeline considered and decided that on the whole it might be more prudent to leave the question open i'm not miss dorincourt's keeper so and you what is it that you do here i have been pretending to be miss dorincourt you have been pretending to be miss dorincourt in the name of heaven since when have you been pretending it is a funny way in which you put it to be miss dorincourt i am beginning to think i dream on the contrary you are just commencing to awake i have been playing at being the lady in question since yesterday since yesterday bianchi gave a dramatic start in an instant every part of his body seemed to be in simultaneous movement is it possible can it be that it was you you who this morning engaged yourself to marry the earl of staines the young lady's countenance went a shade paler it is quite possible it was not her it was not her holy virgin it is incredible a thing not to be believed and he the earl he thought you you were maud there is reason to suppose it the girl's tone was dry all the company of saints was ever such a comedy what a creature you must be what a woman to play such a trick before all that crowd of people i must be an absolutely shameless person mustn't i two bright red spots were burning on madeline's cheeks you musicians ingenious outspokenness stung her nearly to madness it is not only that but what a boldness what a courage what a what a boundless impudence yes all that indeed i have seen something of women of curious women you may take my word for it but you are altogether beyond them all altogether my gracious my gracious he struck his temples two or three times smartly with his open palms it is a veritable comedy you are like one of the valets of moliere i thank you i trust they were agreeable persons they are the most impudent rascals the wit of man ever conceived the most barefaced i thank you still more she dropped him a curtsy her face flaming that is if you are not maud of which i have still a doubt you need have none on that point you may take my word then it is a marvel a true miracle that the good god should have made two persons so like each other but what a burden you lift off my heart what a weight and what a wrong i have done to my dear maud in my thoughts but how was i to know there were two of you no one had spoken a word to me not a hint how was i to know it was you and not she you would have deceived the devil himself but now that once more my heart is alive my soul revives what a rapture to think that after all she is the angel the true angel i have from the first supposed her and after you had engaged yourself to the earl you came in here to lazarus and to me pardon me but i did not he spun round on his heels what do you mean i am merely replying to your inquiry i say that you came in here to lazarus and to me and i say again that i did not who was it then that i cannot tell you unless it was miss dorincourt miss dorincourt miss dorincourt his jaw dropped open the muscles of his face began to twitch suddenly rushing at her he threatened her with his clenched fists do not dare to say it was miss dorincourt it's a lie a lie a lie it was you you are all lies she made a little movement with her hands possibly but on this occasion i happen to be speaking the truth swear to me it was not you this is the first time i was ever in this room he looked at her long and fixedly something which he saw in her face seemed to drive the light all out of his his hands fell to his sides staggering back he stumbled over a chair 
sinking on to the seat his head dropped forward on to his chest in a moment he had become a picture of dejection his voice was sepulchral my god my god my god he groaned we are undone altogether she and i and it is you who have done it it is all you you are a wicked 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 woman granting the general proposition how do you propose to make it up in this particular instance i supposed as all the world supposed that it was she who had promised herself unto the earl that she had foully betrayed me was i not a witness with my own eyes i was beside myself with rage i exclaimed that i would have his life and hers lazarus took me at my word when she came in here he said to me i will arrange for you a perfect revenge i will put it in her heart to kill him with her own hand to kill him with a knife i was not unwilling for i believed that she had betrayed me at first go on the girl had woke to sudden interest she had advanced a step or two closer to him and was exhorting him to continue with voice and gesture he had paused he was covering his face with his hands after all she had come to me with a heart all truth and he cast on her the evil eye who did lazarus what do you mean by the evil eye he looked up at her with glowering eyes you ask me such a question you who have cast the evil eye on all of us never mind me go on with what you were saying who is this lazarus he is my friend or rather he was my friend he is now my greatest enemy when i see him i will not answer for myself he is a witch a wizard i know not what you call it he cast on her a spell he declared to me that he would put it into her heart to kill the earl he was as good as his word she was as wax in his hands as wax i saw it with my eyes if she were to find the earl which the saints forbid i believe that she would thrust in him a knife because of what lazarus put into her heart madeline's heart died down within her heavy weights seemed to be dragging at her limbs for some moments she was speechless she began to have an inkling of what it was that had really happened to realize the position and all its horror she has found the earl her voice had all at once grown hoarse its hoarseness seemed to affect bianchi's as he half rose from his chair as if involuntarily in obedience to some volition other than his own his huskiness seemed to be a sort of mockery she has found him and she has thrust in him a knife as with an apparent effort of will the man grasped her meaning his face became transfigured it was as if he had been attacked by trismus the muscles of his jaw and throat became rigid locked it was dreadful to see him his features were set in an awful grin when his jaw did move it was convulsively words came from him in choking gasps it was difficult to make out what he said my god my god my god after his triple appeal to the deity he was still the man and the woman barely a couple of feet apart stood and eyed each other she seeing something in his tortured face which cut her to the soul in some indescribable way she seemed to grow smaller to wither as she perceived less and less dimly what a wholly helpless instrument maud had been in the hands of a master of evil phantoms came crowding into her brain she began to tremble do you mean to say that she didn't know what she was doing she knew nothing it was lazarus who did it all they spoke to each other in scarcely audible whispers as if their voices had become worn to threads but how could he do it if he was not there it was the evil eye holy virgin deliver us from evil he crossed himself spasmodically it was as though some exterior force rebelled against his desire to describe on his breast the holy symbol she watched him all the time ghosts chasing each other through her brain each conjuring up a separate image of dread she thought of her recent interview with maud how she had showered on her head a whole arsenal of insult she had accused her of being guilty of all the crimes in the calendar steep to the neck in the slough of iniquity in the light of what the italian had said she perceived with what superlative good temper the girl had endured the shower of calumny how hideously she had been ill-used madeline went hot and cold red and white as she contemplated the part which she herself had taken in that ill-usage if only the ground would have opened to swallow her up 
if only she could have fled somewhere to hide herself forever from the sight of men and women if only she could have performed some impossible feat of expiation wiped out with a wet rag the last four and twenty hours from the tail of her life the pair continued to stare at each other motionless as if they had been turned into stone by degrees a mastering emotion began to grow up in madeline's breast it gathered force became a frenzied desire to cleanse her soul at any cost from the reeking mass of deception amid which as it seemed to her it wallowed to lift her head out of the depths into which she had allowed herself to sink to become once more worthy of at least her own respect if she only could do that she felt that god might be once more with her but until then never she stretched out her hand a little way towards her companion tentatively as if still in doubt as to what she ought to do or say and she began to speak in a voice which at first tremulous uncertain gained strength as she went on until at last her tones rang through the room like trumpet notes it's all my doing all mine how great a fire a little spark is kindled because i was weak and suffered my better judgment to be overruled pretending that i was yielding to the promptings of a spirit of adventure during the flight of only a few hours all this has come how worse than foolish i have been what a wicked wanton yesterday i could have told myself that though the world had pressed upon me pretty hardly and so it has i had done nothing of which i need have cause to be ashamed and now where's all my boasting now i have plunged head foremost into a carnival of shame lurched myself from top to toe lost all those things which i held so dear i have been like a spark dropped into a powder barrel which in its explosion scars every one in reach there is not one of you i have not brought with myself to open shame drawing herself straight up holding out her arms in front of her she broke into a strain of passionate intensity the italian his head held a little forward stared at her with shining eyes as if he found in her half hysteric utterances some esoteric fascination what is done cannot be undone the past is past it has become written in the book of god from whose pages nothing shall ever be erased but i can stop the doing and i will this instant if god will only help me i will confess my sin if he will only give me strength yes before them all take off the borrowed clothing in which i have dared to stand and show myself to be the creature of rags and tatters which indeed i am they shall know me as the wretch who has crept into the house like a sneak and thief with perjuries upon my lips hypocrisy in the very air she breathes brazen-faced yet a coward every inch of her in an ecstasy of emotional exultation clasping her hands she seemed to be appealing to an unseen presence give me strength o god for thou knowest how much i stand in need of it hard is the task which is before me without thy help i fear to fail by the waters of bitterness my feet are faltering lead thou them in for only by passing through the depths shall i reach safety a quiet conscience by peace upon the further side she was silent yet continued for some seconds in the same attitude of rapturous supplication then her hands dropped to her sides and with her head held well aloft turning without speaking another word she passed from the room bianchi made not the slightest effort to detain her but scarcely had she closed the door behind her than without on the very threshold she was stayed by a tall thin gentleman who held himself to the full as erect as she did and who glanced at her from under nearly closed eyelids as he glanced at her he smiled and from the gentleman his glance and his smile she instinctively shrunk back it was mr lazarus the sight of him seemed to fill the girl with an odd sense of repulsion she stood as close as possible against the wall as if to avoid any risk of even her garments coming in contact with his person she seemed to be waiting for him to move aside so as to give her room to pass but so far from moving he not only remained stock still he addressed her in a voice which grated on her nerves even as his presence did my beautiful so it is you my songbird in whose throat the music is all frozen ah the ejaculation accompanied a movement of his eyelids which startled her revealing as it did what a truly astonishing pair of orbs had been concealed behind them she put up her hand as if to shield herself from their glare how dare you speak to me in such a way who are you let me pass his eyelids had reverted to their original position he was peering at her from beneath their rims in a fashion which suggested that for some cause or other he had been a little taken by surprise you have forgotten me already that is strange it is not often 
that i am so soon forgotten by my lady friends the last words were uttered with a leer which made the blood boil in madeline's veins did you not hear me ask you to let me pass stand aside sir he showed no sign of doing as she desired but continued to smile and look at her as if he were examining her with a certain curiosity which was peculiarly his own you are in a great hurry why all at once life in itself is such a rapid thing that it is a mistake for any one to hurry go slow my dear go slow what is the matter with you now the matter was that madeline appeared to have resolved to ignore his advice and to get away from him as quickly as she possibly could at once his manner changed opening his eyes to their widest he fixed on her a demoniacal glare extending his hand towards her with a gesture of imperious command wait i tell you to wait the spectacle which he presented was horrible looking like some obscene creature possessed of unholy powers the girl shrank back against the wall seeming for an instant as if she would succumb to his baneful influence but in that direction at any rate she was stronger than he supposed on a sudden overtaken as it seemed by a paroxysm of uncontrollable rage she sprang forward positively leaping at him like some wild creature striking him with one hand after the other on either cheek well delivered resounding blows in the first flush of his surprise he started back before he could recover himself she had rushed past him and darted round the corner out of sight his countenance as he continued to stare in the direction in which she had disappeared was a study of varying emotions for an appreciable space of time it was distorted like a maniac no one who had seen him then would have denied that there was madness in his blood by slow degrees it became so to speak smoothed out until at last it returned to its normal condition of nearly shut eyes and perpetual smile what is the matter with me is it possible that i begin to lose my power or have i caught her in an antagonistic mood i don't like it it's not nice for me a short while ago she was so pliable i had but to look at her it was done she was as easy to deal with as any one could be now already what a change to have run away to have slapped my face no it is not nice for me when i see her the next time i will try again then perhaps it will be bad for her as he said this he unceasingly smiled and walked towards the music room now he had reached it he turned the handle of the door End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain maud sings to mr lazarus he opened the door a few inches and then stopped through the aperture there came the sound of a woman's voice maud was singing as the first notes reached his ears another change came over his face the seemingly fixed smile faded his brow was puckered something in his attitude suggested the animal which has been startled through its sense of hearing every nerve seemed strained lest through want of vigilance a sound escaped him his whole attitude denoted the most complete surprise a surprise which as he stood and listened increased rather than diminished the song which was being sung within approached its close as the cadences swelled denoting a capacity of voice and mastery of method as great as unusual he seemed to hold his breath lest even his very respirations should mar the perfect harmony the singer ceased and as she did so he drew a long deep breath as if of satisfaction the strained expression passed from his face the smile returned more strongly defined what a voice what a voice what a voice the repetition of the phrase and the fashion of its repetition rising in a crescendo scale was more expressive than would have been a plethora of words 
it signified the alpha and the omega of his entire appreciation is this bianchi's nightingale but how came she in there she did not go this way it is not a moment since she went in the opposite direction she must have some magic beside her voice to have got back again so soon without my knowing let me consider i think the other door which leads into the gallery is up this way he pointed with his finger can she have gone round into the room that way it is impossible unless she is a magician i think i will go through that door myself if i go through here she would see me she might sing no more and that would be a pity a great pity perhaps i can get through the other door without her seeing me and then maybe i will prepare for her a small surprise he moved in the direction towards which he had pointed treading on the ball of his foot as cautiously as if an audible footfall would have brought discovery of his presence and as if discovery was beyond all others the thing to be avoided turning to the left mounting a short flight of stairs he reached a second door this he undid gingerly just wide enough to enable him to thrust a part of his head inside ah the nightingale again maud had recommenced to sing he remained for a second or two perfectly quiescent with something of the same look of surprise on his face which had marked it before she sings so with her whole soul that she will not hear me if i venture to intrude and she has not eyes at the back of her head softly he insinuated his long thin frame through the hardly opened door so softly that the singer could certainly not have been made conscious of his entrance by the slightest sound she stood immediately in front of the organ somewhat to the right and in advance of where he was so that he saw her side face from behind there was again something distinctly reminiscent of an animal in the manner in which he observed her he might have been compared to one of the great carnivora watching a possible meal whose appetite already keen was becoming whetted more and more by what it perceived and heard and whose instinct warned it to take every precaution against a premature disturbance of its prey the girl was singing some florid air of donizetti's one which the musical taste of the moment has elected to call old-fashioned but one forgot the caprice of the critics or even one's own predilections as one listened to the singer one felt that all must be music which issued from that throat that the commonplace would be glorified and the meretricious made entrancing the single auditor made his own comments power there is power enough to fill hyde park and to spare quality it is like an orchestra of violins all played by masters range heaven knows how many octaves i should say all the gamut bianchi did not exaggerate no he was underneath the truth what would such a voice be worth to whoever had it just then the singer stopped glancing carelessly about her she caught sight of him behind who are you what are you doing there he bent himself almost double i beg from you ten thousand pardons for venturing to listen to the choirs of the angels to the music of the spheres i did not guess your gift of melody when seeing you just now she glanced at him with knitted brows 
as if making an effort at recognition seeing you just now what do you mean when you did me the honour to he imitated the action of slapping his cheeks have you forgotten already again it seems to me that you forget very soon the girl was smiling you think so i think it is you who are making a mistake something in her intonation caught his ear he drew himself up moved hastily towards her then stopped to stare from beneath his overhanging eyelids with new and singular intensity did i not have the pleasure of seeing you just now outside you did not i have not been out of this room for an hour or more he seemed to be rigid all at once with inexplicable emotion which she found it amusing to observe i believe it is not i believe it is not and yet great heaven have you a sister not to my knowledge then then have you a double a double maud bit her lip why do you talk such nonsense pray who are you that you should ask me such a question he jumped off his feet straight up into the air snapping his fingers above his head with a noise like discharging pop-guns it is a miracle a miracle i begin to understand to catch a glimpse but it is a true miracle you are miss dorincourt his antics seem to cause the girl to be divided between entertainment and perplexity i am and it was you who came to see bianchi and me she put her hand up to her face a spasm passed over her i don't understand ah he threw up his arms as if to emphasize the long drawn-out guttural ejaculation this is beautiful now i see it all what fools we have been bianchi and i it is your double who has done it she is like you as two peas the devil himself will not be able to tell you from each other when he has you both downstairs she slapped me your double well perhaps in return i will slap you so we shall be even maud drew herself a little back you talk in an extraordinary strain particularly considering that you are a perfect stranger be so good as to leave me at once all in good time there is no hurry move always gently perhaps i am not such a perfect stranger as you suppose think thrusting out his finger as a cat might suddenly protrude its claws for an instant he opened his eyes to their fullest limits covering her face with her hands she turned away and shivered don't go her distress caused him obvious satisfaction ah i thought you would remember me if you tried it would break my heart to think that i was altogether forgotten by one so lovely do you hear me tell you to go away i hear you but i will not go i am not such a fool seating himself crossing his legs clasping his hands in front of him he regarded her with head thrown back as a connoisseur might a picture i cannot tell you with what a pleasure i learn that it was not you who slapped me i was afraid of a great many things it is a big weight off my mind now we will have a little pleasant conversation together you and i you love bianchi the girl continued to shiver keeping her back still turned to him how dare you ask me such a question i ask it again you love bianchi i will not answer you oh yes you will you will answer me that and a great deal more you will deliver yourself into my hands before i have done with you body soul and spirit to do with as i please so do not be silly 
in the meantime you will make me cross tell me you love bianchi she was still so you choose to begin with a little rebelling well only you must not let it go too far turn round to me she gripped the ledge of the gallery with both her hands i won't turn round to me his voice was a little deeper she bent over the edge clutching it as if for her life i won't i won't i won't turn round to me he stretched out the long claw-like index finger of his right hand and he opened his eyes for some seconds there was silence his hand remained rigid his eyes open some unseen force seemed passing from him to her which she was doing her utmost to resist her teeth were biting at her lower lip she was doing it to retain control over the muscles of her face every nerve was strained to keep her body set and stiff by degrees however her efforts at resistance became less strenuous as if the continued strain had gone beyond her powers of endurance the dogged desperate look which was on her face relaxed she began to sway to and fro and at last loosing her hold on the ledge tremulously uncertainly as if she were giddy she began to turn right round until she fronted her tormentor she presented a pitiful enough spectacle as she stood there with pale cheeks twitching lips downcast eyes trembling like a reed shaken in the wind but plainly it was not the pity of it which appealed to him lift up your eyes and look me in the face she hesitated then with a sort of start she did as he bade her her lovely eyes met his awful ones something passed from his to hers which seemed to cut into her soul and to dry up the springs of life which were within her something in her face seemed to drop as if the expression had gone right out of it the result seemed to afford him satisfaction he allowed his eyelids to drop again and his smile returned you see after all it is the same you had better have been sensible at first instead of giving me all this trouble not that it is trouble which i mind no not at all to bring such a lovely creature into subjection is always amusing and the more she rebels the more it is amusing so now that we have had this little pleasant struggle together you and i tell me you love bianchi there was a perceptible pause before she spoke then the words came with a little jerk yes i do ah lucky man much to be envied fellow to be loved by so beautiful a young lady you love him much again there was the noticeable interval between the question and the answer proving less noticeable as the questions were persisted in yes with all your heart with all my heart and all your soul and all my soul there is nothing you would not do for him there is nothing i would not do for him you would lay down your life for him i would lay down my life for him it was singular to note how in her parrot-like repetition of his words she invested her echo with a dignity which gave to the phrases when they came from her lips quite a different meaning to that which they bore when they proceeded from his despite the wooden mould in which her face seemed to have all at once become framed she uttered her confessions with an air of sincerity which was not without its pathos while he wrung them from her with a grin which was a crescendo sneer so you love him as much as that well he is a happy man and he do you know what he loves he loves your voice as much as you love him my faith perhaps more and he has sense it is not only that it is a golden voice it is a diamond mine with all the diamonds in full sight you have only to hold out your hand it is full of them even i could love such a voice as that you see even i let me have some more of it charm my eyes again with the sparkle of the diamonds 
and my ears with the tinkle tinkle as they fall there is nothing i love like music particularly when it comes from such a throat already i begin to feel something of bianchi's rapture what would one not dare to have such a voice to do with as one would even to marrying the case in which it is contained sing to me another song she appeared to hesitate to make a further puny futile effort to withstand his malignant influence i would rather not what do i care if you would rather not i say sing to me another song do you hear me sing once more his eyes gaped he pointed at her an insistent finger and straightway she sang her arms dangled at her sides she stood well up her head a little back staring unseeingly in front of her and from her lips there poured forth a flood of song possibly in the midst of her state of complete subordination to this demoniac will she was conscious of her overwhelming need of help at any rate it was as if she cried straight from her heart to god jesus lover of my soul let me to thy bosom fly while the gathering waters roll while the tempest still is high probably this was not the kind of thing he had expected to hear this wailing of a soul in agony this heart-rending flight of song beating against the bars of heaven however that might have been it met with his entire approbation it was a characteristic of this girl's singing that whatever she sang seemed to be just what she had been meant to sing a more ideal rendering of the popular hymn could not have been conceived lifting it out of the rut of the commonplace she made it worthy of the choirs of the angels long before she came to the close and beyond the slightest doubt when she reached the lines all my trust on thee is stayed all my help from thee i bring cover my defenceless head with the shadow of thy wing had she been singing to a vast assemblage of people ninety-nine out of every hundred of her auditors would have been dissolved in tears a fact which her audience of one did not fail to note that is the sort of song to please the english people and that is the way to sing it it is a song of religion the english religion and it makes them cry those are the two things they like religion and crying we will pull out both the stops for them together eh my dear in france in germany in italy they like something a little different yes indeed a good deal different but for england where there is the money that is just the thing and for america also there they are as big fools as the english oh yes that song of yours is beautiful 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 it would melt a heart of stone see how it has melted mine i'm all softness you shall sing it again and others like it again and again for me instead of for bianchi why not can you not love me instead of him is it not easy the girl drew herself together as if desirous of compressing herself within the smallest possible compass she shuddered love you you no 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 he continued to smile contentedly you see how the mere thought affects you that is a sign that you are very near to loving me so near it makes you shiver it is the sweet flower of your innocence which closes its petals with a quiver which is half shame half rapture my beautiful let me tell you who i am that will be to make love in the proper orthodox way my dear young lady i earn my bread and sometimes also my cheese by introducing remarkable people to that great public which loves remarkable people all the world over and which pays through the nose to see them sometimes it is a girl with two heads or two girls with one head which is better sometimes it is a charming creature who can kick as high as the moon first with one leg then with the other then with both together sometimes it is a lady who can tie herself into fourteen kinds of knots but she does not last that lady she has disappointed me more than once sometimes it is a sweet young thing who can turn somersaults till to watch her makes you dizzy but this time it will be a new departure i will introduce a veritable artist indeed the greatest singer the world has ever seen it will not be necessary to announce it on the bills 
you will advertise the fact yourself so soon as you open your beautiful mouth and so that you may have the benefit of every possible advantage i will introduce you as my wife to begin with i will marry you what do you say is not the idea enchanting it was not clear that the girl followed all he said with a definite perception of his meaning but that she understood him at the close of her demeanour showed her face was ashen white her whole frame seemed filled with a sense of indescribable repulsion she could but gasp marry you marry you yes marry me is it not a thing of which to dream eh my flower i will introduce you as madame lazarus it is a good name lazarus eh you will charm the world and fill my pockets we shall both of us be happy in the wildest flights of your ambition you never supposed that you would become the wife of such a man as me it is to go even beyond your dreams is it not so from her look of agony it seemed as if she were making a violent effort to free herself from the unseen bonds which held her as in a vice and striving in vain let me go let me go let me go let you go never to speak of such a thing as to be absurd so far from letting you go i will keep you with me for ever till you are dead or as good as dead i promise you only death or its full equivalent shall henceforward part us twain with such a sudden passion have you inspired my breast you have your gift which shall be used for me and i have my gift which shall be used for you this last was said with a grin which drove his meaning home to her with a force which brought on another convulsive fit of shuddering rising from his chair he began to pace backwards and forwards in front of the organ eyeing her continually sideways as a cat might a mouse each time he passed her even though it was at a distance of several feet she quivered as with a twinge of pain presently as he continued to stride to and fro putting the fingers of his right hand up to his mouth he began to snap his nails against his teeth making them ring out with a disagreeable click 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 as he did so the door through which he had entered was opened furtively some half a dozen inches just as he himself had opened it and somebody else peeped through it was signor bianchi presently lazarus broke into audible speech bianchi as if he found himself unable to hear what was being said opening the door a little wider came into the gallery neither the girl nor the man observed him mr lazarus was altogether too much engrossed with the fruit of his own cogitations too full of the pleasure of drawing his toils tighter and tighter round his helpless victim every now and then he threw out his hands towards her each time she started as if he had struck her a blow his tone became more and more menacing as he went on you are a young lady of high birth your family is powerful rich to take you away to hide you until i can make you my wife and perhaps afterwards that is not easy it is only i who could do it and even then think of the danger i shall run if they were to find you in my possession would there not be trouble to make the risk as little as may be what i will do is this you see i tell you everything i hide nothing nothing at all why because it is my nature to be frank now you are a little under my influence soon you will be altogether i will soak you in the ocean of my will i will impregnate you with my own personality absorb you in myself there will be left to you no individuality no separate existence no instincts of your own you will be like an automaton which will only work in response to the movements of a key and the key i shall be the key i shall put my arm through yours and i shall say come and you will come i shall say go and you will go and if any one asks you where it is that you are going you will reply mind your own business or what affair is it of yours or whatever words i shall put into your head so we will go out of the house and out into the world arm in arm together indeed a thoroughly united pair you you devil had the average man found himself addressed in such terms unexpectedly from behind in a voice husky with emotion it is probable that he would have spun round like a top with at any rate a view of learning what such an interruption might chance to mean but it was characteristic of mr lazarus and of his strength of nerve that for a distinct moment or two he allowed the interposition to go unnoticed then slowly turning he saw 
a few feet away from him the musician crouching as if he was about to spring his face alive with passion every nerve in his body seemingly on the twitter mr lazarus only smiled ah it is you my excellent friend bianchi indeed how it goes it my good fellow bianchi hesitated his eyes glaring at lazarus then looking yearningly at maud dashing past his quondam friend he rushed to the girl maud maud he cried he took her limp nerveless hands in his emotion impeded his utterance words strutting on each other's heels i've done you a wrong a great wrong i've been told it all by miss madeline orme i beg from you ten thousand pardons it was not you who promised to marry the earl of staines it was she now i know i entreat from you forgiveness how shall i prove to you that i am sorry speak to me my darling tell me that you understand that the mistake was natural speak to me i entreat you speak the girl was silent his impassioned supplication met with no response instead there came mr lazarus's sardonic tones from behind why does she not speak to you since you ask her with such warmth i wonder bianchi suffering the gibe to pass unheeded renewed his hot appeal as if by dint of sheer vehemence he could force words from between her lips speak to me my sweet my angel my loved one do not care for him he is nothing if you will only try hard you will be able to speak for my sake in the name of all that is good and holy in the name of the lord christ and of his holy angels i entreat you my sweet one my beloved try 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 not a sound proceeded from her lips a grey look of agony was on her lovely features tiny beads of sweat stood on her brow all that was audible was mr lazarus's light-hearted mockery why does she not try it is very cruel of her not to try when you ask her with so much eloquence it is so strange but you never can tell what it is that moves a woman's tongue bianchi seemed to hesitate as if still waiting for her to speak then as she continued silent turning with an inarticulate cry of rage he sprang at lazarus like some mad thing the onslaught was made with such violence that the big man taken unawares stumbling over a chair went backwards on to the floor the musician clinging to him as he fell continuing to unceasingly attack him in a frenzy of unreasoning rage for a second or two it seemed as if rage would supply bianchi with strength enough to make the contest equal but only for a time the conditions were too uneven to allow of its enduring long the very fury which lent the italian force hastened his own undoing he became exhausted lazarus rose slowly to his feet holding him as if he had been a monkey in his huge hands with one he compressed the windpipe increasing the pressure as the writhing little man grew blacker and blacker in the face shall i choke the life out of you why not it would make a proper evening and to throttle you for me would be good sport the wretched man's eyes were starting from his head the horrid spectacle which he presented afforded his friend the liveliest satisfaction the english law is an ass it does not discriminate no to kill even such a thing as you it calls murder it is hardly worth one's while to commit such a crime for the sake of such a subject he shook his victim till the wonder was that he did not shake him all to pieces but i think i know another way which is equally efficient which will make me as even with you as if i had killed you straight away picking up some sheets of music maud's music squeezing them into a ball he crammed it into the italian's mouth driving it between his jaws as if it had been a wedge that will make a pretty gag a very pretty gag now it will be you who will not be able to speak though you may try ever so hard the next thing is a piece of string i always carry a good piece of string one never knows if one will not want it you see at this moment how useful it is going to be he took from a pocket a long piece of stout twine this he proceeded to twist about bianchi's body turning him nonchalantly up and down and round and round as if he were some huge doll until he had drawn it about his limbs in such a dexterous coil that he was no longer even able to struggle placing the helpless little man upon the organ stool and the stool before the keyboard he began to fasten him with the twine to the stops on either side until he had laced him up so tightly as to be incapable of speech or motion you will be quite comfortable there my friend if the string cuts you a little you must not mind it is meant to cut you understand if kind people are long before they come to unfasten you it will cut right through your skin especially if you fidget i hope you will fidget then you will bleed 
it is true that you cannot speak or move but you can see and hear now observe look at the sweet young lady is she not sweet eh and listen he turned to maud you love our good friend bianchi yes i do you hear my dear friend is not that a good hearing do you love him much with all my heart you see once more ah bianchi how nice to be you what would you do for him i would lay down my life for him is it not rapture to hear a confession so frank from lips so lovely does not the blood dance in your veins thrice happy man yet the odd fact is that though she says such things to you it is me she is going to marry and soon without delay at once i give you my word she is going to be my wife my beautiful wife ah how obedient my wife will be and she will sing for me like the angels sing and her songs will fill my pockets with money which will fall out of the skies you hear bianchi it pleases you well observe once more mr lazarus turned so that he stood immediately in front of maud he held himself straight seeming suddenly to increase in stature throwing his arms above his head he called out to her in a tone of command which rang through the room look me in the face raising her eyes she centred them on his looked at him fixedly as some dumb beast shackled and helpless might regard the butcher who stands before it with the pole-axe in his hand suddenly he swept impetuously forward with glaring eyes his arms sweeping down towards her as he advanced she seemed to collapse as his arms descended until when he reached her there was nothing of her left but an inanimate heap upon the floor looking at bianchi over his shoulder he pointed to the inert mass you see i do with her as i will yet you must understand that i but begin wait till i have her to myself in my own place alone till i am about to make of her my wife he spurned her with the toe of his boot stooping he touched her shoulder with the finger-tips of his right hand raising his hand slowly inch by inch as he raised it she came to as if his fingers had been magnets through which a current was being sent strong enough to hold her fast in this way he restored her to the perpendicular as a conjuring trick it might have been effective only one would have preferred to think that the invertebrate figure which had been subjected to such novel treatment had been that of an automaton it was not nice to think it was the body of a living woman and one so young so gifted and so beautiful give me your arm she passed her arm through his come and be my wife they moved together towards the door bianchi following them with bloodshot eyes when they had gone a yard or two mr lazarus paused do not let us forget what is proper to the occasion it is true that bianchi watches but he does not count he is no one it is right that you should treat me as becomes a loving wife kiss me tenderly upon the lips she kissed him bianchi shut his eyes lazarus laughed now let us hasten and get married we are both of us in such a hurry there is not a moment to be lost arm in arm they passed from the room lazarus slamming the door behind him End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain confession the earl of staines sat up in bed propped at the back by pillows though he scarcely seemed to need them his naturally sallow complexion had taken to itself a sicklier hue his features always defined with sufficient clearness now stood out more sharply than ever his cheeks seemed to have fallen in his whole face looked wasted and worn as if he on a sudden had grown old yet one felt as one observed the undeniable change which since his accident had already taken place in his appearance that it was probably owing more to mental causes than to physical there was that in the lines which marked his forehead and in the crow's feet which nestled in the deep hollows about his eyes which told of mind troubles stress and strain of unwelcome thoughts which would not be denied at his bedside was his grandmother her chair drawn up so close to him that sitting as she did with her head thrown forward their faces were within a foot of one another 
despite the difference of years the likeness between them was distinct in particular his eyes had that almost fantastic quality of penetrative vision which was characteristic of hers near the dowager was his mother with whom he seemed to have no feature in common either mental or physical she with her square impassive wooden countenance big dim owl-like eyes he with the clear-cut physiognomy of a transcendentalist and dreamer and eyes of mystery which especially at that moment seemed to be looking through time into eternity in the background hovered mrs singleton fidgety anxious full of trouble as if continually watching for something which she feared yet knew must come about the room were the abundant evidences of feminine occupation the thousand and one knick-knacks of the young lady of fashion the multitudinous adjuncts of the toilet which are rather playthings than essentials the reason for whose existence is a source of perpetual mystification to the average man the earl had just been saying something with an air which was intended to mean that that was his final decision something which the dowager found not unfamiliar yet which she half resented she eyed him in silence after he had finished as if she was trying to read in his face a meaning which was behind his words is that your final decision it is and you won't marry her i will not you're going to throw her over if you like to put it in that way and you're going to break the vow which you have vowed in the presence of a couple of hundred people stultify yourself and me and call down on your head the curse of god which you yourself have challenged as to the latter not at all that is only to fall on me if i take to myself another wife which i shall not do i shall remain unmarried and leave every thing easy for reginald he was silent from the expression of his face one might judge that that consideration had no weight with him whatever and may i venture to ask why you have come to this decision which is in direct opposition to that other decision at which you arrived only a few hours since as i supposed finally i do not propose my dear grandmother to weary you with details but would merely observe that having reconsidered the position i perceive that marriage would bring satisfaction to neither of us so there's the end so she did stab you the old woman's quietly uttered words struck home it was probable that he had endeavoured to school his countenance to show no trace of whatever storm might rage within but the quick thrust had taken him unawares it had found a weak point he winced i'm not feeling very well you're not looking very well he was not his eyes closed as if they had all at once grown tired the furrows on his brow deepened he tightened his lips he looked like a man who was enduring an acute attack of sudden pain even his voice had changed the cold self-possession with which he had been speaking seemed to have passed away i'm afraid i'm hardly fit to enter into disputatious matters i sent for you somewhat against the doctor's wishes because i was conscious of having arrived at a determination which i felt it my duty to communicate to you at the earliest possible moment now that i have done so i am afraid that i must beg you to excuse me i begin to realize that the doctors were more in the right than i supposed why did she stab you staines again the lips twitched 
the eyes still closed then after a moment the dark orbs opened something saturnine seeming to be shining out of their depths pray on what grounds have you concluded that she did anything of the kind has she told you not she on the contrary she has sworn by all her gods she didn't his eyes reclosed when he opened them again it was to say in even measured tones as if he was considering the meaning of each word as it passed his lips since she has already made to you a statement it only remains for me to endorse it you fool stains you're an idiot he only smiled you may laugh but if you'd a grain of sense you'd wait for your laughter till you win i will say this for her that she lies like truth with a thousand times better air than you there's that in the business i don't understand though you needn't trouble yourselves to cover it over with lies because i don't want to understand i'd as lief not but you don't suppose that i'm going to have my life purpose put aside because you two have already begun to scratch each other don't think it all these years you've been willing to marry her do you imagine that at the eleventh hour i'll suffer you to kick i've too good a grip of the reins my lad and the whip's too close to my hand as for maud dorincourt she's boggled at the business i'll allow but now she's been screwed up to the sticking point or she screwed herself she said she will marry you and she shall she has never said so never madeline was the speaker she stood at the foot of the bed appearing there all in an instant as it seemed out of space they knew not whence nor how she was still all glowing with the haste of her flight from lazarus hot from her interview with bianchi tingling with shame at the thought of the injustice with which she had treated maud her whole being was agitated by varying emotions which raising her out of herself caused her to be unconscious of all else but her eager desire to free her soul from the burden which weighed it down never had her beauty appeared to more advantage her cheeks glowed her eyes flashed every movement of her limbs or body was an added grace while amazed taken by surprise they looked at her askance she went on in a voice clear as a bell you are under an entire misapprehension completely and entirely mistaken in supposing that miss dorincourt ever contemplated even for an instant the possibility of giving such a promise she has done nothing of the kind on the contrary she has never wavered in her determination not to marry the earl or in her resolution not to hold out the faintest hope of her ever being able to do so she has been afraid that you would put unfair pressure upon her of a kind which she might find it hard to submit to but though you used her never so cruelly i am persuaded that she would rather die than yield my lord rest assured that maud dorincourt has never promised to marry you and that she never will she flung out her arms as she uttered these final words as if they had been some sort of missile which she was hurling at his head the earl oblivious of the pillows which were supposed to act as a prop to his back was leaning forward staring at her across the length of the bed the dowager genuinely surprised for once in her life had screwed her ancient head round between her hunched-up shoulders and glared at her with astonished eyes is the girl stark mad or does she imagine we are i've been stark mad but at last i have returned to my sober senses that is all the earl interposed but surely i misunderstand you surely you promised you you would marry me i promised you yes my lord to my shame be it said to your shame why to your shame you you pretended that you loved me it was not pretense my lord no it was not that again to my shame be it spoken who am i that i should make you such a promise i a worthless deceitful creature without rank and fortune scarcely in the world's judgment a fit mate for one of your serving men mrs singleton came bustling forward all tremulous anxiety touching her timorously on the arm my dear think before you speak don't be over hasty do be careful what you say 
madeline turned towards her austerely like an offended queen mrs singleton shrinking before the reproach which her bearing conveyed i will not be over hasty i thank you mrs singleton and i will be careful for the first time since i have had the pleasure of making your acquaintance these are matters on which you yourself had better take advice had you not been over hasty but much more careful things would not have been done the shame of which nothing which you can do during the brief remainder of your life will erase she gave the old woman a glance before which that worthy coward as if she had been made conscious as by a flash of lightning of the unseemly part which she had played madeline turning from her walked along the side of the bed towards the earl look at me my lord something in her demeanour seemed to tickle the gentleman she addressed though his mood was certainly not disposed to humour i am looking look at me closely i am afraid if i am to look at you closer you will have to lean towards me i cannot come nearer to you being forbidden by the faculty is it possible you cannot see i am a stranger a stranger maud you are star-gazing in your judgment is the woman whom a man has known and loved from his childhood still to him a stranger my lord it is not i whom you have loved but i know better i know that it is not only you whom i have loved but that i love you more than ever i did that while formerly my affection was of the platonic sort of late on a sudden it has burst into a white-hot flame so that at the sight of you i burn with a desire to take you in my arms and fold you to my breast my lord my lord trembling she covered her face with her hands my darling do not cry nor let yourself be troubled for all that has happened the fault is mine in the first flush of my new and strange love i had forgotten that you need not have changed because i had something in your words and manner and and even in your looks my dear i was so foolish as to misconstrue and that was how the mischief has been done but now that i perceive the crassness of my stupidity do not think so badly of me as to suppose that i will allow an iota of my fault to rest on you that would be to judge me even more harshly than i deserve my lord my lord it is not i whom you have loved removing her hands from before her face holding them out in front of her the girl looked at him with streaming eyes he met her glances unwaveringly with in his own eyes something of that ecstasy of pain which is akin to rapture that may be so since you assert it and after all it is of little consequence for certainly you are she whom i love now she started back her cheeks all red you are mistaken it is hardly a point on which a man is likely to be mistaken it would be better perhaps for both of us if it were otherwise then my every pulse would not be throbbing with the anguish of my desire to hold you in my arms is it possible that one face and form can be so like another that even with the eyes of which you speak you cannot tell the two apart what do you mean is it possible that even now you cannot see that i am not maud dorincourt not maud dorincourt can you not see that i am not the earl half rose in bed his face was agitated by varying emotions first bewilderment surprise then something which transfigured it so utterly that all in an instant the look of pain and stress and worry was lifted clean off it as if it had been a mask and at once he seemed and was twice the man that he had been before he sank back to his former position with a long gasping breath as if dismissing from his breast all the humours which oppressed him what a triple-plated idiot i am of course you are not maud that's the puzzle which all the times perplexed me what a purblind bat i've been come closer let me look at you can you not see me where i am come closer she went a little closer closer still she obeyed give me your hands my lord give me your hands she did as he bade her yielding her hands affrightedly as if she dare not disobey he held them in both of his reading her face as if he loved to feast on it no you are not maud you are the woman whom i love my lord her voice was so low that it was not easy to catch her words you are the woman who loves me this time she was silent her head sank down drawing her to him he put his arms about her no thank god you are not maud he kissed her on the lips and she was still lady hildegard striding round the bed gripped the girl by the shoulder staines let her go i wish to speak to her her peculiar strident tone suggested that her mental equilibrium was not in any way disturbed the earl scarcely glanced at his mother he spoke to the girl it is i who have a right to call you to account 
and i alone i am not altogether the weak being i have seemed to you do not be afraid he loosed her she stood up i am not afraid she did not look as if she were she met the oddly built great lady's stony glare as if at any rate in that she saw nothing to fear so you are an impostor reginald was right his eyes are keener than mine yes his eyes are keener than yours who are you i am madeline orme madeline the earl held out his hand to her that is a better name than maud come with me my girl it is time that you and i should understand each other lady hildegarde gripped her left arm but the earl tightening his hold of her other hand held her fast you are right mother it is time that you should understand each other but if you have no objection you will understand each other in my presence i would rather my dear staines don't be a greater idiot than you have been already i trust my dear mother that in all things i shall always be your son let her go why are you holding her hand because god willing and the lady i hope to keep hold of it for ever you must be stark mad don't you understand that the creature's a bare-faced impostor that she's been guilty of playing a part which would be possible to none but the very lowest type of woman for all you know she may be the very scum of the earth and probably she is my dear mother you know not of what you speak and you you rave how much further will you let her go with you will you wait till she has killed you quite already she has laid you there that is not so the speaker this time is madeline lady hildegarde looked at her woodenly then addressed her son you hear the statement added to all the rest ought to show you the kind of character she is you know it is a lie madeline went on before the earl could speak my lord it is no lie something unfortunately for me the greater part of what your mother says is true but in attributing to me this particular crime she errs i have been weak and therefore wicked because i am beginning to believe that weakness and wickedness go hand in hand it is certain that in my case it has been so i belong to a different caste from yours i am an inhabitant of another world i have worked hard to earn my daily bread since i was a little child to you it may sound strange almost like a fairy tale but it is a simple fact that as your world understands the term you are the first gentleman i have ever spoken to and this is the first time i have ever pretended to equality in the presence of a lady i am a daughter of the people lowly born and lowly bred and never have i known what it was to be the possessor of a superfluous penny these things are true but though a bare-faced impostor as your mother puts it plainly and maybe one of the scum of the earth i have not joined to my other offences attempted murder i did not stab you no my lord there your mother errs it was not i the earl kept his eyes fixed upon the girl's face while she had been speaking now he turned to lady hildegarde may i ask you my dear mother to leave me for a little while with madeline it is she and i who must understand each other and that without any further loss of time alone together her ladyship objected i shall do nothing of the sort the girl would twist you round her finger she's brazen-faced enough seeing the kind of man you are to try to persuade you into making her your wife i wish she would try i'd like to have to bear the brunt of such persuasion the earl smiled but the girl was crimson she tried to withdraw her fingers from his detaining grasp and failed perhaps because she did not assert herself with sufficient resolution the lady he regard was calm but scornful stuff stained you are a fool you'd let the hussy cheat you into discrediting the evidence of your own senses come my girl let me see how you'll back up the lie you've told if it was not you who used that knife with such effect who was it then maud dorincourt the answer occasioned general surprise the dowager showed least since madeline's declaration of her identity she had remained twisted half round on her chair watching her with an attention which never wavered and a stolidity which betrayed nothing of what was passing through her mind now that she was surprised she showed by a quick movement of her ancient head but that was all lady hildegarde was outwardly but little more demonstrative loosing her grip of madeline's arm she clenched her fists seeming for a second as if she were about to repel the girl's assertion with actual violence but there she stopped it was the earl and mrs singleton who made an effort to conceal the surprise they felt the man's sallow cheek grew paler the trace of colour which had been in them fled his jaw became square and set his whole expression hard and rigid his eyes gleamed he looked like one on whose nerves there had been a sudden strain which had strung them to their utmost tension mrs singleton on the other hand was all in a fluster of rage so much so indeed as to become inarticulate with passion rushing at madeline she shook her fist at her in speechless fury 
presently however she recovers sufficient self-control to enable her to burst into a torrent of execrations you wicked girl you shameless creature you lying wretch to dare to utter such a falsehood i wonder you are not afraid that god will strike you dead that you should venture to try to pass the burden of your own wicked sin on to miss maud when you know that the poor darling is far far away from here dead buried for all that any one can tell she is not dead or buried how do you know because not many minutes ago i was speaking to her you were speaking to her you yes i she has been hiding from you all the time beneath this roof hiding from me from me from all of you you have driven her to it between you you have treated her not as if she were a creature of flesh and blood into whose veins god has breathed life to use it as her own but as if she were a thing of clay which you might fashion into what shape you choose you have refused to admit that she has a right to order her own existence just as much as you have a right to order yours and that since she and she alone is responsible to her maker for what she does with it you are not entitled to twist it this way and that and to trammel it with conditions which her very soul abhors and so she has hidden herself away from you since only in concealment she can obtain even a taste of that liberty for which her whole being aches and longs but how do you know all this where is she hidden her hiding-place is not very far from where you stand and from her own lips i know it i had only been in the house a little while when she came to me and made of me her confidant imploring me so long as i was able to continue to take her place and to allow her to remain at peace had she not done so i should not have stayed being almost as conscious as lady hildegard that my position into which as mrs singleton is aware i had been drawn against my will was hardly one which a woman of the higher type would care to fill but when she entreated me i yielded wherein i was weak and maybe wicked and for my weakness and wickedness i have suffered and am like to suffer more there was silence all eyes were fixed upon her each seemed conscious of appearing at a disadvantage of a feeling as if though it ought to have been the other way about she was the judge and they the judged the dowager gave voice to what was possibly the common sentiment never once throughout the scene had her hawk-like eyes strayed from the study of the girl's rapt countenance at least young woman you did not want the courage of your convictions did you ever before a baggage carry off what is something more than a piece of brazen impudence with such an air my courage is not often lacking though it sometimes is was it what you call lacking when you stood up before all that crowd of people pretending to be my grandchild allowing me to use you as if you were and promised yourself as wife to the earl of staines i was not afraid and since you ask me i am not sure i'd not like to go through it all again to-morrow upon my honour and promise yourself to another earl i take it ma'am no to the same one if it please your ladyship you're over scrupulous it's out of character surely you're of the sort of woman to whom a man's a man and so long as tis a man tis all you want your ladyship is pleased to jest and you are you pleased to be in earnest do you propose to hold him to the troth which he has plighted and threaten breach of promise if he should chance to fall away your ladyship understands me very ill if you suppose it i know as well as you that i am not fitted for his wife and promise not only that i will never let him marry me but that when i go away from here which will be in a minute now he shall not see my face again the earl struck in be careful what you say miss orme make no rash promises i shall have a word to say on that you will have no word to say my lord and when you give it your consideration you will see on this point at any rate that i am right my lordship will see nothing of the kind so let's have no more misunderstanding there on the earl's face there was a smile which suggested that in this matter he was prepared to join issue and which seemed to irritate his mother the lady hildegard favoured madeline with some further excerpts from her stock of plain english well my girl you've treated us to some tall talk and to some sounding speeches and played your part of impudent impostor right out to the end forgetting all the time that i have but to send for the police to have you lodged in jail to lie there perhaps until you rot and die for the crime of attempted murder as i have told you already you are under a misapprehension if you were to send for the police as you threaten it would not be me whom they would lodge in jail not you you passed mistress of all insolence who then i am afraid lady hildegard that they would have to arrest maud dorincourt as she spoke the door opened to admit reginald fanshawe and his friend mr champnell End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty 
of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain the release of signor bianchi i hope with mr pry that we don't intrude but it almost seems from the few words which reached my ears as if our entry were quite opportune is it possible that i heard my fair cousin say that she was to be arrested reginald's gentle soft carefully modulated tones seeming to express so much more than was conveyed by the literal meaning of his words affected his hearers not altogether agreeably madeline turned towards him with in her bearing a possibly unconscious touch of hauteur she held her head a little back and had the air of looking down on him from above i said that i was afraid that if any one were to be arrested it would be maud dorincourt is that so and you said you were afraid how truly unfortunate and what will be the excuse those pernicious policemen will offer for such an outrage according to your mother it will be for the crime of attempted murder attempted murder indeed only attempted and for such a triviality you stand in danger of such indignity i did not say i did i said maud dorincourt he looked puzzled and was as his question showed i beg your pardon it is my stupidity but i am afraid i don't quite follow you i am not maud dorincourt his mask-like visage over whose mutations he kept such careful watch and ward underwent an entire alteration his graceful smile which he seemed to wear as a sort of ornament passed from his face as if it had slipped and fallen his beautiful eyes became all in an instant ugly his jaw shut tight like a rat-trap the lines deepened about his eyes and lips each individual one seeming to suggest a separate snarl evil temper so debased his whole appearance that one realized his wisdom in endeavoring in an ordinary way to prevent the revelation of the kind of man he really was by concealing his countenance behind the visor of even an artificial smile he hurried forward his stature dwarfed by passion there are men it exalts it made him smaller the smoothness had gone from his voice he screeched so you're hold and you think to scramble out by an eleventh hour confession but it isn't good enough my dear that cock won't fight he turned to the others with a burst of malignant spleen i spotted her from the first she didn't take me in she's here and knows it i knew she wasn't maud i smelt the street girl reginald the interruption came from the earl in the bed and conveyed or should have conveyed a warning well she is a street girl singleton picked her off it she had been kicked into the street for misbehaviour i've just had it from the lips of the man who kicked her have you then perhaps you'll be so good as to bring him here i'll have it from his lips as well the tone was ominous the earl's look was ominous too reginald screamed back at him don't be an infernal fool i tell you man the girl is nothing but a wretched beggar who keeps herself alive god alone knows how and whose most decent habitation from the moment she was born has been an attic chapnall and i have found out all about it singleton saw how like maud she was he brought her to mrs singleton between them they hatched a precious blot and foisted her off on to you as maud for which pretty piece of business if i have my way the pair of them will go to jail it is this penniless adventuress to use as you'll yourself admit the mildest possible word who has been playing off on you these charming tricks 
making you believe that maud had changed her mind pretending to love you actually publicly promising to be your wife the future countess of staines my faith winding up as an appropriate climax by sticking a knife between your ribs that's a lie bah mr fanshawe turned his back on madeline from whom the denial came with a gesture of superlative contempt on such lips as yours lies and truth are one mother why don't you ring the bell and have her flung into the gutter particularly if as i suppose consideration for the family honour which she has smirched more than enough already will enable her to escape the public prosecution which she so justly merits it was his brother who replied to him the reason why such an order as you suggest is not given is hardly that which you suppose it happens moreover that miss orme has already acquainted us with the principal facts with which you in your turn have favoured us and which you have coloured with an eloquence which is peculiarly your own acquainted you is that how you put it why my dear fellow she knew the game was up that chapnel and i were on her track she thought she'd get in front of us that's all i scarcely think that with miss orme that was the sole determining cause however i am obliged to you for your kind offices might i ask you to take no further interest in my affairs any more for instance than i take in yours your affairs is she your affair he pointed to madeline i beg your pardon i did not know it reginald again there was that note of meaning in the intonation of the christian name the queerly matched pair of brothers eyed each other disagreeably then the elder addressed himself to madeline to her his tone was one of even fastidious deference i must apologize miss orme for these frequent interruptions might i ask you to tell me precisely where miss dorincourt at present may be found and of what offence i have been guilty that she should seek to deal out so severe a punishment you have been guilty of no offence it is not what you have done she did not know what she was doing to you how is that the earl smiled the matter becomes more and more mysterious the girl did not smile her bearing betrayed no disposition to levity of any kind it was alive with that intense earnestness which had marked it from the first she stretched out her hand with an eager gesture the hand which the earl had for so long retained in his own it is mysterious i don't understand it quite myself but from what signor bianchi told me bianchi i thought bianchi would come in this was reginald madeline just glanced at him and then went on from what signor bianchi told me it appears that miss dorincourt was present in the music-room when when madeline stumbled reginald filled in the hiatus you did the head of the family the distinguished honour to promise to become his future countess auspicious moment madeline went on hurriedly her cheeks glowing with an extra shade of colour after she went to speak to signor bianchi and and she became conscious that again she had reached a point at which explanation might be difficult again she stumbled slurring over the proper sequence of events a friend of his was present whose name i think was lazarus this mr lazarus cast on her what the signor calls the evil eye at any rate he got her entirely under his influence while she was in that condition he made her go and look for you and stab you she being all the time unconscious of what she was doing just as much so as if she had been walking in her sleep 
she spoke a little breathlessly as if anxious to tell her story with all possible speed her words were followed by silence the silence of astonishment and also it seemed of incomprehension and incredulity reginald turned to mr champnell with a movement of his shoulders which was intended to be significant of his entire disbelief you perceive champnell that the days of the romancers are not all gone no wonder that so many novelists come to the front from among women like miss orme the earl ignored his brother what are we to understand miss orme by the evil eye that you must ask signor bianchi i only quote to you his words but i do know that miss dorincourt did not know what she was doing and that she does not know even now what it is that she has done this mr lazarus must be an amazing rascal what injury have i done him that he should be guilty of such an abominable act madeline was still she was conscious that at that moment it might be inadvisable to point out that the whole mischief had had its origin in the italian's jealousy the earl went on and where do you suppose that will o the wisp of a girl is now have you any notion when i last saw her she was in the music-room about to practise some songs she may be singing still mrs singleton ring the bell i'll have inquiries made madeline interposed if you'll excuse me i think you may defeat your own purpose if you do with your permission i will go and see if she is there and if she is i will bring her to you that is if she will come reginald spoke with your very kind permission might i suggest that mr champnell and i should act as your escort it may require more than one to find this very elusive young lady according to your own accounts miss orme madeline received his offer with but a scant show of gratitude it is a matter of total indifference to me what you do or where you go i am unable to prevent your acting as what you call an escort she addressed the earl i think my lord that if i am to find miss dorincourt in the music-room the sooner i go the better you will not be long i will use what haste i can and you will return she hesitated my lord if you will not promise to return and that without the least delay you shall not go that's flat she appeared to consider my lord i will return in the hope that miss dorincourt will condescend to confirm in my presence the truth of so much of what i have said as comes within her knowledge the curiously assorted party went forth upon its errand madeline in front mr fanshawe whose passion had become a sneer behind mr champnell whose shrewd bright eyes nothing escaped and by whose tongue nothing was betrayed was at his shoulder while mrs singleton furtively doubtfully brought up the rear her face her bearing her tremulous movements spoke of her anxiety to set eyes once more upon the girl for whose sake she had dared and done so much yet who had placed in her so little of her confidence when they reached the music-room instead of that glorious voice bursting on their ears as madeline had half expected there was not a sound all within the great room was still from where they stood just within the doorway nothing and no one was in sight the place seemed empty mr fanshawe commented on the fact with a sneer the bird has flown if she was ever here you are quite sure you saw her here i am quite sure it is some a considerable satisfaction to know that you are certain but since it seems plain that she has gone where would you suppose miss orme that she has vanished to madeline's quick eye had caught sight of something lying on the floor at the further end of the room just beneath the gallery she went quickly to it the others still clinging to her heels it was a sheet of music a song which lay there crumpled up as if it had come fluttering down from the gallery above 
on the outside page was written in big sprawling letters maud dorincourt unless i am mistaken miss dorincourt is not far off perhaps we have disturbed her if she had been gone any time she would hardly have left her music lying on the floor i fancy she thinks too much of it perhaps she's hiding in the gallery the suggestion was reginald's ladies have been known to hide and even double when closely pressed she is only to stoop low behind the gallery's front and so far as any one down here is concerned she's hidden let's go up and see perhaps we shall catch her in the very act of stealing away they went out from underneath the overhanging roof all glancing upwards why cried reginald there's some more of her music on the ledge there if she is gone she's gone in a hurry what's the betting that she isn't behind this panel now putting his hand up to his mouth he gave a view halloo yoikes tally ho come out of it fair cousin mine we've fairly run you down now miss orme who will be the first to find he ran up the staircase but madeline was at his side together they reached the top for a moment it seemed as if their speed had been for nothing as mr fanshawe proclaimed halloa she gone away it is to be a chase if i had bet i should have been the loser why he stopped short staring madeline looking where he looked took up the parable where he had dropped it it's signor bianchi something has happened something serious i felt that something was wrong directly i saw the piece of music on the floor poor maud it was the signor trust precisely as mr lazarus had left him fastened hand and foot to his beloved organ with the sheet of music still crammed down his throat it was well they came upon him when they did he was as nearly dead as might be his friend had done his work with malevolent thoroughness the wad of paper thrust between the musician's jaws was large enough to distend them to their extreme capacity his efforts to get rid of it sufficiently to enable him to cry for help had made bad worse a little more and it would be choking him as it was his eyeballs were starting from their sockets and his face was growing black he was perched on the high stool in such a manner that when he struggled it threatened to topple away from underneath him in which event he would have in all probability been hanged for the cord was twisted round his throat and fastened to a stop so tightly that the sudden jerk which would have followed the falling of the stool would almost certainly have dispatched him from this world into the next his hands and arms were tied close to his sides the cord being strained with such merciless severity that one could see the great wheels of discoloured flesh standing up on either side of it where it cut into his flesh the miserable italian presented a spectacle as pitiable as it was unusual and one at which the quartet of newcomers stared with looks of undisguised amazement mr Tempnell was the first to recover his wits taking out his pocket-knife he proceeded with all possible rapidity to cut the cords which bound him drawing at the same time the gag from between the, his teeth which latter task was not as easy as it might appear so tense and rigid were his jaws and with such savage cruelty had the wedge been driven in the result was what might have been foreseen no sooner were the bonds relaxed than bianchi groaned and swooned only recovering from the swoon to be constricted by an agony of pain the blood struggling again to circulate seemed to penetrate his veins like molten lead he writhed and twisted in his anguish when he had somewhat recovered he was to find himself confronted by four inquiring and bewildered faces mr champnell's voice firm and clear yet not unkindly was the first to fall upon his ears come you are better now very soon you'll be all right how comes it that you are in this extraordinary fix bianchi's lips moved but no comprehensible words proceeded from them as yet his swollen tongue refused its proper office 
it was still some moments before they were able to distinguish what it was he was trying to say then they understood that the word to which he endeavoured to give utterance was a man's name lazarus 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 he mumbled it hoarsely yet more and more distinctly over and over again yes lazarus i hear what has lazarus done to you and who is lazarus madeline touched mr champnell on the arm i know ask him where miss dorincourt is gone mr champnell obeyed where's miss dorincourt do you know it was plain he did know something at the mention of the lady's name he showed more signs of returning consciousness than he had done hitherto raising himself out of mr champnell's arms and sitting up upon the floor miss dorincourt marred he has taken her lazarus may the saints in heaven bless her he clenched his fists his black eyes shifted uneasily in their sockets his voice went quiet he has taken her what do you mean he has taken her bianchi struggled to his feet painfully tottering when he gained a footing he was possessed by some uncontrollable agitation which drove from him the memory of the pains he had endured and from which it seemed he was suffering still his whole frame quivered and shook with excitement which was momentarily growing greater and greater his southern nature asserted itself in gesticulations he stretched out his arms threw back his head rolled his eyes seemed to strain every muscle in his endeavour to give full expression to his strength of feeling his words came faster and faster he has cast on her the evil eye heaven that such things should be he has taken her away right away where i do not know with him alone she is in his hands like a doll a dummy a nothing my beautiful dream of my eyes star of my soul he is going to marry her yes he is going to make of her his wife his wife my god the devil the thousand 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 times devil he had worked himself up all at once into a state of frenzy presenting an odd picture of insensate rage he is going to marry her miss dorincourt of whom are you speaking explain yourself it is easy as plain as print it is her voice he is after her voice he cares nothing for her youth her beauty no nothing at all it is only her voice he wants in it he sees heaps of money heaps and heaps and there my god he is right there is a gold mine in her voice a gold mine he says to himself if i marry her if i make her my wife she will be mine and her voice too there will be a gold mine in my pocket the hundred thousand times devil he wound up with a flood of imprecations in an idiom of his own mr champnell endeavoured to arrive at a greater comprehension of what he had just heard mr bianchi calm yourself a little we shall be able to understand better and time will be saved are you saying you wish us to believe that miss dorincourt has gone away with this man lazarus of her own free will intending to become his wife of her own free will my god no he has cast on her the evil eye mr bianchi madeline coming forward anxiously even timidly touched him on the coat sleeve swinging round upon his heels when he saw her he flung out to her his hands with a cry of ecstasy which was not without its pathos maud it is you you are back again you are free from him you have shaken off his chains my beloved one light of my eyes queen of my heart i rejoice with all my might and all my main i would rather die a hundred deaths than know you were in the hands of that scoundrel lazarus and at the mercy of his devil's will god has been more good to me than i believe since after all he has suffered you to escape from him and to stand before me once more your own beautiful self so that i may feast upon you with my lovesick eyes madeline shrunk back all pale and trembling i am not maud don't you remember i am she who to my own great misfortune god has seen fit to make so like her i am madeline orme bianchi did remember with a sense of shock he too drew back 
his manner changed oh yes i remember oh yes you are madeline orme you are the cause of all the trouble you are she who has brought on us all the plagues of heaven who has plunged us into the waters of bitterness so that we may drink them to the dregs and suffer more than those who die well i hope you are content your double whom you have so cleverly pretended to be is at an end she is done for for good and all she is in the hands of lazarus when he gets in his hands a thing especially if that thing is a woman by the time it gets out of them again there is very little left of it nothing that is worth anything of that you may be sure madeline's trembling increased the little man's passionate if curiously chosen words seemed to make her quiver as if they had been the thongs of a whip mr bianchi do you mean that he has her under his influence again that he can make her do as he chooses as he did before that is what i mean that's just it what he calls his accursed power i do not know it is an attribute of satan a thing of evil he holds out his hands she obeys the wagging of his finger he drops his hand she falls in a heap on the floor he raises it she gets up again she puts her arm through his she goes off to marry him to become his wife may the saints in paradise entreat the good god to take pity better for her that she should marry a real devil out of the true hell but mr bianchi where has he taken her where have they gone i do not know i know no more than you beyond that she has gone to be his wife i know nothing but he is a friend of yours he is not a friend never he is an acquaintance only it is true that he has been known to me for several years but as no more than an acquaintance we are not enough in sympathy he is always mocking but where is his home where does he live he has no home he lives nowhere to-day he is in london to-morrow in paris the day after in vienna you find him in milan st petersburg new york south america wherever he is at the moment that is his home it is all the same to him but you know his address in town not i i see him this morning for the first time for two three years where he has been in the meantime i know no more than the dead he say nothing i ask no questions but you must know some more of his acquaintances and they may know bianchi reflected i know a place where he is sometimes to be heard of but that is all it is a restaurant there they may know what is his address but it is by no means sure let's go there and make inquiries there's not a moment to be lost he may be stopping at that very place and maud may be with him i dare not think of what she must be suffering each second she is in his hands she does not suffer she knows nothing she will not know until it is too late even if she knows then lazarus is too clever he will not wish to have trouble mr reginald fanshawe interposed it seems to me miss orme if mr bianchi will excuse me that the real meaning of this apparently mysterious business is that miss dorincourt is in one of her freakish moods has chosen to go off with this peculiarly named gentleman for reasons of her own i know miss dorincourt a trifle better than you do and i do assure you that at any and every cost she will always be original madeline was furious it is quite in keeping with your character that you should talk like that but in this case you don't know what you are talking about if you had ever seen the man lazarus you would know better he is the most horrible-looking creature i ever beheld reginald raised his eyebrows ah if he is so very hideous of course that counts counts i should think it did count i am sure that no woman would ever willingly be left alone with him for two consecutive seconds and as for marrying him she finished the sentence with a shudder i am convinced that mr bianchi is right i am going this instant to the restaurant of which he speaks to find out if i can where the creature lives she hastened towards the door at the side through which mr lazarus and his victim had passed together arm in arm her eye caught sight of something lying on the floor she snatched it up it was the address side of an envelope which had been torn why she exclaimed what's this she read what was written on the sheet of paper mr lazarus wellington mansions chelsea the number's torn but the rest is plain enough why i do believe that it's the man's address signor bianchi struck his forehead with his fist what a fool i am what a fool i remember now 
that he told me that he had taken a room in the wellington mansions what was the number i forget the number but it does not matter i will find him without the number and i will have his life or he shall have mine i swear it by all the saints in heaven the excitable italian rushed through the door followed by madeline with mr champnell close after mrs singleton went forth crying like some frightened child mr fanshawe remained by himself twisting the ends of his moustache with his fingers smiling to himself then after a second or two he went leisurely after the others End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain the cat and the mouse the apartment was not remarkable for elaborate upholstery a strip of felt carpet red lozenges on a white ground was on the floor a bed was in a corner and in another corner was a combination article of furniture which served as wash-hand stand toilet table and chest of drawers a large curious-looking wooden box was before the fireplace a small table in the centre which articles together with two cane-seated chairs one with the back off practically completed the chamber's garniture the french window opened as one perceived through the uncurtained panes on to a small balcony before it stood mr lazarus the most prominent object the room contained he was lighting a wooden pipe using in the operation as it seemed an unnecessary number of matches each one as he lighted it he held for the briefest moment in close proximity to the bowl and then threw it still flaming at maud dorincourt who was seated in the centre of the room sometimes hitting sometimes missing whatever the result might chance to be it seemed to afford him equal amusement with each match he threw his grin grew broader certainly the girl did present a curious spectacle the effect of which was heightened when one reflected that this was the daughter of a hundred earls who had been bred in the very lap of luxury whose beauty was famous of whose glorious future such wondrous visions had been dreamed her hair was disarranged loose coils dangling about her neck and ears this confusion of her lovely locks which was not of that alluring kind of which poets prattle added to the incongruity of her attire she was still clad in that gorgeous gown in which she had appeared with such signal effect to her cousin of stains but in some way like her tresses it had become disordered too and was warped creased twisted so that it seemed not only shabby but tawdry and positively became her ill sparkling gems were on her fingers gleaming bracelets on her wrists but they also only added to her bedizened appearance she was sitting on the backless chair limply like some lay figure and was as lifeless as one mr lazarus flung at her his flaming matches but she seemed to be indifferent whether they did or did not strike her continuing motionless even when the burning missiles were flirted against her face he could hardly have had a better cock shy it was this inanimation which seemed to afford him so much amusement presently tiring of his sport or concluding that he had wasted sufficient matches puffing at his pipe which was now well lighted he strolled close up to her he pulled her hair close to the skin twisted her ears filliped his fingers against her nose pinched her neck and arms she evincing not the slightest consciousness of either the pain or the indignity to which he was subjecting her impassiveness carried to such lengths moved him to speech to critical comment this is the very oddest thing of all the odd things i've known the queerest all my life i've been looking for a man or woman a woman preferred into whom i can project my own personality 
so completely that he or she shall become the reflection of myself the creature of my will the slave of my desire and after all these years just when i was not looking i have stumbled upon a woman and such a woman my stars so lovely and so young of so high a family with so great a fortune at her back i am afraid that not much of that fortune will be for me there will not be a great dowry given with my wife but that doesn't matter we will try to do without it the pair of turtle doves we are i think that in her i shall find a fortune of another kind sing through the scale three times as loudly as you can these latter words he addressed to maud with a peculiar directness of intonation the moment they were spoken she sat up held her head straight opened her lips and went thrice up and down the scale with a force a clearness a spontaneous burst of melody which was marvellous then like some clockwork figure her lips reclosed her head sank forward she became all limp again the effect was almost supernatural it impressed mr lazarus not a little wonderful extraordinary very queer indeed it is not only the voice which is the greatest the world has ever known when he said that bianchi was inside the mark it is the obedience if i was to exhibit her as a subject only i should make my fortune i am sure of it i have been the greatest mesmerist that ever lived upon the placards and i have done some wonderful things with my subjects but then i have had to pay them every night in advance and even then at times they have refused to do all that was set down in the bond with my money in their pockets oh yes i have had my troubles with my subjects more than once even two free fights but this is real this is genuine this is the actual thing investigation challenged exposure defied the mesmerized lady the only genuine article that has ever been exhibited what jokes i could have with her if i were to show her at so much a head at some of the places of which i know my stars i believe she would draw as much money in that way as with her voice in another stand up the girl stood up with automatic suddenness jump over the chair she jumped over the chair with surprising ease and lightness dance the highland fling she danced it with indescribable grace and deftness picking up her skirts at times just high enough to show her dainty feet flashing hither and thither beneath her silken drapery it was as charming an exhibition of its kind as one would care to see a spectator would have found it difficult to credit that she did it all unconsciously mr lazarus was himself constrained to wonder it is a marvel nothing else i wonder what it is in her or in me that does it as a rule it is the weak person who is influenced the hysterical the underfed the neurotic but she she is not weak no she looks to me as if she had the constitution of an ox as if she did not know what nerves meant yet there must be in her somewhere a what shall i call it a muscle a nerve a something which dominates her altogether on which the whole of her consciousness is built so that when an outsider gives control of it there is an end for her of a separate existence of an individual being of a personal responsibility for ever and for ever it is very curious indeed most queer it is fortunate that it is i who have got control of that little unknown something fortunate for me and for her yes and for her his grin was eloquent he pulled steadily at his pipe expelling clouds of smoke through his nostrils but come why should i have all the conversation to myself since i am favoured with the presence of so charming a young lady why should i not have a little talk with her a little exchange of ideas a little communion of soul we will see placing himself on the other chair with the unbroken back stretching out his legs he placed his huge feet in their course 
street-stained boots on the girl's lap she paying no more attention to them than if they had been nothing at all he eyed her from under his nearly closed lids as a collector might regard a newly acquired specimen of an unusual kind come do not look so glum do not keep your beautiful lips so tightly closed i will be kind to you you may speak i am not a man that wishes always to be too severe there must be discipline especially must there be discipline where a woman is concerned but at those times when discipline may be relaxed i allow a little latitude oh yes believe it of me talk to me open to me your heart let me peep into your soul like all young girls you have your notions tell me what you have proposed to do with yourself with your life with your voice speak i listen there came over her the same change which had come before she sat up straight posing her head a little back upon her shoulders a slight shadow seemed to flit across the vacuous countenance as if she were making some kind of an effort to collect her thoughts then opening her lips she began to speak in a sweet tremulous monotone straight on like a child who recites a lesson not once did she pause or hesitate but continued to pour out to the strange auditor the most secret thoughts of her heart speaking to him without disguise of matters which under ordinary circumstances she would rather have torn out her tongue than have hinted to a creature of his sort now she dwelt on them with a candour and simplicity which is characteristic of the child which prattles at its mother's knee my voice i have always thought that i would like to use my voice for the glory of god and for the happiness of men i have dreamt that i was in heaven and god came and touched my throat and said i have given you that which i never gave to any one before use it for me to increase the sum of the world's happiness i have dreamed this so often that i have almost begun to believe that it really happened it has come to me both when i have been asleep and awake sometimes when i have been wide awake in the middle of the day something has suddenly seemed to come over me and i have been in that place in heaven which i knew so well and god has come to me and it has all happened over again i do think that god has spoken to me in his own fashion and i dare not disobey indeed i wouldn't if i dare for what could be sweeter and grander and better than to sing for the glory of god and so when i am alone i sing my very best feeling that it is to him and that he will know it is to him and sometimes when i have been in better voice than usual and have sung my very very best in the silence which has followed i have felt that a presence was with me in the room a presence which has said to me well done how can the applause of crowds compare to the applause of god or what triumph can be greater than to be approved of him the girl's face was uplifted a certain radiance seemed to be shining through the mask which the man in front of her had riveted on her features she went on in the same easy gentle murmur as if the words rose to her lips as spontaneously as the bubbles rise to the surface of a glass of sparkling water as for the second part of his behest that i should use my voice to increase the sum of the world's happiness i have often asked myself how best it could be done i have asked guidance of him and i think that perhaps it has been given me i shall have enough to live upon i shall not have to sing for money it is true that if i refuse to marry staines grandmamma will not leave me her fortune but i have something of my own put by and have little doubt that in one way or another i shall not be in actual want so what i propose to do is this i shall visit all the countries of the world and i shall sing in all the great cities to all who choose to come and hear me free i shall sing to them always so long as my voice endures for the glory of god and that will make the people happy the inquiry came from mr lazarus yes i hope that that will make the people happy in her voice there was perhaps a faint suggestion of a dormant doubt and where do you propose to sing in the open air in the great halls of the great cities my experience of which 
i have had a trifle as to the effect that people value a free show at what it costs them but that is by the way who is to pay for the great halls in the great cities and i suppose there will be something for advertisement will you have a collection at the doors and will you have it taken up as they go in or as they come out no i do not think there will be a collection who then is to find the money do you propose to sing for nothing and to pay for the halls as well that is a pretty scheme i do not know i am sure that god will point out the way you have a nice notion a nice notion of how to make of yourself an utter fool i have never listened to anything so nonsensical and in my time i have listened to some rubbish now that i have heard you i begin to understand how it is that you are sitting there a woman who nurses such an idea in her mind must have something wrong somewhere with her works since therefore you are sure sooner or later to fall into the hands of an adventurer it is just as well that at the very beginning you have fallen into mine how about bianchi i thought you were to marry him i am not certain it depends on several things but i thought you loved him yes i love him well in marriage love is not the only consideration in the eyes of god do you think he would let you sing to the people free i am not sure i am sure dead sure he has some sense he is a musician it is for music that he lives yes for music and for dollars withdrawing his feet from the lady's lap mr lazarus rose from his chair in something like a pet you are an idiot an entire idiot you are mentally deficient in you somewhere is the seed of imbecility which will germinate and take root and grow until you become all mad on his face as he spoke and in the way in which he looked at her there was more than a suggestion of the strain of madness which was in his own blood he went on in quite a rage to think of singing to the people free you fool why if you sang to them free they would not come to listen to you why do people not value the wild flowers which grow by the wayside because they are to be had for nothing if you were to offer a man who has money in his pocket a bunch of wild flowers and a bunch of flowers from the conservatory though the wild flowers were the prettier which would he choose the flowers from the conservatory because for them he would have to pay the wild flowers he would get for nothing and therefore he would esteem them common that which a man can get for nothing he has plenty of and of what he has plenty he tires it is for that of which he does not have plenty and can never get plenty never never that he always craves so with your singing sing to the people in the street they will pass on they will not even stop to listen but sing in the albert hall and charge a guinea for a seat they will come from all parts of england to hear you you mark my words and see he pointed at her a protrusive finger one thing i advise you not to think that a scintilla of that dream of yours will ever come true i assure you by the living jingo whoever that may be that you will never sing to any one anywhere unless i see my way to make something out of it never i am not such a fool do you know be attentive i am going to ask you a question do you know what it is to be your future life no the answer came with an automatic clearness which he seemed to find amusing you are going to be my wife would you like to be my wife no this time neither the answer nor the fashion of it seemed to afford him quite so much pleasure what's that you would not like to be my wife you had better change your mind double quick say i would like nothing better than to be your wife i would like nothing better than to be your wife the responsive words were uttered with a prompt simplicity which would have been more effective had it not been quite so wooden say i love you aaron lazarus with all my heart and soul and with all my mind and body the echo came in the same dull mechanical fashion as before but he appeared to find it satisfactory that is well since you love me show it in a proper manner in all things be obedient do not spare yourself in anything make of yourself a willing slave as becomes a wife then when i am in a good temper i am not always i will sometimes not be too severe with you when i think of it but understand i make to you no promise 
from you i shall expect everything from me you have to expect nothing and you will get it you will be like the dutiful dog to whom sometimes is thrown a crumb from the table when those who sit at meat have fed with me it is in this way i am in a devil of a fix i have had a little accident with a young girl she was a bender a contortionist and she died she was not worth very much to me but she was all the income that i had they are not well paid contortionists unless they do something which won't make the people who look at them shiver with horror then they are paid like princes i tried to make her do something which would make them shiver and there was an accident it is very queer how easily some people die it was a long way off but there was a great fuss so i came away all i brought with me is in that box he pointed to the huge wooden box which stood before the fireplace i did not stop to bring more lest i might have been able to bring nothing so for the present i am not rich i even fear that we shall have to support existence by means of those pretty baubles which you have upon your wrists and fingers take off your rings and bracelets and give them to me my dear child they shall be a wedding present to the bridegroom from the bride she did as he bade her handing the ornaments to him by one by one her mother's wedding ring however refused to budge never mind about that we are not yet reduced to such a point when we are we will cut it off it will be easy he scrutinized keenly the articles which he had with so small a show of remonstrance entrusted to his keeping going close to the window so that he might have the full advantage of the light they are good stuff these things of yours they must have cost a little fortune and i will get good money for them you will see if i do not we shall be in clover you and i i shall be able to afford myself many little luxuries which i was afraid that i should miss to begin with we will be married according to the rites of the christian church at the office of a registrar then we will go for our honeymoon to a little spot i know among the mountains in hungary there will we be quiet for a time and we will be happy as the day is long oh yes so happy then after a little while i will take you to a great musician of my acquaintance whose word in the musical world is money and you will sing to him a little song for nothing that time it will be free and after that i think the shekels will begin to come you see how swift my brain moves it is all settled in the twinkling of an eye your life for ever and ever now in order that we may be married it is necessary that the registrar should have forty-eight hours notice so the first thing to do is to give him notice for we are in a hurry and every moment is like a year until we are made one but what am i to do with you while i go to give the notice i will try a little experiment stand up she stood up straight on the instant you understand all that i have been saying yes the word was dully spoken the very dullness seeming to suggest an intensity of pain i am going to see how much of your consciousness i can take out of you how much of your life i can absorb in mine look me in the face she looked him in the face then he looked at her his eyelids opened with that sudden movement which was a trick of his the nightmare orbs behind them were fastened on her poor strained eyes there was an interval which continued perhaps a minute then his hands his arms his whole frame began as it were to vibrate as if he were subjecting every nerve to a tremendous strain a vibration which her body copied with a horrible fidelity as he went closer to her her whole form from the head down began to incline slowly backwards he bending over her and seeming to prevent the too rapid descent by dint of some magnetic quality which emanated from his shaking body holding her with some sort of positive attraction so as to keep her from falling faster than he chose at last she lay on the floor quite flat he glancing down at her gloating with maniacal fervour on the havoc he had wrought her entire frame seemed to have shrivelled to have grown smaller her ordinarily lovely skin had assumed a parchment texture all trace of colour had gone from it her cheeks had fallen in there was about her whole appearance a corpse-like quality which anybody but mr lazarus would have found repellent to him however it seemed to afford lively satisfaction it is wonderful most curious how strange are the mysteries of nature in which one stumbles unawares i feel as if i had sucked some of the life out of her veins into mine 
i believe i could draw it all out of her if i were to try i am sure that i could draw so much out of her that no one could put back any life into her but me it is a power which one day i may find useful in the meantime do not let me forget that this is but a little experiment which i make now to put back into her at least some of the life which i have drawn out the process of resuscitation was not a rapid one nor would any one but an individual of peculiar tastes have found it pleasant he had to bend right over her glowering with his ogre-like eyes recommencing that strange vibration of his body as if he was again subjecting his nervous system to an unnatural tension presently her body began to quiver in sympathy as it seemed with his she began to rise with him inch by inch as if he drew her after him until once more she stood up straight upon her feet then for some moments he continued to project his hands and arms towards her rapidly on this side and that until she sighed and then he stopped it was time when it only to look at him to perceive how great was the strain which he had been enduring his head and neck were moist with perspiration he panted as for breath and trembled as with weakness he sank down onto his chair with a gasp lolling with his head back like some tired animal staring at her through his once more narrowed eye slits if it is a labor of love it is a hard one it is not the sort of thing i would care to do a dozen times a day i feel as weak as a rat all the life has gone out of me again back i suppose into her it is strange enough but the process if mysterious if often repeated would become exhausting that i can plainly see sit down she sat down again on the backless chair she returned to the limpness of the lay figure he regarded her critically you are not looking so very pretty now my dear if i were to go through this performance frequently all your beauty would soon be gone i believe it would well we will not do it more often than can be helped for prettiness in a woman is an asset of some value to the man who owns her he pulled himself together with something of an effort he rose from his chair will i go to give notice to the registrar of our union of hearts of our marriage my dear child the first thing is to have you married for the sake of your good name and for my sake too you will be quite safe there till i come back i think you will i will not be long when i return we will make love to each other true love in a way of our own he put on a queerly shaped silk cap which was unusually high in the crown and wide in the brim buttoning his coat up almost to his chin he left the room pausing without to lock the door and pocket the key then taking out the rings and bracelets which he obtained from maud he submitted them to a further examination one by one selecting a particular ring he placed it in an ancient leather purse the remaining articles he deposited in the pistol pocket of his trousers he went downstairs six flights of them which showed that the apartment which he had just quitted was situated at a considerable elevation above the ground he paused at the door which led into the street and which apparently was always kept wide open to peer about him as he did so he caught a glimpse of a face which was looking through the window of a four-wheeled cab which had just been driven by he instantly drew back into the shadow of the wall bianchi he muttered my stars bianchi End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain the cat in a corner the mere utterance of the name bianchi seemed to have on mr lazarus quite a singular effect as if some one had struck him a severe and unexpected blow which had disturbed both his mental and physical equilibrium compressing himself within the smallest possible compass hugging the wall as closely as he could he looked about him furtively as if he were afraid then turning relinquishing apparently his intention of quitting the building he hastened up the stairs again going up much faster than he had come down taking three or four steps in a stride with a display of agility which to say the least was striking 
about halfway up he paused and leaning over the banisters looked down into the depths below with a look upon his face of panic terror he waited for some seconds listening watching not even seeming to breathe then continued to ascend even quicker than before such was his agitation that when he reached the door of his own apartment he could not recall in which pocket he had put the key he fumbled first in one and then the other in vain cursing the while beneath his breath curse the key where did i put it i cannot think where i put it he bit his finger-nails his thoughts travelling to another theme it was bianchi yes not a doubt and the other girl who slapped my face and there were others what are they doing here was it an accident or have they cursed the key even as he cursed he found it with a shaking hand he put it in the lock the door was open he passed within on the very threshold a thought occurred to him which occasioned him apparently no slight discomfort i remember i remember my stars what a what idiot i am there came a volley of oaths i told bianchi the address myself i gave it him with my own lips i said to him lend me ten pounds he said he had not the money just at hand but he would send it i said send it to me at wellington mansions where i have taken an apartment my stars to think i should have forgotten that i should have brought her here that i should have put myself in such a trap he hurriedly closed the door locking it inside repocketing the key each instant his agitation increased as the thoughts came hammering at his brain he clutched the loose skin of his long skinny throat with his cruel hand twisting it this way and that as if it had been india rubber it is all over with me after all these years i feel i know it and it is to my own incredible stupidity that i owe the finishing the game is up my course is run my last bolt is sped just at the moment when i thought i had made the greatest coup of my life my stars he looked round the room his glance falling on the unconscious girl who still sat perched like a limp lay figure on her backless chair as he realized her presence a change came over his countenance which was almost too horrible to contemplate in that instant he crossed the border line which divides the insane from the sane the wild beast which was at the back of him came to the front the man was mad he grinned a mad man's grin it is for you it is for you i am in this hole it is all your fault all yours you dear little child you jade well they will get me but that is all they will get they will not get much of you that i promise them i will be even with them before they he chucked himself with a significant gesture under his chin what shall i do to you let me consider what shall i do to you that shall destroy you altogether and hurt them most shall i shall i a demoniac glare came on to his face the lust of a satyr after a moment or two however the expression faded giving place to one which was not very much more pleasant no there is not time i might be interrupted besides i can do better i will take it from you not only your innocence i will take your all you hussy he struck her smartly on either cheek why do you not rise when i come into the room you insolent animal stand up she stood up instantly the marks on her cheeks showing where his fingers had been he noticed them what is that upon your face how dare you have that redness on your face because i have the condescension just to touch you how dare you he struck her again three or four times in succession you see that is what you get for having a redness on your face and that is only the beginning attention 
look straight into my eyes for the last time in your life as the man's great yearning flaming eyes met hers seeming to threaten to draw them from their sockets by sheer force of repulsive attraction his continually increasing agitation at once affected her in a moment she was all of a twitch he regarded her as some hungry brute might the helpless victim which it proposes to presently devour she hanging on his glances in a spasm of expectant agony the muscles of his face began to work he opened his mouth raising his lips so that the yellow teeth were seen beneath each instant his appearance became more ogre-like when a convulsive shiver passed over him he withdrew his eyes from her face twisted his head round on his neck and listened what's that who is that upon the stairs have they come already my stars i must be quick or they will beat me at all points back went his face towards hers again he fixed on her his awful glare presently there recommenced that strange vibrative movement of his entire frame as if it were the natural and inevitable response to the enormous strain which he was plainly putting on all his nervous forces he gibbered to himself in a kind of frenzy quick quick come out of her life come out of her quick 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 it seemed as if in answer to his conjurations life did come out of her actually and literally so to speak grain by grain drop by drop he seemed by the exercise of some force which was either prehensile or suctional to be extracting the essence from her vital tissues that essence which gave them being so that while each second she appeared to shrink and shrivel and grow less he increased and swelled dominating her with a violence both muscular and mental which became more and more disproportionate to her own it was strange to see her swaying as he swayed her very finger-tips keeping time with his in a sort of rhythmic echo the motion of every muscle in his body she imitated with marvellous fidelity only there was this difference that while his movements became more strenuous hers became perceptibly weaker and still more weak until the only thing of which she seemed capable was a continuous tremor it was then that he appeared to put forth his utmost strength to project his personality most completely into hers to draw from her the last remnants of her vital force it was then too that there commenced in her that backward downward movement which was so slow that the wonder grew as to what were the means which held her suspended in mid-air he bent over her forward as she went back so that as the distance between them at most three or four inches remained the same it seemed plain that it was from him the suspensive force must issue but what was its nature nothing went to show he finished as he had done in the course of what he had been pleased to call his little experiment by laying her on the floor stiff and stark like a corpse he stooping and gloating over her like some triumphant demon a casual intruder would have declared she was a corpse she had all the outward semblance he placed his hand upon her bosom his ear against her lips his fingers on her pulse the result was as he desired there is not a trace of respiration not a trace i have drawn the life all out of her into me i feel it in my veins oh yes i feel it it is good to have her life as well as mine it makes me feel young again and strong it would be well always to have a young girl pretty in good health from whom to draw a fresh stock of life he turned her over with his foot as if she were a log 
she is as good as dead and better no one will be able to put life back into her but me and i i shall not choose no i shall not choose i think not except on my own terms which will be high even should someone else be able to put life back in her it will not be her own life that i have it will be someone else's life what will she be like with someone else's life in her young veins bah my stars what a jest it would be if they were to move heaven and earth to bring her back to life only to find her transformed into a sickly rotten creature without a voice how very funny it would be if at the very least she were to lose her voice how she would be happy with her dreams of god in that place in heaven which she knows so well but no one but me will be able to put back life into her no no one but me not at all try how they may of that i am sure what shall i do with her it would be inartistic to leave her here to hit them in the face directly they come into the room there would be lacking the dramatic elements of a search and the subsequent discovery looking round the room his glance reached the fireplace the box he went to the big wooden box lifting the lid no it will not do it is large but it is hardly large enough and then it is so full besides it is commonplace everybody hides the body in a box about the affair so far there has been that air of the uncommon which lends distinction it would be a pity to detract from the effect handling carelessly the contents of the chest he came on something which seemed to give him a notion it was a cold chisel a nice instrument of that ingenious manufacture which takes to pieces packing up when unscrewed into so convenient a compass that one may carry at a pinch the whole of it in one's coat pocket the separate links were contained in a canvas bag taking them out he fastened them together the idea is not so original as i would have desired but beggars cannot be choosers time presses and it must serve something seemed to catch his ear he glanced quickly towards the door again with that look of panic terror on the stairs no not yet they are longer than i expected i wonder why every respite is a little gained the chisel when all the parts were joined proved to be a serviceable tool some two feet long or more it resembled in fact one of those useful implements which have played and still do play so large a part in housebreaking and which two gentlemen of the burglarious profession are known as crowbars holding it in his hand he searched with his eyes the floor and finally dragging aside the wooden box he began to prise up one of the boards on which he had been standing forcing the point of his tool into an interstice he used it as a lever in a surprisingly short space of time so deft was his manipulation the board was up he repeated the process with a second adjoining board and again with a third then rolling the girl over and over with an evident appreciation of her unconsciousness of the indignity to which she was being subjected he brought her to where a chasm now yawned in the floor in you go and in she went between the joists amidst the rubble and the rubbish on to the rafters of the room below the fit was a tight one there was hardly room enough between two joists to admit the human female form divine with his clothes on but he managed he crammed in portions with his hands and trampled in others with his feet and somehow made a job of it then he replaced the boards not being over particular about hammering in the nails and over all he drew the wooden box back into its original position then he rubbed his hands together softly with the gratified feeling of a man who has done well they will have to find her now oh yes they will have to find her this is more artistic altogether now she will not hit them in the eye as they come in and perhaps they will not find her at least for some time by which time she may be altogether dead who knows who cares what a voice was there what a voice well sometimes the world loses prematurely its greatest treasures and never knows what it has lost who knows who cares he moved to the window stepping gingerly as if he were afraid of being overheard 
turning the handle he drew open the door still with the same odd regard to quietude he waited for a second or two as if to discover if any one had been disturbed as the silence remained unbroken he stole like some prowling beast of prey through the open window on to the balcony beyond crouching low as if anxious that as little of him should be seen as possible there ascended to him the noises of the street on the roof not far above him some sparrows twittered a bugle was blown apparently in the barracks close at hand he seemed to take in all these things and to be searching among them for one distinctive sound which he failed to find then cautiously he stole closer to the balcony's edge the balcony was but a shallow one probably less than three feet wide so that he had not far to go in front was a railing not over high it was attached to the balcony by iron rods through these he peeped but they were not wide enough apart to enable him to thrust his head between so that he could not see what was directly underneath he hesitated then with the same queer carefulness raised his head till he was able to see over the rail beneath a four-wheeled cab was at the door some people were getting out of it hurriedly as if pressed for time he waited for an instant just long enough to enable him to catch a glimpse of what was going on below to see the people from the cab come hastily into the house then he returned into the room swiftly stealthily savagely he took up his position against the wall standing close to the door so that when it was opened it might act as a screen concealing him temporarily from the view of whoever entered there he remained as near to the wall as he could get fidgeting with his hands now rubbing them softly together now biting at his fingernails grinning all the time and waiting steps were heard ascending the stairs and there were voices whose intonation was not friendly some one tried the handle of the door then rapped sharply at the panels then when there was no answer cried brusquely sternly open the door in there mr lazarus continued silent he ceased to bite his nails holding out his hands in the attitude of one who is about to clutch at something to himself he murmured that is not bianchi no that is not bianchi that is a stranger whom bianchi has brought with him you are sure this is the room occupied by the man lazarus it was the same voice which put the inquiry the voice which replied lazarus recognized as the janitor's that's his room all right leastways the name he gave me was lazarus and he's the man i've described to you and you say that he's in here now he must be unless he's got up the chimney or out of the window it's about a quarter of an hour since i saw him running up the stairs and i heard him lock the door behind him it hasn't been opened since that i'm sure only a quarter of an hour ago to lazarus it seemed longer a lifetime had been packed within those fifteen minutes and so the janitor had seen him he had not seen the janitor where had he been the strange voice continued and the young lady is with him where else can she be he brought a young lady home with him that i'll swear he took her into his room and she hasn't left it since a sharp-eyed man that janitor he had been cognizant of more than lazarus supposed the gentleman behind the door felt that he would like to say a few words to him of a kind there was a murmur of voices not a friendly sound one which suggested that several persons were without who waxed impatient there came another rapping louder than the first open the door we know you are in there if you don't open we shall break it down lazarus only hooked his fingers and stretched out his hungry hands another inch or two and grinned he neither answered nor opened so soon there came a fresh clamour at the panels more exuberant than either of the others lazarus lazarus you devil lazarus you think to keep us out you mistake we will get at you through a hundred doors this time the voice was known to the gentleman inside he recognised it with a sudden distension of his already exaggerated grin 
he began to fidget ferociously with his hands his fingers opening and shutting as if they itched that is bianchi that is my friend bianchi my dear good friend if you will promise to come in by yourself alone i will open the door at once then after a little while they can all come in after a little while but he did not say this aloud or possibly the organist flattered by the suggestive compliment might have availed himself of the kindly invitation clear the way stand aside there the voice which uttered the command for it was a command was the one which had been dominant throughout and which sounded as if it were accustomed to giving orders and to being obeyed apparently the request was complied with for presently a heavy body came dashing against the door as if some one were hurling himself against it with all his force not much money had been spent on making the fastenings unduly strong the jim crack lock was plainly strained by the violence of the assault again and again and again there came the onrush of that vigorous frame the lock yielding more and more until the fourth time the door came open with a crash people came streaming in where is he inquired some one bianchi interposed sounding as if he were half beside himself with excitement i will find him by all the saints in heaven i will find him and he found him then and there before the words were fairly from his lips lazarus sprang from behind the door and seizing him with his hungry hands bore him aloft as if he were a child before the others had realized the presence of the occupier of the apartment or gained an inkling of his intention lazarus had dashed with his victim through the open window then too late they did rush after him with shouts and threats before they could reach him with the little man struggling fighting yelling held tightly in his arms he had sprung over the iron railing on to the stone pavement six stories down below a scream rang through the air cries of horror rose from the street those looking over the railing held their breath and all was still end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain a swan song when they picked him up lazarus was dead killed as the doctor said the inevitable doctor who had suddenly appeared upon the scene in half a dozen places it was well for him and well for the world that he was dead sooner or later anyhow some decent soul would have been put to the labour of killing him bianchi still lived lazarus had fallen underneath it was owing to that fact or to some freak of fortune that the organist owed his life he was broken to pieces a bundle of fractures but the breath was yet in his body and they kept it there though he was never again to be the man he was before had it not been for the janitor's reiterated assurance that the chamber's tenant had brought a young lady in with him and that she had not gone out again those who had come in search of maud might have taken it for granted that her abductor had secreted her in some other hiding-place and had left her to her fate as it was they ransacked every nook and cranny turned out the contents of the huge wooden box in vain and it was only when in accordance with someone's suggestion that there might be a false bottom to the chest the box itself was lifted that some sharp eye perceived that the flooring underneath had been tampered with then very quickly the truth was learned they found her crammed between the joists in that moment had lazarus been alive and within reach of some of those who were present in that upper room he would still have been very near death's door he had done his work as thoroughly as he supposed all the medical skill in europe was summoned to her aid without result the empiric triumphed 
the profession was at fault as lazarus had put it he had taken the life right out of her and not all the doctors of all the schools could put it back again as was to be expected opinions were divided one great doctor said this another great man ventured to surmise that a third agreed with neither the net result remained the same the girl so lately in the first full flush of her youth and health and strength and beauty all alert with kindling ambitions glowing with the hot mercurial blood which coursed restlessly in her veins now lay stiff and stark and yet not cold for she was not dead though to all intents and purposes she might have been she neither moved nor breathed nor spoke nor did any of those things which we associate with life and yet she lived her condition was described by learned men in learned words each said being apt to have their own particular formula but the common sense of it seemed to amount to this that she was in some sort of trance from which all their arts were insufficient to draw her out and she faded visibly before their eyes so much was clear one bold man went so far as to say that she was dying while they looked on not knowing what it was she was dying of unable to do anything to stay her advance towards the grave this man was french a leading light of the hospital of la salpetriere in paris where they make a peculiar study of certain esoteric conditions of the human frame especially as they are to be found in females this man taking to himself a corner of the prophet's mantle foretold that as she drew near death she would return as it were of her own volition to the portals of life that is to consciousness and what he said proved true madeline through all those weary days and nights watched almost continually by maud's bedside her remorse was pitiful to witness she declared that the guilt of this innocent blood was on her head that if it had not been for her offence maud would never have been in such a plight and she implored them that they would allow her to some extent to expiate her sin by doing all that in her lay to win back for the girl something of that which she had lost to this petition they acceded willingly enough the more particularly since it was soon made plain that had they searched the whole world over they could not have found one more skilled or more assiduous a nurse more to the manner born so a bed was made up for her near maud's and in that room she practically lived worked watched waited prayed how she prayed pouring out her heart's blood in supplications to the god one of whose chief attributes she had always been taught was mercy and at last it seemed that her prayer was answered in a measure one morning between the dawn and the daylight she knelt beside maud's bed and watched and prayed she prayed that god's hand might be stretched forth so that the girl who lay so silent on that splendid bed might be quickened into life and behold even while the petition fluttered towards the presence chamber maud moved for the first time during all those weeks madeline was so startled the instant answer to her prayer seemed to speak with supernatural force of the nearness of omnipotence that for the instant she lost her presence of mind the movement was but slight yet it was sufficient maud turned her head a little to one side and to her inexpressible amazement madeline perceived that her eyes were open and that she was regarding her with what appeared to be the light of reason there was silence during the space of about a minute as if each was realizing the overwhelming strangeness of the position then maud said very faintly yet with perfect clearness i thought that i was in heaven and that god came and touched me on the throat madeline was bewildered her whole being still occupied 
by the sensation of surprise she could but murmur the other's name maud the response came quickly sister such a mode of address from those lips at that time made madeline's heart leap within her bosom and blinded her eyes with tears her face fell forward on to the coverlet she had to let it fall for a while only her sobs were heard then there came the question from the bed why do you cry madeline lifted her face her eyes streaming her voice all broken i i am so glad to hear you speak to me again like that are you are you better yes i am better i am dying dying the words stuck in madeline's throat there was something in the tone of maud's voice in the expression of her face which made it impossible to contradict her the girl went on do you remember my telling you that i wanted to use my voice to the glory of god well i'm going to among the choirs of angels madeline was still the revulsion of feeling was almost more than her strength could bear her expectations had been raised so high in a moment to be dashed so low she felt that what the girl said was true she was becoming possessed by a profound conviction that already the angel of death was hovering near regardless of madeline's silence or of what it might mean maud continued talking in a strain which tried her listener to breaking point it breathed a spirit which was so contrary to what she felt were her deserts you'll have to take my place when i am gone for good it will be for good for better not worse you'll have to be me a better me i shan't be missed except that people seeing you will stare to see how much i have improved you'll have all my virtues without my vices you'll be just the daughter of the house the house is wanting in which i never could have been possessed of all my beauty and all these other good qualities in which i have been lacking sister won't you madeline was silent speechless help to get my hand out from between these sheets i want to feel yours clasped in mine the request pointed to a degree of weakness which appealed to madeline on her practical side the hand which she hoped to bring from beneath the bedclothes was wasted white and worn small as a little child's it closed on hers with a gentle pressure which seemed hardly to speak of earth and as it did so the door was opened the earl of staines came in he had about him a dishevelled look suggesting a sudden rising from bed a hasty putting on of his clothes maud greeted him with a faint smile as if she had been expecting him i thought that you would come she said the earl glanced around him as if bewildered then from one girl to the other recognizing maud's condition with a start of amazement maud an access of confusion seemed to overwhelm him i i beg your pardon but i i thought i heard someone calling me yes it was god god he echoed her blankly having no notion of what she meant his wound had healed but he still bore about him traces of suffering both physical and mental he looked an older man than he ought to have done she went on in the same almost unnaturally quiet voice her enunciation being so clear that every syllable was audible i am dying and god has called you out of sleep and sent you to me so that i can speak to you before i go while we three are still alone dying maud you are dreaming no i have been dreaming but i am not now i am wide awake and can see and know i am going to where my voice will be of use and i am leaving her to you with a glance she signified that the reverence was to madeline maud i want you to promise me that she shall be your wife if love can win her i promise you she shall he spoke coarsely as if he had to put pressure on himself to enable himself to speak at all she turned to madeline i want you to promise too again madeline's face was hidden in the coverlet her vehement sobs threatening to choke her maud maud don't speak like that don't think of what i am nothing and worse than nothing think of what i've done 
if it hadn't been for me you would not be lying there all would be well maud checked her with a slight movement of her hand there was in her voice a touch of the old quizzical humour hush all is well with me i will soon be better don't you love him sister maud maud the girl addressed her cousin you hear that is her answer i will give you its interpretation her love for you is such that she has not speech enough to tell you of its greatness come give me your hand she raised her own hand from madeline's with a degree of care and expenditure of time which suggested that it was a by no means easy thing to do she jested at this evidence of her debility you see how strong i am her attenuated fingers closed with a little playful pressure on his sinewy palm well staines good day to you god's in his heaven all's well with the world she made a small grimace i'm afraid i've only one hand under control madeline raise yours directly there staines take it in yours you love each other i believe you were made for each other i bid you marry in the name of god they were still the earl held madeline's hand tightly pressed in his presently he stooped and kissed it maud smiled bravo staines well done later she expressed a wish to be taken to what she called her haven of refuge but which she meant the secret chamber her seclusion in which had been the cause of all the complications by this time a small host of doctors had been summoned on the scene it was their unanimous opinion that since she was drifting from time into eternity and that nothing would be likely to materially retard or expedite her progress it would be just as well to gratify any wish she might express so far as it was possible so they placed her in a chair built her up in it with cushions and bore her into the adjacent chamber her own room with its gorgeous scheme of colour there they set the chair upon the floor and under her specific instructions manipulated the springs which gave access to her hiding-place since it was impossible to force any sort of chair up the narrow stairway staines carried her up bodily in his arms to the chamber above there she startled them with a fresh request i want you to leave me all of you i want to be left alone in my haven of refuge from the world to be left alone as i've always loved to be some of the doctors still remained again they were consulted they shrugged their shoulders implied that it did not matter nothing mattered so long as help was close at hand in case it might be needed and an eye was kept on what took place it was only another whim of hers which might as well be gratified so they left her in the great curious chamber all alone seated in a huge armchair which had originally been conveyed up there she alone knew how packed up in it as comfortable as if she had been in bed the trap-door which led into the room itself was kept open without saying anything to her and possibly without her cognizance and crammed together on the narrow stairway madeline the earl and one of the doctors remained on guard probably again without her knowing they were there and before long a strange thing happened she had been very still and perhaps judging from the silence had remained seated motionless in her chair dreaming dreams living through the past once more drinking in details each of which carried to her brain its own particular significance of the hiding-place she loved so dearly and for whose existence she had paid so much madeline pictured to herself the girl's rapt glances travelling round and round that queer archaic chamber and the little tremblement of the lip each time they lighted on some one or other of her more cherished treasures and was wondering if it was right to leave her any longer in that perfect silence silence which might mean so much when there fell on her ears the sound of a song maud was singing it was so unexpected and the thoughts of each one of the listening trio had been so occupied with other themes that for a moment it seemed as if the thing was supernatural as if instinctively they drew even closer together if that were possible and held their breath in a kind of awe in that closing hour there had come back to her the gift which in her strange waywardness she had valued above all else above wealth and rank and beauty and even human love the gift of song come back to her in undiminished splendour for strangely enough while her speaking voice had grown so weak and faint her singing voice had all its old range and strength and tone its marvellous timbre it was like an organ pealing jesus lover of my soul let me to thy bosom fly while the gathering waters roll while the tempest still is high 
of all the songs in the world she had chosen to sing the hymn with which she had illustrated with such fatal effect her transcendent gift to lazarus when already he had her in his toils probably her choice was guided by the consciousness of its appropriateness at that the supreme moment of her life beyond doubt it was a song she loved to them huddled together on the stairway it was as if it were an angel singing she poured forth such a wealth of celestial harmony with such rapturous emotion and such an ecstasy of joy she sang it right to an end the concluding words ringing out as it seemed to them in a triumphant burst of melody which was beyond and above all that had gone before thou of life the fountain art freely let me take of thee spring thou up within my heart rise to all eternity and then was still presently urged by the doctor madeline went up to see what was happening with a cry she climbed into the room the others pressing after her maud was dead asleep in the eternal arms she was on the floor in front of her chair it seemed as if she had stood up to sing holding out her hands perhaps to meet the advancing angel who when he had removed her spirit laid her body softly down she seemed a tired happy child at rest she could hardly have sounded a better advance note or sent it pealing with a more glorious sweetness into the very courts of heaven it promised an efficient recruit to the angel choir End of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the house of mystery by richard marsh this librivox recording is in the public domain a great lady madeline orme is the present countess of staines she is one to be guilty of a seeming bull against her will yet with it confessing her love yet maintaining on various grounds her personal unworthiness it was not without a struggle that she yielded though it was well for her she did for she is at present perhaps the happiest woman in england as she has made her husband the happiest man the marriage took place with the full approbation of the countess dowager that resolute old lady gave madeline much more of her affection than she had ever bestowed on maud maintaining with her latest breath that she must be the mislaid twin sister of the story-books that she must be closely joined to the family by ties of blood that it was not so was clearly shown it was proved beyond all possibility of doubt that her father had been the reverend john orme clerk in holy orders and her mother his wife madeline raeburn at one time governess at the time of his marriage mr orme had been a curate within a year he was drowned while bathing the news brought to his wife an hour or two after madeline's birth sent her after him the baby girl was adopted by the landlady of the house in which the orms were lodging a mrs clifford no relatives of her parents could be found who were living so this good woman brought up the little friendless orphan while she lived with her own son madeline orm and geoffrey clifford were as brother and sister it was through geoffrey clifford in great measure that the truth of these matters was ascertained it may be mentioned in passing that to-day geoffrey clifford is editor-in-chief of one of the most famous newspapers in the world thus it was demonstrated that the bewildering likeness which existed between the two girls was the fruit of nothing but what some people would term a freak of nature but what mrs singleton preferred to describe as one of god's own miracles charles singleton who set the ball a-rolling which resulted in such strange happenings is dead but his wife still lives she is retired from active service and resides in a cottage on one of the earl's estates where she is in possession of the modest all which her heart desires 
signor bianchi also is still alive he walks on two sticks and his mental powers are not at all times so clear as they might be but he still has a corner in the earl's town-house where still he plays upon the organ there are some who assert that he still communicates with maud indeed already the foundations of a pretty ghost story are being reared it is reported that some one has been heard singing to the signor's accompaniment some one with a voice more beautiful than any human singer ever had the secret hiding-place is hardly a secret any longer it is known to many the earl and countess use it as a retiring room to which on more than one occasion they have introduced their friends but it has been stated that when the earl and countess have been far away some one has been heard passing in and out of the secret door some one whose swishing skirts have betrayed her sex and it is at these times that there has been that mysterious singing that strange music suggestive of another sphere reginald fanshawe is no more death met him a few months after his brother's wedding while travelling in india his mother died of an apoplectic stroke only last year not one of the least singular features of the present situation consists in the fact that comparatively few people have any notion that the countess of staines is not maud dorincourt she is actually so described in the peerages but then those compilations are proverbially little else than collections of fables the circumstances of maud's death were kept as quiet as possible for family reasons she was buried in the family vault in the presence of but two or three persons so it comes about that only a handful of people know that she is dead the world at large believes the evidence of its eyes and declares she is alive it knows nothing of the existence of madeline orme though madeline orme is perhaps the most popular woman in english society a true great lady whose riches are as notorious as her benevolence a leader in all good works who is held in high honour for sufficient righteous and valid reasons the whole world over and yet she is nothing but one of god's own miracles end of chapter twenty four end of the house of mystery by richard marsh